Robert called Damon. Grandpa Everett's birthday celebration was being held in a few days. Robert wanted his son to take time off from his studies and come to D.C. to celebrate with them. Naturally, Mr. Brokerton didn't know that Damon was already in the capital. He'd even planned to fly his son to D.C. on the private jet. At first, Damon didn't want to go. Over the past year, he'd come to care for Nancy and Robert. He didn't have a good impression of Grandpa Everett and the others. In addition to the fact that they'd been so cruel to Nancy, many of them had also been very rude to him during the last family dinner. The aunts and uncles were cold to his mother, and the cousins mocked and ridiculed them. Damon had no desire to repeat the experience. However, his parents had put a lot of effort into organizing the celebration. Plus, it was Grandpa Everett's 70th birthday. Additionally, when they'd gone to visit him in the hospital, he'd been nicer to Nancy. Furthermore, Damon didn't want the rest of the family to think him or his parents ungrateful. He could suffer one more meal with them. As long as no one provoked him, it would be fine. If they did, it would definitely teach them a lesson. So Damon made his mind up to go. At the celebration, he would just roll with the punches. The next afternoon, he was doing an interview with a national news channel. The event was being held in the auditorium at the D.C. Academy of Music. It would be open to the public. At that time, a famous esports team called the Legendary Heroes would also make an appearance. Damon, the CEO of Everbright and the creator of the game Global Hegemony, would have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. They would discuss Everbright's plans and the future of the esports industry. The morning of the interview, Damon went to the D.C. Academy of Music to prepare. After arriving on campus, he was a little confused. He was early, and he didn't know what he was going to do to pass the time. He'd come here many times now, and he was somewhat familiar with the campus. Without thinking, he walked to the bulletin board with Fiona's picture and saw her smiling face. He thought about how they'd met not long ago. The memory was a little painful. Sadness welled up inside him. Meeting her in person hadn't brought closure. Conversely, his feelings for her were more intense now. Seeing her picture was like torture. He felt conflicted. Should he call and ask to see her one last time? It was almost noon. He could ask her out to lunch. But when he finally mustered his courage and called her, she gave him an excuse about being busy. She'd had to prepare for a performance that afternoon. Although he knew he should have expected this, he still felt disappointed. Therefore, he found a cafeteria and ate by himself. He thought about the upcoming interview and the discussion with the esports team. Later, he would go backstage and rehearse a little. He was a bit worried that the auditorium wouldn't have enough seating capacity. Usually, few people were interested in attending an event like this. Sometimes, the organizers would even arrange for people to come and sit in the audience. They didn't want the speakers to feel insulted if no one showed up to hear their talks. For this reason, the school sometimes asked members of the student union to attend just in case. However, a lot of students were interested in computer games, so likely there would be a good turnout today. After all, as the founder of Everbright, Damon was the business leader of the new generation. He'd already achieved many great things, and he had many admirers. Furthermore, in addition to Damon, a famous esports team would also make an appearance. They were going to discuss Everbright's latest game, Global Hegemony. The game was already very popular. Naturally, many people would come out to show support. In short, Damon guessed that the venue would be packed. The interview was scheduled for 2 o'clock in the afternoon. While Fiona was on the phone with Damon, her roommate, Florence, pretended to read a book. However, she was actually eavesdropping on the conversation. When Fiona hung up, her roommate asked with a smile, Were you talking to that boyfriend of yours again? Mm, Fiona nodded. He asked me to go for lunch with him, but I'm busy this afternoon. She looked out of the window, feeling conflicted. She'd heard the disappointment in his voice just now. However, Fiona had been telling the truth. Florence knew that her roommate had an important performance that afternoon. It was already noon, so Fiona packed her bag and went out. Florence and Jojo went to the cafeteria to have lunch together. They didn't have class this afternoon. After they ate, they planned to go to the auditorium to hear a talk. Apparently, a national news station was interviewing the founder of Everbright. Both Florence and Jojo were gamers. They loved Old and New Century, and they were looking forward to seeing the founder of Everbright in person. On top of that, they'd also heard that a famous esports team, the Legendary Heroes, would be there too. This made them want to go even more. After the Legendary Heroes won the Global Hegemony Championship, their popularity skyrocketed. The team members were all students at the DC Academy of Music, and a few of them were very handsome. For this reason, they attracted attention from countless young women. Florence and Jojo were no exception. After lunch, Damon walked to the venue and found that quite a lot of people were waiting outside. Since the doors to the auditorium weren't open yet, many students were standing around chatting. Damon hadn't expected so many people to be interested in watching the interview. Seeing that it was still early, 
He wondered if he should go backstage and rehearse. Although the format was similar to that of a talk show, the interviews had informed him that they'd also be asking some tough questions. He had to be prepared. He didn't want anything to go wrong. At this moment, he suddenly saw someone who looked familiar. She was tall and slender, and although he could see only her back, he recognized her at a glance. It was his cousin, Miranda. He'd met her at the family dinner not long ago. Although he knew that she went to the school, he hadn't expected to run into her here. Damon wasn't sure whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. At this moment, Miranda was chatting with her classmates. She didn't notice Damon behind her. She was a member of the student union, and she also hosted a radio show on the campus station. Originally, she had planned to go shopping with her boyfriend, Wesley, this afternoon. However, at the last minute, she received a message from the student union. The event organizers were worried about poor turnout, so they asked the students in the union to come and show their support. At first, Miranda didn't want to go. However, after she heard that the founder of Everbright was being interviewed, she had a change of heart. After all, it would be an honor to see this young entrepreneur in person. Moreover, he was about the same age as her. She'd also heard that he was quite tall and handsome, so she wanted to see him for herself. Miranda's boyfriend, Wesley, stood beside her. He was tall and athletic. He looked around and saw many beautiful women waiting to enter the auditorium. Then he saw Damon and nudged Miranda. She asked curiously, What is it? Wesley pointed at Damon, who was walking by, and said, Do you know who he is? He's the guy who stole Fiona away from Wyatt. He went viral online. Is that so? Miranda usually loved gossip. She'd been paying a lot of attention to the rumors about Fiona and Wyatt. She quite liked Wyatt's band, and she thought that the couple was a match made in heaven. Miranda firmly believed that Wyatt and Fiona would eventually end up together. In her opinion, nothing could keep them apart. Miranda looked in the direction that her boyfriend was pointing and saw Damon walking towards the door to the backstage. She was surprised to see her cousin. Was he the guy who'd stolen the campus beauty's heart? What a weird coincidence. Miranda tugged on Wesley's sleeve. Are you sure? Yes, I'm absolutely sure, he answered with certainty. He'd watched those videos many times, and he was sure that this guy was the same guy who'd confessed his love to Fiona. The guy was even wearing the same clothing. Who else could it be if it wasn't him? Miranda furrowed her brow. She hadn't known that her cousin was so famous. So he was the guy who'd ruined Wyatt's grand gesture. At first, she wanted to go greet him, but then she thought better of it. He had a reputation for being a loser, and she didn't want people to know that they were related. If word got out, she'd be famous too. She'd be labeled a loser by association. She couldn't risk it, so she hurriedly hid in the crowd, afraid that Damon would see her. Damon didn't realize that his cousin had noticed him, but he didn't intend to greet her anyway. He was in a hurry to get backstage so he could rehearse. Suddenly, he heard a shout behind him. Damon, you're here too! He turned and saw Janice. Mio was walking beside her. He waved. Are you guys here to see the interview? Janice smiled and nodded. Mia blinked her big eyes. She looked left and right but didn't see Fiona. Hey, handsome, why didn't you bring your beautiful girlfriend with you? Where did you take Fiona that night? You two disappeared pretty fast. Damon smiled. She has a performance this afternoon, so she couldn't come. Naturally, he wasn't going to say that they weren't together. He didn't have to announce it to the world. Oh, Mia rolled her eyes. Then she patted his shoulder. Wow, you're good. You really had us going. I was wondering why you dared to get up in front of all those people and give Fiona your tiny bouquet of flowers. So it turns out that you two are already hooked up. Makes sense, I guess. <sighs> Poor Fiona. Now she's stuck with you. So, are you going to take us out for dinner? Definitely. Are you here to watch the interview? That's right. Janice replied. Why else would we be here? Uh, I actually have a lot of questions that I want to ask the founder of Everbright, but I probably won't get the chance. It's still exciting, though. I've heard the founder is really handsome. His games are so popular, too. At this moment, the doors of the auditorium opened, and the students began to file in one after another. Damon saw that it was almost time for the interview, so he said to Janice and Mia, You guys go in first. I've got something I need to do. Mia nodded. Then go, but don't forget to treat us to dinner again, otherwise I won't forgive you. I promise, Damon replied as he walked towards the backstage. Jojo and Florence were making their way towards the auditorium. They sipped their drinks and checked out the guys around them. Then Florence spotted someone and she elbowed her friend who was walking beside her. Hey, look, isn't that Fifi's loser boyfriend? Why is he here? Jojo glanced at Damon who was walking away from them. Fifi's busy this afternoon, so he's on his own. He has to find some way to pass the time. Florence nodded. That makes sense. Hey, maybe we should do her a favor and get rid of him. He's ruining her reputation. Her emotions are clouding her judgment. Jojo nodded in agreement. Yes, we should help our friend. 
April, the woman in charge of Everbright's PR team was waiting backstage. Many reporters and other staff from the news station were there too. When Damon arrived, an assistant stopped him. Hey, this area is off limits to students. Do you work here? No, I don't, but before Damon could explain that he was here to be interviewed, the assistant cut him off. This is the backstage of the auditorium. You need to leave. Don't get in our way. Luckily, April heard Damon's voice and she quickly came over to meet him. When she saw Damon, her eyes lit up. Mr. Walker, you're finally here. Come, come, everyone is waiting for you. You need to prepare for the interview. After saying this, she quickly ushered him into the room. The president of the academy, who was also backstage, heard that the guest of honor had arrived and came over to shake his hand. Hello, Mr. Walker, I am Mr. Castile, the president of the academy. I've admired you for a long time. The games you develop are really great. Come, let me introduce you to the members of the legendary heroes team. He led Damon over to a group of young men. They waited politely for him to speak first. Damon was backstage at the auditorium waiting for the interview to start. The president of the academy was introducing him to the members of the esports team, who were also participating in the talk. The guys were all very handsome and very bright. With their abilities, it was no wonder that they had so many fans at the academy. However, when they were introduced to Damon, they acted humble. They looked at him with admiration. They were also a bit shocked. After all, Damon looked really young, and it was rumored that he was also still a university student. Establishing a multinational company like Everbright before graduating university was a really amazing feat. Damon was many young people's idol. The reporter who would be doing the interview came over to greet him as well. She wasn't much older than him. Her name was Jane Banbury. Although she was young, she was talented. Jane was already a well-known reporter on a national financial channel. She was both capable and also extremely beautiful. Although Damon had done interviews with the station before, this was the first time that Jane had ever met him. When she saw how young and handsome he was, her eyes lit up. She'd heard the rumors that the founder of Everbright was still a university student. However, when she saw him today, she realized that it was true. On top of this, he was much more handsome and approachable than she had imagined. Hello, my name is Jane Banbury, but you can call me Jane. You must be Mr. Walker, right? Nice to meet you. She took the initiative to shake his hand. Damon felt the soft skin of her palm. He smiled at her. Hello. When she saw his smile and his dreamy eyes, her heart beat a little faster. She blushed and lowered her head. The employees who worked behind the scenes hurried over to greet him too. One of them called out, Mr. Walker, the interview is about to start. Let's get ready. Damon nodded. Everyone began to busy themselves. When the assistant who'd tried to turn Damon away at the door saw this, he was stunned. He'd thought Damon was just an ordinary student. He definitely hadn't expected him to be the guest of honor. How was this possible? Wasn't this guy too young? If April hadn't come over calling the guy Mr. Walker, he never would have believed it. So this was the legendary founder of Everbright. Well, every generation had its geniuses. When the assistant thought about how he'd almost offended the guest of honor, he broke out in a cold sweat. Now that Damon had arrived, the interview could proceed as scheduled. The organizers had been worried about poor turnout, but this wasn't an issue. On the contrary, they'd clearly underestimated the draw of this young business leader. At this moment, the auditorium wasn't just full, it was packed. A huge crowd had shown up to watch this young celebrity speak. In addition, a popular esports team, the legendary Heroes, was also making an appearance. This drew even more attention. The interview started, and Damon walked up to the podium. When people in the audience saw him, they all began to whisper. The students recognized him. His face was still fresh in their minds. They all knew about the incident involving Wyatt and Fiona. Many people in the crowd had seen the viral videos online. They knew about Wyatt's grand romantic gesture with the flowers and the candles. They'd all seen the ridiculous videos of Wyatt kneeling on the ground, begging Fiona to date him. However, 
Some loser with a tiny bouquet of flowers had swooped in and stolen Fiona's heart. The videos were being shared all over social media. Thus, countless students were surprised to find that the business leader of the new generation, who was chatting happily on stage, looked a lot like the guy from the videos. Was he the guy who'd stolen Wyatt's thunder? This caused a huge commotion in the auditorium. Some people began to comment. Huh, do you think he looks familiar? The more I look, the more I'm sure he's the guy who left with Fiona. Someone else echoed this statement. I agree, he looks quite similar, but he can't be the same guy, right? I thought that Fiona's boyfriend was so poor that he couldn't even afford flowers. But this guy is the founder of a company worth billions. And he's handsome, too. It's him. I remember his smile. At the time, I thought he was handsome. I hadn't expected him to be this handsome, though. At first, many people had their doubts. After all, how could this be the same guy? The difference in status was too great. However, slowly, more and more people began to agree that he looked very similar to the guy in the videos. He was even wearing the same clothes. To verify this, some people discreetly took out their phones and pulled up the video of Damon giving Fiona the bouquet of flowers. Although the footage was taken at night, it was still obvious that the so-called loser in the video was the same guy who was standing on stage right now. It was undoubtedly the founder of Everbright. Oh my god. This was an extremely important discovery. It was a bombshell. Thus, the news spread like wildfire throughout the auditorium, causing a commotion among the students. The people who knew Damon were shocked. Janice and Mia, who were sitting in the front row, were stunned. They watched in astonishment as the young business leader talked and laughed at the podium. At this moment, he looked relaxed and carefree. He seemed like a totally different person from the loser in the videos. However, it was really him. Janice was the most surprised of all. She'd known Damon since middle school. She'd heard a lot of things about him before. However, he seemed to be just an ordinary guy. Until now, she'd thought that his greatest achievement was acing his SATs. Seemingly, he'd had his moments of glory, and then his light had dimmed. Until now, she'd heard very little news about him. Besides that fact that he'd aced his SATs, the only other thing Janice remembered about him was that he'd gotten into a fight with Noah Miller at the high school reunion. Comparatively speaking, Avery, Veronica, and the others had gone on to do great things. However, it turned out that Damon was actually the brightest of them all. At this moment, Janice finally realized how brilliant he was. Was he still the same guy who she'd gone to school with back in New York City? When did he become so successful? The situation felt a little surreal. Since when has Damon become world famous? Damon's cousin Miranda was leaning on her boyfriend's shoulder. She was falling asleep when her boyfriend, Wesley, patted her arm and woke her up. Then, he told her what was happening. He hadn't expected Fiona's boyfriend to be such a powerful person. Miranda rubbed her eyes and was surprised to find that the person standing at the podium was actually her cousin. It was the same cousin who Charlotte ridiculed at the family dinner not long ago. She'd said that he didn't belong. Additionally, Grandma June disliked him as well. She didn't think that he deserved to be a Brokerton. Was it really him? As she watched the stage, her jaw dropped and her eyes widened in shock. Her mind was a mess. Wesley looked at her in surprise. Are you really that shocked? I think that it's great. I guess Fiona's boyfriend isn't a loser after all. No wonder she chose him. Miranda shook her head. I'm just very surprised. Do you know who he is? Isn't he Fiona's boyfriend? Well, I don't know about that, but I know he's my cousin. Before, when Miranda heard that Damon was the loser who confessed to Fiona with a tiny bouquet of flowers the other night, she felt a little embarrassed. But now, the situation has reversed. In her opinion, this cousin, who was previously regarded as a burden on the family, was now the most successful one among them. Likely, even her uncle Robert didn't know about this. Otherwise, he would have bragged about it during dinner. 
If Miranda remembered correctly, Everbright had become world famous before Robert and Nancy reunited with Damon. In other words, this cousin, who'd lived with an ordinary family for so many years, had achieved this success without any help from his father. This was legendary. Damon was even more successful than Miranda's brother Tyson and her cousin Sawyer. None of them could hold a candle to him. It was totally ridiculous. Miranda was also a little vain. When she said the word cousin, she sounded proud. Wesley stared for a long time. He was in a daze. Florence and Jojo sat in a corner. Jojo was still holding her unfinished soda. She'd frozen with the straw halfway to her mouth. They looked at the young business leader up on stage, and they recalled how they'd tried to persuade Fiona to give up on this loser. They'd tried to convince her that Wyatt was a better choice. At this moment, their arguments sounded so childish. How could Fiona pass on this guy? They should have given her more credit. She was smart and intelligent. After all, one didn't become the most popular woman on campus with just looks alone. Florence and Jojo felt stupid. Which guy would they have chosen? Fiona had her reasons. Even if Wyatt had given her a pile of gold, this guy would still be more dazzling. The two women were stunned. Finally, they began to feel that Fiona had deceived them. Obviously, their roommate already knew how outstanding this guy was. Next to him, Wyatt was like a speck of dust. Florence and Jojo were angry. They felt that Fiona had lied to them, and it hurt their pride. They felt that she should make it up to them somehow. Anyway, her boyfriend owned a company worth billions. She owed them, so she should take them out on a yacht or fly them around in a private jet. In the past, she couldn't afford to, but things were different now. Money shouldn't be a problem for her anymore, right? Her boyfriend was a wildly successful business tycoon. Jojo took out her phone and called her roommate. When Fiona answered, she was in a bit of trouble. She was on the way to her performance. However, Wyatt had shown up with a group of friends. They were all driving luxury cars, and they parked them in the street blocking the way. Then, Wyatt got down on one knee in front of Fiona again. He gave her a huge bouquet of roses and confessed his love to her for a second time. He was unwilling to give up. He was the laughing stock of campus. No matter what, he had to win her over. When he found out that she was on her way to perform at an event, he quickly ran over to intercept her. As she knelt on the ground, countless people around Fiona shouted, Say yes, say yes, say yes. Wyatt's friend even chimed in. Fifi, just agree to date him, okay? He's so good to you. Besides, what's so special about that loser? Compared to Wyatt, he's nothing. His friends did their best to encourage her. Fiona panicked. She didn't know what to do. However, she would never agree to date Wyatt. Just as she was reaching her wit's end, Jojo called. When she answered, she heard Jojo speaking loudly on the other line. Fifi, how could you keep this from us? You're dating a super wealthy guy, but you never said a word. Oh, I thought we were friends. You tricked us. Fifi, you owe us. Fiona was confused. She was also very curious to know what Jojo meant. What are you talking about? Don't pretend you don't know. We are watching your boyfriend give a speech right now. Wait, do you really not know? Jojo could tell that Fiona had no idea what she was talking about. Her tone sounded surprised. Fiona was even more puzzled than ever. What do you mean? She guessed that her roommate was talking about Damon, but she had no idea what she was referring to. Oh, well, it's hard to explain over the phone. If you really don't know, then hurry to the auditorium and see for yourself. The truth will definitely shock you. Jojo seemed very anxious. After saying this, she hung up. Fiona turned to Wyatt. I'm sorry, but I really can't date you. Moreover, I've got something I need to do now, and I've got to go to the auditorium. I'm sorry. After saying this, she left. But she didn't go to her performance. Instead... She turned around and rushed to the auditorium where the interview was being held. Fiona was on her way to her performance when Wyatt showed up. He blocked her path and tried to give her a bouquet of flowers. Luckily, at this moment, 
Jojo called. She told Fiona to hurry to the auditorium. Fiona wanted to know what was going on, so she turned and started walking back in the opposite direction. Seeing this, Wyatt's expression contorted with fury. Are you really rejecting me? But I like you. I really like you. However, Fiona just walked faster and faster. Wyatt threw the bouquet in his hand onto the ground and cursed at her. Damn it, you will regret this. After Fiona disappeared, one of Wyatt's friends asked in a low voice, What should we do next? Wyatt was furious. What do you think? I'm going to the auditorium too. You guys come with me. There might be trouble later. I want to see how capable her boyfriend is. All right, his friends agreed. Fiona walked briskly. Along the way, she saw many students heading in the same direction. Once people on campus heard that the guy from the viral videos was making another appearance, they all rushed over to catch a glimpse of him. Usually, talks like this didn't draw such a crowd. People who knew Fiona greeted her warmly. The scene reminded her of a time back in first year. It seemed like it had happened just yesterday. Meyerson University's College of Music was competing against the finance department in a basketball tournament. Hundreds of students had come to watch. The game went down in school history. At this moment, Fiona was thinking about that basketball game. It was a few years ago. Back then, Damon stole the show. When people saw him mopping up the court, they all raised their arms and cheered for him. With this thought in mind, Fiona walked to the door of the auditorium. When she entered, she saw that the place was packed with people. All the seats were full, and there were even students standing at the doors, listening to the talk. Usually, only famous celebrities drew crowds like this. She'd heard that some sort of business leader was giving a lecture today, but she hadn't paid much attention to who it was. Only now did she realize how popular this speaker was. When Fiona appeared at the door, she got a lot of strange looks. One student joked, Here late. Your boyfriend has been talking for a while already. Hey, you lied to us. What? She tried her best to remain calm as she walked into the auditorium. From the back of the room, it was hard to get a good look at the man on the podium. So she walked a little ways down the aisle. When she got closer, she realized who he was. Fiona couldn't believe her eyes. She quietly asked the man standing beside her who the guy on the podium was. The man looked at her in surprise. That's the founder of Everbright, Damon Walker. Don't you know him? If not, then why are you here for the talk? He said rudely. Few guys would dare speak to her in this kind of tone, but she wasn't in the mood to care. She didn't know who the founder of Everbright was, but she'd heard many stories about the company's world-famous games. After all, her roommates, Florence and Jojo, were big fans of these games. They thought that the person who'd created them was a genius. However, she had never thought that Damon was behind all of this. Fiona recalled what she'd written in the letter that she left him. She remembered writing about how they were both just ordinary people. She hadn't thought that they had the courage or capability to persevere and overcome the odds. She'd believed that he was talented, but she'd never thought that he had the ability to affect such a huge change. Not only had he changed himself, but he'd also changed other people and even the world. She wrote that she hoped when the two of them met again five or ten years down the line, Damon would have a successful career. Fiona didn't really care about this sort of thing, but her mother did. In her opinion, even back in Meyerson University, he'd already proved that he was something special. She hadn't thought him capable of changing the world, though. However, when she saw him at this moment, she realized that she'd been wrong. She should have known that he was indeed the kind of person who could create miracles. Why hadn't she believed in him? It was because her mother was so strong-willed. Fiona had always been too weak to fight back. She began to cry, but she stubbornly choked back her tears. Florence and Jojo, who were sitting nearby, saw her and waved at her. Damon, who until recently had been the laughingstock of campus, also noticed her. He was still talking, 
but he was looking right at her now. Fiona lowered her head. Her heart skipped a beat as she walked towards Florence and Jojo. She squeezed into the seat next to them. At this moment, Damon was undoubtedly the center of attention. Fiona hung on his every word. He was intoxicating to watch. Jojo tugged on Fiona's sleeve and complained, Fifi, you hit it very well. I had no idea. How did you keep a straight face while I was telling you to choose Wyatt? Well, I take back what I said. Your boyfriend is excellent. He's got Wyatt beat. Fiona's face turned red. It felt nice to be praised like this, even if she and Damon weren't lovers anymore. Florence rolled her eyes and said with a smile, So how are you going to make it up to us? I can't believe you didn't tell us about your amazing boyfriend. You're so mean. Fiona was too embarrassed to say that she was only finding out about Damon's identity now. She also didn't want to say that he wasn't actually her boyfriend anymore. However, she was very proud of him. She said softly, As long as you don't say anything bad about Damon again, it's all good. How can I make it up to you? Just tell me. Hmm, <laughs> well, let us think about it, okay? But you should mentally prepare yourself. Since you have such a rich boyfriend, we won't let you off easy. Fiona nodded. Okay. After that, she gazed back at Damon. She couldn't take her eyes off him. She suddenly regretted missing his important moment today. Luckily, she hadn't missed the whole thing. If she had, she'd definitely feel sad. She wanted to share the excitement with him. Fortunately, it wasn't too late. She'd arrived in time to witness his stunning performance. However, the good times never lasted. Before she knew it, the speech was over. After the talk ended, many students gathered their courage and walked up to the podium to ask Damon questions of their own. It was their dream to get close to this business leader. The staff wanted to stop people from approaching Damon, but he told them it was okay. So, he met with his fans. Some took photos with him, while others asked for his autograph. Then, a woman smiled and asked, Excuse me, Mr. Walker, are you the same guy who gave Fiona that little bouquet of flowers the other night? Everyone gazed at him expectantly. Then, Damon saw Fiona behind the wall of people, sitting quietly and waiting for him. A faint smile appeared on his lips. Yes. Everyone around him gasped. After that, people had even more questions. Mr. Walker, where did you two meet? Have you two ever kissed? When did you kiss for the first time? Excuse me, Mr. Walker. How have you managed to achieve so much at such a young age? What do you think of the people who call you a loser? After all, when you confessed your love to Fiona, you didn't seem to have much to offer. The students all started asking questions at the same time. Damon answered them one by one. Originally, Janice and Mio wanted to come say hi to him, but he was very busy. After waiting for nearly half an hour, they gave up. Janice remembered what she'd said to Damon before. She'd told him that in the end, they were just ordinary folks. Now she wished she could eat her words. Although she was ordinary, he wasn't. Since he aced his SATs, he hadn't stopped reaching for the stars. Finally, he'd reached a height that most people could only dream of. He was on par with Veronica and Avery. The surrounding students questioned him nonstop. After all, his story was too miraculous. The event staff were afraid that Damon would get tired, so they stepped in and announced that Mr. Walker had to get going. If people still had questions, they could ask next time. The students understood. They were unhappy to see him leave, but they gradually dispersed. After the question period was over, Damon heaved a sigh of relief. He looked at Fiona, who was watching him quietly from afar. Just as he was thinking about whether or not he should go greet her, he suddenly heard someone calling out to him. Hey, cousin, you were finally free. I've been waiting for you for a long time. Damon turned around and saw Miranda holding a book not far away. She looked at him in surprise. A rather tough-looking guy stood behind her. He smiled shyly at Damon. After all, Damon was Miranda's older cousin, so he had to make a good impression. Damon smiled back. Miranda wrinkled her nose and said with some dissatisfaction, Wow, you are really amazing. I hadn't expected you to be the founder of Everbright. Why did you hide it from us? Huh. That company is worth billions. I don't know what to say to you. It doesn't matter, he replied. 
Just say whatever you want. All right, all right. Are you prepared for Grandpa's birthday in a few days? Before, Miranda had been worried that her grandmother would make things difficult for him at the party. However, after today's incident, she felt that her concern was laughable. Obviously, her cousin had things under control. Finally, Fiona made up her mind and walked over. She looked at Damon, but she didn't say anything. He looked back at her. Although he knew that their relationship was no longer the same, he didn't want to ruin this moment. He felt very proud when Fiona looked at him like that. This must be your girlfriend, right? Naturally, Miranda didn't know the status of Damon and Fiona's relationship. She just assumed that they were together. Neither of them corrected her. Fiona didn't want any more guys like Wyatt to get ideas. Damon simply introduced them. Fiona, this is my cousin. Her name is Miranda. He no longer called Fiona Fifi as he'd done before. This showed that they weren't as close as they'd once been. However, no one else noticed this small detail. In fact, Fiona didn't call him Cupcake anymore either. She just called him Damon. However, when she heard him call her by her full name, her eyes dimmed slightly. Huh. Miranda rolled her eyes and smiled sweetly. Hello, it's nice to meet you. I'm Miranda. You are indeed as beautiful as people say. When Fiona heard that Miranda was Damon's cousin, she gave her a friendly smile. Hello, it's nice to meet you too. You are also very beautiful. Is this your boyfriend? He's quite tall. Miranda snorted and glared at Wesley. Silly, why are you standing back there? Hurry up and say hello. Until this point, Wesley had been too stunned to say anything. He was in awe of Damon. However, when he heard his girlfriend scolding him, he came back to his senses. He scratched his head. Hello, it's nice to meet you both. Damon turned to Miranda. Does your family know that you were in a relationship? Her face instantly turned red. After a moment, she finally said, They don't know. Please don't tell them. Seeing Miranda's cute response, Damon and Fiona laughed. They all chatted together as they walked out of the auditorium. When they got outside, they saw seven or eight luxury cars parked on the street. A group of people stood beside the cars, smoking and laughing loudly as if no one else was around. Wyatt leaned on his Lamborghini and smoked. However, he didn't seem happy. He furrowed his brow and frowned. A few women stood beside him. They comforted him in quiet tones. Since Fiona had rejected him, he'd been listless. His female friends all felt bad for him. When Damon and Fiona walked out of the auditorium holding hands, Wyatt and the others all looked in their direction. Finally, the person who they'd been waiting for had arrived. Wyatt saw Fiona with Damon, and his expression contorted in rage. He threw his cigarette butt onto the ground. Damon had just finished giving his talk. He, Fiona, Miranda, and Wesley walked out of the auditorium. When they did... They saw a bunch of luxury cars parked on the street out front. It was Wyatt and his friends. The group came over and blocked Damon and Fiona's path. Wyatt stood in front of them with his fists tightly clenched. Then, he suddenly pointed at Damon and demanded, Beefy, I just want to know, what's so good about him? Why did you choose him over me? He's just a smelly loser. He doesn't have any money. He then addressed Damon. I heard that you study at Meyerson University. Well, I happen to know a few people who go to school there. Do you know Shayla Doyle? Well, she's the chair of the Association of Young Entrepreneurs at your school. Anyone who's anyone knows about the association. Let me tell you, she's got connections. If you break up with Fiona right now, I'll give you a luxury car and I'll introduce you to Shayla. When you go back to Meyerson, you'll be like a whole new person. However, if you don't accept my offer, you better believe that I'll ruin your life. Fiona blushed when she heard this. How dare Wyatt talk to Damon like that? She couldn't take it anymore, so she gave him a piece of her mind. What are you doing? I used to think you were a good guy. Well, it turns out that you're a hooligan. Please go away. Miranda, who was hiding behind them, laughed. She felt that things were about to get really interesting. 
If she hadn't known Damon's identity, she would be worried that he couldn't handle Wyatt. However, at this moment, she really wanted to see how her amazing cousin would deal with this matter. Damon almost laughed out loud. He looked at Wyatt's group of friends and saw Shayla, the chair of the Association of Young Entrepreneurs, standing among them. They'd met on occasion back at Meyerson University. On top of this, Amber, the president of the association, had told her a lot about him. Shayla and Wyatt were old friends. Damon wondered how she felt about being used as a pawn in Wyatt's game. Shayla noticed him looking at her. She blushed and her heart beat faster. Two days ago, she'd heard that Wyatt's grand romantic gesture failed. So, she took a plane to Meyerson to comfort her childhood friend. She'd even advised Wyatt to abandon his gentle approach and take on more of a bad boy persona. Many women preferred tough guys. She also told Wyatt that she should beat up Fiona's boyfriend in front of everyone. That way, he'd embarrass and intimidate the guy. Then Wyatt could swoop in and steal Fiona's heart back. It would be perfect. Not many women could resist his charm. However, when Shayla saw Damon and Fiona holding hands and walking out of the auditorium, her heart sank. Although her plan was good, she'd never expected Damon to be Wyatt's competitor. He was a monstrous genius. No one could defeat him. At this moment, Shayla's only thought was to find a hole to hide in. It was too embarrassing. Hey, Shayla, why are you hiding back there? Damon called. Why haven't you said hi? Shayla shrank away. Damon took out a cigarette and lit it. Then he took a puff and smiled. Shayla knew that she couldn't hide any longer. She forced a smile as she walked over and stiffly greeted him. Mr. Mr. Walker, hello. At this moment, she realized that she didn't know what to call him. Should she just call him Damon like before? This didn't seem appropriate. After all, his identity was obvious. But calling him Mr. Walker also seemed strange. In short, she was in a panic. Hey, do you guys know each other? That's perfect. Shayla, tell him what I'll do if he offends me. Wyatt didn't know Damon's true identity, but she did. Wyatt was still gleeful. Shayla felt very embarrassed and couldn't help pulling the corner of his shirt, trying to tell him to back off. When she realized that he wasn't paying attention, she finally said gently, Wyatt, you, you need to stop talking. Why should I stop talking? This guy embarrassed me, and now I'm going to teach him a lesson. I'll say whatever I want. Shayla's face turned pale. Finally, she said, Do you know who he is? If you did, you wouldn't dare to say such things. Who is he? Shayla was so angry that she stomped her foot. He's, he's the founder of Everbright, Damon Walker. I mentioned him to you before. In that instant, Wyatt's expression froze. He was shocked. Shayla repeated, He is the founder of Everbright, Damon Walker. The guy who I was telling you about? He's the business leader of the new generation. Really? She nodded without saying anything. It was the truth. She couldn't deny it. Furthermore, she didn't want to see Wyatt offend a big shot like Damon. It wasn't worth it. Wyatt was dumbfounded. The name Damon Walker was all over the internet. The guy was famous. Wyatt, who had been confident a moment ago, now looked completely defeated. He'd just been dealt a heavy blow. His pride was gone. Damon smiled. Do you have anything else to say? If not, we'll be going. Wyatt shook his head foolishly. What else could he say? He knew when to admit defeat. There was no way to turn the situation around. He couldn't beat Damon. The guy was on a whole different level. Even someone as proud as Wyatt knew that this was impossible. Therefore, Damon led his friends off down the street. Wyatt's friends, who'd originally come to help beat Damon up, unconsciously stepped aside and let him pass. They watched him leave with expressions of respect, fear, admiration, and astonishment. Since Damon could afford it, he treated his friends to a meal at the fanciest restaurant near campus. Afterwards, Miranda and Wesley said goodbye and left. Damon and Fiona walked out of the restaurant together into the fresh air. At this moment, 
they both had a lot that they wanted to say to each other. However, in the end, they remained silent. It was late at night, summer was over, and an autumn wind was blowing. Damon and Fiona stood on the balcony of the hotel, a few feet apart. They weren't as close as they used to be. If people saw them now, they would think that the two were just friends. Only Damon and Fiona knew what the other felt. Congratulations, she gave him a long, hard look before continuing. Are you willing to tell me the whole story of your success? He'd changed a lot since she'd last seen him. Fiona had been working on herself too. She'd wanted to wow him when they finally met again. However, at this moment, she realized that she wasn't the only one who'd been working hard. Damon had also been working hard on himself. He'd come so far that she hardly recognized him, and she really wanted to know how he'd got here. He wanted to share his joy and hear about the hardships that he'd encountered on the road to success. How had he managed to overcome adversity? His journey must have been both joyful and painful, right? When she thought about how he must have suffered and how she wasn't by his side to comfort him, she felt a little guilty. She watched him with anticipation, waiting to hear the story. Damon frowned, as if he was recalling all he'd gone through to get here. Finally, he shook his head and smiled at her. Let's not talk about it. It's all in the past. Iona's big, beautiful eyes dimmed. She was sad that he didn't want to share his story of success and hardships with her. This meant that they weren't as close as they'd once been. Fiona looked into the distance. The moon was bright in the sky. It was already the middle of autumn and the air was chilly. A smile suddenly appeared on her face. Damon, do you remember the first time we met? He thought for a moment, then shook his head. I forget. Is, is that so? How could he forget? She trembled. Had he really forgotten the past, or was he just saying that? A look of disappointment flashed in her eyes. Finally, she murmured, Can, can I still call you Cupcake? Hearing the word Cupcake brought up a lot of memories. Were those beautiful and romantic times really gone forever? Has Damon really forgotten? How could he? Damon knew that he wouldn't be able to bear it if Fiona called him Cupcake at this moment. Her gaze was filled with anticipation and hope, but he kept a clear head. He had Avery now. He liked Fiona, but he wanted to be faithful to his new girlfriend. If he continued to be intimate with Fiona, it would hurt Avery. Furthermore, now that Damon had found his ex, it meant that he could finally let go and move on. He could love Avery wholeheartedly from now on. Therefore, he kept his head. With a faint smile, he said, Fifi, I forgot to tell you earlier. I have a new girlfriend. Oh! Her eyes dimmed, but she forced a smile. Then, congratulations. Can you tell me who she is? I bet she's very beautiful. She is. And she's my childhood friend. As Damon spoke, a tender expression of longing appeared on his face. Fiona lowered her head and didn't speak anymore. She knew that her relationship with Damon had come to an end. From now on, this guy in front of her was no longer hers. Goodbye, Fiona. I hope that you achieve your dream. She heard the sound of footsteps walking away and looked up. She watched as Damon slipped out the door and disappeared. Was that the last time that she would ever see him? Before, she'd wondered what sort of circumstances would bring them back together five or ten years down the line. But now, she had to face reality. He knew that she wasn't going to see him again. Could it be that he'd really left her life forever? They'd been together for such a short period of time, but she would never forget it. She should have given him her blessing and told him that she hoped he found true love. It was impossible for them to be together because her mother disliked him. This was the reality of the situation, but it still hurt. Fiona's heart felt empty as if her soul had left her body. She felt conflicted. After thinking for a while, she picked up her phone and dialed her mother's number. When Karen picked up, Fiona heard a gentle voice on the other line. Fifi, why are you calling? Do you miss me? Fiona didn't answer her mother's question. Instead, she asked softly, Mother... Did you already know that Damon is the founder of Everbright? Karen was silent for a while, and then she lightly sighed. How did you find out? 
he came to my school today to give a talk. He was being interviewed for the national news. Fiona assumed that her mother already knew. She likely kept tabs on the guy. Karen was speechless. She did know about his interview. It proved that he'd achieved great success. She also remembered what she'd discovered about him during Meyerson's 100-year anniversary celebration. She had to admit that she'd misjudged him. Hearing her mother's silence, Fiona went on. Why didn't you tell me? You broke your promise. You told me that if Damon proved himself worthy, you would support our relationship. So why didn't you tell me? Fifi, I... Karen sounded apologetic, but her daughter didn't seem to notice. He's so outstanding and talented, but you still don't like him. Why? Do you know how much it hurt me to lose him? She didn't care how much money he had. She cared only that he proved himself worthy to her mother. However, although he'd gone through so much trouble to do this, it was all in vain. Fiona couldn't blame him for giving up. No wonder he had found a new girlfriend. After dinner, Damon and Fiona went back to his hotel room to chat. He told her that he had a new girlfriend. Having found the closure that he needed, he wished his ex all the best and left. Fiona's heart ached when she thought about Damon in the arms of another woman. She'd seen the tender look in his eyes when he spoke of his new girlfriend. In the past, he'd only had eyes for her, but her stubbornness and cowardice had cost her everything. When she realized that she'd lost him, it felt like her soul had left her body. She would never be able to call him her cupcake again. She was still on the phone with her mother. Although Fiona didn't complain, Karen could sense her daughter's sadness. She didn't know what else she could say, so she tried to comfort her. Fifi, can you trust me? You will find someone even more wealthy and talented. However, her daughter had already hung up the phone. She looked at the door of the room in a daze, wishing that Damon would return. April, the head of Everbright's PR team, arranged for a car to take Fiona back to campus. When Fiona got back to her dorm, Florence and Jojo were waiting. Florence came over and patted her on the shoulder. I really admire you. I hadn't expected your boyfriend to be the founder of Everbright. Now that I think about it, it feels like a dream. Jojo chimed in. You should have told us sooner. If we had known, we wouldn't have been so pushy about Wyatt. Did you see his face today? Your boyfriend is miles above him. Wyatt really showed his true colors. He's really disgusting. Florence piped up. Fifi, how did you and your boyfriend meet? Both roommates were very curious about this, and they listened attentively as Fiona told them the whole story. She didn't hold anything back. She started with the argument that she'd had with Darren. Then... She told them about how she'd used Damon to make Darren jealous. As she narrated, she began to recall many details that she'd forgotten. She believed in fate. Who'd have thought that the random guy who she'd picked off the street to make her ex jealous would become so important to her? In the end, it turned out that their fates were intertwined. Perhaps at that time, something about him had caught her eye. Unknowingly, that choice had impacted her whole life. However, he was just a memory now, a memory that she'd never forget as long as she lived. After saying goodbye to Fiona, Damon stayed in D.C. a while longer. It was his grandpa Everett's birthday and naturally Damon's family had to attend the dinner. The night before the celebration, he met up with Robert and Nancy. The next morning, they all dressed up and set off for Uncle Arnold's house. Not only was Damon's whole family going to be there, but many of Grandpa Everett's friends and associates would be there too. Many people were coming from out of town to celebrate. After all, turning 70 was an important milestone. Silas, however, wasn't coming. The Brokerton Group's new project had reached a very important stage, so he had to stay in Meyerson for work. He'd arranged to have a birthday present delivered to Grandpa Everett. He also called to wish his grandfather a happy birthday. Everett knew that Silas was busy managing the corporation's affair on Robert's behalf, so he didn't blame his grandson for missing the celebration. As a matter of fact, some people were actually relieved that Silas wasn't attending. His mother and grandma, June, were also happy to hear that he was staying in Meyerson. Now, things weren't like they used to be. 
Robert's son, Damon, had returned, and Silas's position as the successor of the Brokerton Group was in danger. The only thing he could do now was to work hard and try his best. He had to develop a good relationship with the board members and shareholders so that they would support him. In addition, Grandma June planned to put pressure on Robert as well. If Silas proved himself capable of running the company, it would be easier for her to convince Robert to put his nephew in charge. Grandma June didn't like Nancy. Furthermore, her son Damon had been gone for many years. Who knew what kind of bad habits he'd picked up while living with that ordinary family? No matter how one looked at it, it was obvious that Grandma June favored Silas. She didn't even try to hide it. In her opinion, the Brokerton Group would prosper only if Silas inherited it. It couldn't go to Damon. Even if Silas had been able to attend his grandfather's 70th birthday celebration, Grandma June would have advised against it. At this critical time, appearances were everything. Grandpa Everett's doctor gave him a checkup and confirmed that his condition was stable. He gave the old man the okay to leave the hospital in time for his birthday celebration. When Grandpa Everett heard this, he was overjoyed. This was the best birthday present ever. He could celebrate with all his children and grandchildren. Additionally, his grandson Damon, who had been missing for more than 10 years, had finally returned. This celebration would be a true family reunion. The old man was over the moon. On his last birthday, he had to stay in the hospital. Grandma June had spent the day with him and a few immediate family members had come to have dinner with him in his hospital room. It had been a very subdued occasion. However, today he'd been discharged. Naturally, Grandma June was excited too. Countless relatives, friends, and associates were coming from all over the country to celebrate. The party promised to be very lively. This guest list showed the vast extent of the Brokerton family's influence. Grandpa Everett and Grandma June had four children, these children were all married, making eight in this generation alone. These couples all had children as well. All in all, there were nearly 30 immediate family members. Many of the people in Damon's generation were also married with kids, including family, friends, and associates. More than 80 people would be attending the dinner. They would need seven or eight tables to accommodate everyone. The family had hired a catering company and additional staff to help with the feast. When Robert, Nancy and Damon arrived. Most of the guests were already there. However, the dinner hadn't started yet. The staff were busy in the kitchen, and the guests milled about, drinking and chatting. Originally, Grandpa Everett had insisted on keeping the celebration small. He hadn't expected so many people to come. His children had organized the party, and they hadn't wanted any friends or relatives to feel left out, so they invited everyone. After all, it was Everett's 70th birthday, and he had just recovered from a serious illness. Everyone was happy, and they wanted to celebrate with him. Before the banquet began, guests gathered around to listen to Grandpa Everett's stories. Grandma June chatted with some of the younger women and imparted her wisdom upon them. The people of Damon's generation sat around the room in groups of two and three. They all knew each other, and they had a lot to talk about. Tyson and Sawyer both had large groups of cousins around them. Many young people here looked up to them. When Robert's family arrived, people turned and gave them strange looks. Grandpa Everett saw Robert and waved him over. Robert said a few words to Nancy and then went to join Grandpa Everett's group. Nancy hesitated. After a moment, she suggested, Damon, why don't you go and talk to your cousins? I will go and say hello to Grandma June. Just as she was about to leave, Damon grabbed her arm. Mom, don't go. He knew what she would face if she went to see Grandma June, and he didn't want her to suffer. He knew how his grandmother felt about his mother. Nancy trembled. She turned around. Be good. Don't worry about me. I know what I'm doing. After saying this, she strode off towards the crowd and Grandma June. However, the matriarch didn't even acknowledge her arrival. It was as if Nancy were invisible to the women around her. Nancy was a sensible woman. She walked over to her mother-in-law and greeted her. As expected, Grandma June didn't react. She pretended not to hear her. Nancy knew that this might happen. She tried to pretend that she didn't care, but inside she felt sad. Despite this, she forced a smile. The other women in the group snickered. They seemed to take pleasure in seeing Nancy defeated. 
no one asked her to sit. She stood next to them for a while. Then she realized that it would be less awkward if she sat down, so she looked around for a chair. She wanted to join the conversation. She saw an empty chair nearby and went to get it. Just as she was about to pick it up, someone suddenly shouted, Don't take that, that's my seat. Seconds later, a chunky 15-year-old came over and grabbed the chair out of her hand. He took it with so much force that Nancy almost fell over. She staggered backwards. Arnold, who was standing nearby, saw this and immediately scolded. Ross, what are you doing? Give your aunt the chair. The boy was unhappy. Who is she? He demanded. This is my chair. Why should I let her have it? Ross was Charlotte's younger brother. He was a spoiled brat, and he wasn't afraid to talk back to his uncle. Hearing this, Arnold got angry. He was about to teach his nephew a lesson when he heard Grandma June say softly, Arnie, why are you yelling at the child? Furthermore, that was already Ross's chair. Nancy was trying to take it. Didn't you see what happened? Everyone who was watching understood her meaning. She was blatantly siding against Nancy. They all knew that this wasn't really about the chair. Thus, no one dared to speak up on Nancy's behalf. Robert's expression darkened. He was furious, so he stood up for his wife. He knew that it wasn't appropriate for him to take out his anger on a child, so he said to his mother, Can't Nancy sit with you here? Grandma June's expression changed. Did I say that she couldn't? She just has to find her own seat, that's all. Damon was upset too. He was about to flip out, but he saw Nancy shaking her head at him. She was trying to tell him not to be impulsive. She would rather suffer in silence than let her son or her husband cause trouble at the dinner. She was worried that things would get out of hand. In any case, she'd suffered a lot at the hands of Robert's family. She didn't care about that anymore. Uncle Simon's wife, Tanya, sat close to Grandma June. She quickly patted the old woman's back and soothed. June, don't be upset. It's not worth getting angry over a silly woman. You have a big, happy family, so take heart in that. To curry favor with Grandma June, Tanya was willing to throw Nancy to the wolves. Hearing this, Arnold's expression became extremely ugly. Don't talk like that. Nancy is your sister-in-law. Don't you have any manners? Tanya looked hurt. Arnold, Robert, and Grandpa Everett were all glaring at her. She knew that she'd offended them. Fortunately, Grandma June was very protective of her. After all, Tanya had given birth to Silas and Sawyer, her most successful grandsons. Grandma June glared at Arnold. It's not your place to say anything. Since Grandma June was backing Tanya up, Arnold dropped the matter. June was no longer interested in making things difficult for Nancy. After all, her daughter-in-law was just standing there quietly, not making a scene. So the old woman went back to ignoring her. Seeing this made Damon even angrier, but he kept his expression calm. He found a chair and put it beside his mother so she could sit down. Then, he turned around and saw his cousin Ross pointing and laughing at them. <laughs> Ross didn't sit down on the chair he'd taken either. Instead, he used it as a footrest, getting the seat all dirty. However, no one said anything to him. Hey cousin, did you see what I did? What do you think? It was pretty good, huh? Ross bragged to Sawyer. Most of the cousins didn't know Damon. However, Ross had heard that Sawyer hated Damon and his family so he boasted about his deed, wanting to earn Sawyer's praise. Sawyer didn't say anything. Instead, he patted Ross's round head. The younger boy felt proud that his older cousin valued him. The other cousins sitting around them laughed. They pointed at Damon. To them, he was a joke. This group kept their distance from Damon. They avoided him like the plague. Any cousins who dared to chat with him were scolded for it. After that, they didn't talk to him again. Damon took a chair outside and sat in a corner of the yard by himself. He watched as his relatives enjoyed themselves, and he felt that they were all a joke. Hey, cousin! Just as he was starting to get bored, he heard Miranda suddenly call out to him. He turned and saw her coming over. Are you sure you want to talk to me? Have you seen how Grandma June treats me and my mother? Aren't you afraid that she will turn on you too? Damon and his family were attending Grandpa Everett's 70th birthday party. Grandma June didn't like Nancy or Damon. Because of this, many family members were rude to them. Damon was tired of dealing with all the drama, so he went to sit by himself in the yard. Soon after, Miranda came to hang out with him. 
She didn't care about other people's opinions. Hey, cousin, I'm bored. Can I hang out with you? Sure, I'm bored too. You're welcome to keep me company, Damon replied. Before either of them could say anything else, someone shouted from inside. Hey, Miranda, why are you talking to that loser? Come over here and hang out. It's more fun over here. It was Charlotte. She'd seen Miranda sitting beside Damon, so she quickly called over. She didn't want Miranda spoiling her plan. Hey, someone is calling you, Damon commented with a smile. Aren't you going to go sit with the others? Miranda shook her head. It's boring over there. All they do is spend their parents' money and chat about celebrities. I hate that stuff. She ignored Charlotte and continued talking to him. Why don't you tell me about how you aced your SATs? Also, how did you create Everbright? You know, I really admire you. If you weren't my cousin, I'd probably be in love with you. When Miranda's friends heard that her cousin was the founder of Everbright, they all went crazy. Even though they knew that Damon already had a girlfriend, a few of them still wanted to get to know him anyway. Having a friend like him would be super cool. Of course, they secretly hoped that they could become more than just his friend. They yearned to be his girlfriend or even just his lover. Miranda's school bag was full of laptops, clothes, shoes, and other small items. Her friends had given her these things, hoping that she could get Damon to sign them. Damon grinned mischievously. Actually, it all happened by accident. I have a great team at Everbright. That's why the company's flourishing. The real credit belongs to all my hardworking employees. Miranda smiled. <laughs> Steve Jobs didn't start Apple on his own, but history remembers his name. After saying this, she got her school bag and started taking out a bunch of things. Then she explained, All my friends want your signature. Can you sign this stuff for them? Damon groaned. He looked at Miranda's pleading eyes and he realized that she'd been planning this all along. He had no choice but to bite the bullet and start signing. The assortment of objects that Miranda had was very strange. Additionally, many of her friends had secretly left their phone numbers on the items for him. Some had even written messages expressing their love. At this moment, Ross came over. Hey Miranda, my sister wants to chat. She has a new bottle of perfume that she wants to show you. You should go over and take a look. Damon was in the midst of signing all the objects. Ross pulled on Miranda's arm, but she pushed him away. Let go of me. What are you doing? The younger boy saw that Miranda didn't want to leave, so he glared at Damon. Go away. You don't belong here. Leave Miranda alone. You should leave. You're not wanted. Sawyer and the other cousins who were watching from inside snickered. They pointed at Damon through the window. They were bored and they were trying to pick a fight. Ross was pissing Miranda off. What did you say? You were being very rude. What right do you have to say such things? I'm going to tell my brother. Unfortunately, her brother Tyson was stuck listening to Grandpa Everett's stories. He wasn't around to stop the fight. A petite girl ran over and took Miranda's hand. Don't worry about the guys. Let's chat about girl stuff. It was obvious that she was also in on the plot against Damon. All the cousins were bored and they were trying to stir up trouble. Miranda didn't want to go, but the girl pulled her away. Without Miranda around to make things difficult for Ross, the pudgy youth became even more arrogant. Sawyer had told him to tease Damon. The kid was only 15 years old, and he didn't have any brains. Once Miranda was gone, he pointed his finger in Damon's nose and told him to scram. Damon saw red. He'd run out of patience, so he stood up and faced Ross. Hey, fatso, do you need me to teach you a lesson? Neither you nor your mother belong here. You're a scumbag. Get lost. You're an embarrassment to our family. Ross spat on the ground. Damon nodded and smiled. I guess someone has to teach you a lesson. Well, since that's the case, I'm happy to help. As soon as he finished speaking, he punched Ross in the face. The boy let out a miserable cry as he went flying backward. He crashed into a tree and fell to the ground. However, Damon knew that Ross was just following the other cousin's orders so he didn't hit him with all his strength. He went easy on the guy. If he hadn't, the kid would be out cold. Surprisingly, Ross got to his feet and charged fearlessly toward Damon. It seemed that he really believed that he was defending his family's honor against this outsider. Since the kid had a death wish, Damon saw no reason not to knock him down again. He threw one punch, one after another, making his cousin howl in pain. The kid had no hope of fighting back. 
After beating on Ross for a while, Damon turned to face Sawyer and the others. He clapped his hands and shouted at them through the window. Who else needs to be taught a lesson? Come out here. Ross, are you okay? Charlotte screamed, seeing her brother lying on the ground. She helped him up. His face was covered in blood and he was crying. He'd never been beaten up before. Usually when people found out that he was a Brokerton, they left him alone. The family had a lot of influence. After seeing what had happened to Ross, the other cousins were scared silly. Sawyer, who had been watching the whole time, shouted, Come on, guys, let's teach this loser a lesson. Attack! Beat him up! We can't let him get away with behaving so atrociously. The other cousins shouted. They wanted to charge forward, but they weren't stupid. Furthermore, many of them had strict upbringings. Their parents had taught them that fighting was bad, so they usually just mocked and ridiculed people. In reality, they were all cowards who didn't know how to fight. Furthermore, they had all seen Damon beat up Ross, so they knew they didn't stand a chance. To boost morale, Sawyer took the lead. He rushed forward, but Damon caught him. He grabbed his cousin's trendy top knot and slapped him in the face. Sawyer acted tough, but inside, he was a softy. After Damon finished hitting him, he clapped his hands and exclaimed, Damn, that feels good. Damon beat Sawyer just like he beat Ross. When the other cousins saw how fierce he was, they didn't dare to move. They were so scared that they didn't make a peep. By now, the commotion in the yard had attracted the attention of the older generation. Additionally, some of the cousins had run in to tell their parents what was happening. Grandma June rushed out with a group of women behind her. She saw Sawyer and Ross lying on the ground, bleeding. When Ross's mother, Denise, saw her son, she immediately cried out in anger. She hugged Ross and asked him if he was okay. When Tanya saw that her son Sawyer had been beaten up too, she cried miserably. What's wrong? Are you hurt? Who did this? I will make him pay. Sawyer covered his face and cried. It was that guy. He choked through tears, pointing at Damon. Nancy went over to her son in a panic and asked, Honey, you're not hurt, are you? Mothers cared about their children above all else. Damon shook his head. It's fine. They were insulting you, and I couldn't take it anymore. Nancy immediately looked apologetic. She knew that the family had already looked down on her. She hadn't expected her son to be involved in the fight. If not for her, everyone would love Damon and Robert. Her son would be as respected as Tyson, Silas, or Sawyer. After all, he was a Brokerton. He should be entitled to the same privileges as the others. Her being here ruined everything. Thus, she felt even more sorry for her son. However, in the face of all the unfriendly gazes, Nancy acted out of instinct to protect Damon. If anyone dared to disrespect him, she would definitely give them a piece of her mind. Denise's husband, Douglas, was usually a timid person. Denise had taken a fancy to him because he also came from a prominent family. Although he didn't have any real power, he still lived a good life. Usually, he didn't dare to cause trouble with the Brokerton family. However, Damon wasn't really a Brokerton, was he? His last name was Walker. Did he really think that he belonged here? Thus, Douglas felt that for once he could have a say. He pointed at Damon and scolded. Did you hit my son? Who do you think you are? How dare you? Hurry up and apologize. Hurry up. If you don't, I'll make you. Denise glared at Damon. She was so angry that her entire body was trembling. She wanted to tear a strip off him. Nancy saw that these people were upset with her son, so she quickly stepped in front of him. She wouldn't let anyone touch him. People could tell from her demeanor that she would fight anyone who dared to touch Damon. If they wanted to harm him, they'd have to do so over her dead body. Damon rolled his eyes and said coldly, Stay away from me, all of you. I'll beat you up too if you don't leave me alone. He didn't try to hide what he'd done. He hadn't liked this rotten family to begin with, and he wasn't trying to win them over. Furthermore, he didn't care who he offended. Although good children knew to respect their elders, these people didn't deserve his respect. They were all scumbags, and he didn't care about them at all. Except for Grandpa Everett, Uncle Arnold, and Miranda, he never wanted to see any of them ever again. They disgusted him. He didn't care that they were his family. If they really cared, they would have treated him better. Damon had no patience for people like this. He was done being nice. How dare you? You, you are a real piece of work. Even though you think that you're a Brokerton, you will never amount to anything. You're an embarrassment to the family name. Douglas was so angry that he was shouting. 
He wanted to hit Damon, but he was a coward. To be honest, the guy scared him. Furthermore, if he did this, he'd have to contend with Robert. Robert had a temper. He'd held a grudge against Grandpa Everett for more than 10 years. If Douglas really dared to hit Damon, Robert would make him pay. Cut the crap. Shut up, Grandpa Everett bellowed. He'd come outside to see what was going on. Then he looked around and demanded, What's going on here? The cousins quickly told him about how Damon had brutally beaten Sawyer and Ross. Damon didn't care, though. Obviously, their opinions were biased. If they had the guts, they could confront him. At this moment, fighting was the only thing that made sense to him. Fortunately, Grandpa Everett didn't take sides. After hearing what happened, he asked what caused the conflict. None of the cousins answered. It was obvious that they had instigated the fight. Ross had said some foul things. Miranda, who was standing to one side, raised her hand. I know what happened. Ross insulted Nancy, so Damon attacked him. Then Sawyer went to help Ross, so he got beaten up too. Now things were starting to make sense. Grandpa Everett believed that it was likely Sawyer and Ross who had started the fight. Uncle Arnold glared at Sawyer. He roared angrily. You are an adult now. You should act your age. Watch your mouth. You need to learn some respect. Sawyer's face turned red. Robert couldn't stand to see this go on, so he stepped in. Let's forget about it. It's over now. Denise felt sorry for her nephew. She turned on Arnold. Why are you being so unreasonable? There's no need to yell at the boy in front of all the guests. It was Grandpa Everett's birthday dinner, and tensions were high. Damon's cousin Ross was stirring up trouble, and Damon finally ran out of patience. He snapped and beat his cousin up. Then Sawyer got involved, so he beat him up too. Now the aunts and uncles were upset. Uncle Arnold was furious. It's all their fault, he roared, pointing at Ross and Sawyer. Sawyer, who was the boss of a large company, was actually so afraid that he hid behind his mother. Tanya looked to Grandma June for help. Stop it, June scolded Arnold. Do you want to ruin your father's birthday? Do you want to cause a scene? Uncle Arnold didn't dare to say anything else. After all, his mother had a point. They were here to celebrate Grandpa Everett's birthday, not fight amongst themselves. After everyone cooled down, Grandma June finished. You can all go inside. I don't want any more trouble today. The banquet is about to begin. Don't cause any more problems. After saying this, she stared coldly at Damon and Nancy. Everyone could see the hate in her eyes. Fortunately, it was Grandpa Everett's 70th birthday celebration. Otherwise, she would have kicked Nancy and Damon out. Sawyer and Ross glared at Damon resentfully. Without Grandma June's support, they didn't dare to make a move, so they helplessly followed the adults in. Damon clapped his hands and shrugged his shoulders. He looked completely indifferent. As they walked inside, Grandma June turned to Robert. Teach your son some manners. We have rules here, and he can't just act like a hooligan. He needs to learn to control his temper. Grandma June's tone was rather polite. After all, she didn't want to anger Robert. She knew that he had a temper too. If he hadn't been around, she would have spoken more harshly of Damon. She didn't think much of the boy. He was quick to anger, and it would bring trouble in the future. It might even land him in jail. If this happened, it would ruin the family's reputation. It would be a disgrace to the broker to name. If that happened, she'd be the laughingstock of their elite circle. Robert didn't say anything, but Damon, who was walking behind them, piped up. Don't worry. If people are nice to me, then I'll be nice to them. Tell your grandkids to watch their backs. I will retaliate if people provoke me, and my fists are not to be trifled with. What did you say? You still haven't learned any manners, have you? When Grandma June heard Damon's response, her expression changed drastically. She was so angry that she trembled with rage. She was too upset to speak. If it weren't for the fact that today was Everett's 70th birthday, she would have ordered the staff to escort Damon out. At this moment, Tanya spoke up. There's no hope for you. You're nothing but a low-life thug. Whatever, Damon replied coolly. Do you have anything else to say? Obviously, I won't hit you, but I could slap your son a few more times. You better believe that I will. I'm a thug, remember? When Tanya heard this, she almost fell over. Damon had always been unruly, but this was just too much. 
He'd gone too far. He had no respect for his elders. However, respect had to be earned. Many members of the family had bad attitudes about Nancy and Damon, so Damon didn't see any reason to be friendly. He glared at Tanya. It was obvious that he meant what he'd said. Seeing his fierce expression, his aunt didn't dare to push him. In the end, Tanya had no choice but to drop the matter. Sawyer and Ross slunk off to nurse their injuries. Grandma June returned to her own table, and everyone else returned to their conversations. The matter had been temporarily resolved. Inside, the food was being served. Since it was Grandpa Everett's 70th birthday, everyone put aside their personal feelings. Regardless of how they felt about Damon, today was supposed to be a joyous occasion. Soon, the banquet was bustling with noise and excitement. For now, the fight between Damon and the cousins was over. Many of the guests didn't even know what happened outside in the yard. Damon, Sawyer, and Miranda were seated at the same table. Nancy sat with the other aunts. Grandpa Everett, as the guest of honor, sat at the head of the main table. Arnold encouraged everyone to start eating. As people ate, they chatted passionately with those around them. The women talked mostly about their children. They gossiped about what their sons and daughters were doing lately. Nancy wasn't included in the conversation at all. She just sat at the end of the table and listened to the others chat. At the next table, the uncles discussed national affairs, the economy, and politics. The cousins sitting at Damon's table talked about their studies. Damon sat and ate his dinner. He wasn't listening to the conversation around him. As long as no one stirred up trouble, he wouldn't either. However, if anyone dared to provoke him again, he wouldn't have a problem teaching them a lesson too. The cousins had seen what he'd done to Ross and Sawyer. None of them dared to provoke him. If he came after them, they knew that it would be impossible for them to defend themselves. At this moment, Damon was listening in on the conversation behind him at Grandma June's table. Tanya was telling everyone about her son. <sighs> Sawyer's grades have fallen a little. He almost failed one of his subjects. I wish he'd take his studies more seriously. She took a sip of her wine before continuing. But it can't be helped. Recently, he's been putting all his energy into taking his company public, so he doesn't have much time to focus on school. Oh, at least his company is doing well. Even the president of Georgetown is impressed. He said himself that Sawyer has a bright future. After saying this, Tanya beamed with pride. She thought very highly of her son. Sawyer was only 20 years old, but he'd already achieved a lot. In her opinion, he was the future leader of their family, and for him, the sky was the limit. Tanya was incredibly proud of him. However, Denise wasn't convinced. My Ross is also doing quite well. Although his grades aren't the best, he's on the student council. Oh, June, can you still talk to the president of Georgetown for us? Ross's grades aren't up to the school standards, but he's a talented boy. He's really good at drawing. Maybe he could attend the fine arts program there. After saying this, she looked expectantly at Grandma June. Tell Ross to focus on his studies. He has plenty of time to prepare for the SATs, Grandma June said lightly. You shouldn't just rely on your connections to get ahead. There is no guarantee that the president of the university will agree to help. However, I'll see what I can do. Thank you. We appreciate what you can do, Denise said gratefully. Although Grandma June hadn't promised anything, it was likely that she'd be able to pull strings in her grandson's favor. She had a lot of connections at Georgetown. A long-faced woman whose name was Mary Ann turned to Grandma June. Can you help Albert, too? You know, all these years, Albert has been working hard, but he's still in debt. Oh, actually, he just has the worst luck. That's why he's ended up in such dire straits. With your help, I think he can turn his life around. After saying this, the woman even shed a few tears. Grandma June also sighed softly. All right, I'll talk to my friends and see what I can do. Maybe I can find him a better job. However, he needs to grow up and take responsibility. He's turning into a hooligan, and if he doesn't make some serious changes, then even I can't help him. Grandma June seemed to be implying something. Nancy's expression changed for a moment, but then she forced a smile. Marianne quickly nodded. June, don't worry. No matter what, Albert is a Brokerton. He's not like that. 
The old woman nodded in satisfaction. She turned to the others. Oh, it would be great if all your children were like Tyson, Silas, and Sawyer. Then you wouldn't need my help. I want to see the next generation of Brokertons succeed. That way I can die happy. When people reached her age, they tended to speak frankly. Grandma June just wanted her grandchildren to succeed in life. If they did, she'd be satisfied. June, what are you talking about? Tanya quickly said. You and Dad still have long lives ahead of you. Why would you say such a thing? Tanya was sucking up to her mother-in-law. June praised her for being sensible, and Tanya smiled proudly. Then, she shot Nancy a dirty look. She hadn't liked her to start with, and now her son had hit Sawyer. This made her even more unhappy. So she rolled her eyes and asked, Nancy, what is your son doing these days? He certainly knows how to fight. He's probably a gangster or something, right? Before Nancy could say anything, Marianne opened her mouth and said, What was he doing in New York City all this time? He must be a gangster. We all saw him causing trouble earlier. He fought so fiercely. If he'd grown up with us Brokertons, we would have taught him some manners. At this moment, Tanya seemed to think of something. She patted Grandma June's arm. The old woman had a sudden realization and turned to look for Robert. Seeing him, she beckoned him over. Robert, Silas is running the Brokerton group while you're away, right? I heard that the business is thriving under his leadership. Robert nodded. Yes, since he took on more responsibility, the Brokerton group has made great progress. Although this wasn't exactly the truth, naturally Robert had to praise his nephew in front of Grandma June. Tanya chimed in. I'm glad. Silas has devoted his life to your company. You know that, right? Grandma June continued. Silas has a great career at the company. Furthermore, you are getting old now. You won't have the energy to run the company forever. I think you should move Silas to a more important position. For example, he could be your second in command. That way, when you retire in the future, he will be qualified to take over. He is the logical choice to be your successor. So, this was a plot to take over the company. In the past, June had never been so brazen. After all, she and Tanya knew that Robert had no children. Before, it had gone without saying that the Brokerton group would pass to Silas sooner or later. However, it was different now that Damon had returned. Therefore, Tanya urged Grandma June to put pressure on Robert. No matter what, Silas must inherit the Brokerton group. When Robert answered, his tone was polite. Don't worry, Mother. I'm aware of Silas's contributions to my company. In the future, he will definitely have an important role. An important role? Tanya's expression changed drastically. Grandma June's smile froze. What do you mean? What role? Will he not be in charge? If he's not your successor, then who is? Robert's expression changed. He looked at Nancy and Damon, then he explained, Mom, Damon has returned, and he is also qualified to take over the company. I don't want to discriminate against anyone. What I mean is... I haven't made any decisions yet. My future heir must prove himself capable. Tanya had something she needed to say. Robert, you are a very talented man. You've worked hard to build your company. How can you consider giving it to an outsider? An outsider? Who's this outsider? Robert scowled. Tanya immediately knew that she'd said the wrong thing. Silas might be considered the outsider. After all, he was only the nephew. So she quickly rephrased her words. What I mean is that Silas is so talented. If he doesn't take over the Brokerton group, the business might go downhill. Grandma June added, The Brokerton group is very important to the family. No matter what, we need someone capable of running it. If it falls into the hands of some hooligan, it will definitely fail. At this moment, Denise, who was beside her, echoed the same sentiments. By the way, Nancy, is Damon in university? Or did he drop out and become a gangster? Denise and her husband, Douglas, didn't attend the last family dinner, so naturally didn't know that Damon had aced his SATs. She thought that he must attend some sort of community college. In short, she didn't think that he went to a top university. However, when Denise asked this question, those who knew that Damon had aced his SATs looked around awkwardly. None of them wanted to be the one to tell her the truth. Nancy was furious. The whole time, she'd been silently enduring their snide comments. All she wanted was for this big family to accept her son as one of their own. 
she'd happily suffer on his behalf. However, she couldn't tolerate listening to them ridicule her son. They talked as if he were inferior to their own children. What mother wouldn't stand up for her son? So she finally broke her silence. Nancy was sitting at the table with all the aunts. The other women were saying rude things about Damon. Many of them assumed that he was a thug. Nancy couldn't take it anymore. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but my son is not a gangster. He's in his fourth year at Meyerson University, and he's probably smarter than your kids. Meyerson University? Denise couldn't believe it. She hadn't expected to hear that. Damon attended a top university. This shut them all up. After all, their children's grades weren't good enough to get into a famous school like Meyerson University. They had to rely on their connections to secure their kids' spot at top schools. Even Grandma June, who'd always looked down on Nancy and her son, had a look of surprise on her face at this moment. She thought to herself, So, this hooligan grandson of mine is enrolled at a top university. She looked down on Damon, and she didn't think him worthy of her attention. He'd been living with an ordinary family in New York City for so many years. No matter how talented he was, his future prospects were limited. Grandma June had high expectations for her grandchildren, and she hadn't expected him to meet her requirements. However, he'd gotten into Meyerson University. She was impressed. He must have some talent, at least. However, when she thought about his attitude just now, she felt that there wasn't much hope of saving him. Denise was having a hard time accepting what she'd heard. Meyerson University is just another school. When Ross graduates, he is going to Georgetown. Furthermore, Sawyer already studies there. Georgetown is a better school than Meyerson. Nancy smiled. Having the grades to get into Georgetown is indeed impressive, but Damon can also get into that school. He just doesn't want to go there. She sounded proud and confident. She paused, waiting for Denise to take the bait. As expected, Denise stumbled into the trap. She frowned. Students need much better marks to get into Georgetown. The school accepts only the best of the best. Nancy, are you sure you're not just bragging? Tell me, how good are your son's grades? Tanya, who knew how well Damon had done on his SATs, watched helplessly as Denise dug herself into a hole. Tanya didn't want to see the woman embarrassed again, so she pulled on Denise's sleeve and said, Damon got the highest SAT score in his state. Denise's expression changed. What? What? It's true, Nancy confirmed with satisfaction. Everyone around the table was shocked. Most of them were hearing this for the first time. They thought that Damon was just a hooligan, therefore they couldn't believe their ears. Grandma June was even more shocked. Her impression of her grandson instantly changed. She'd assumed that growing up with an ordinary family had ruined him, and she hadn't expected to hear that he was a student at Meyerson University. Not only that, but he'd also aced his SATs. What did this mean? At least he wasn't completely hopeless as she had imagined. No matter how one looked at it, it took talent to get a top score like that. Perhaps they'd make a Brokerton of him yet. Additionally, Grandma June felt more willing to forgive Damon for beating up Sawyer and Ross. Now she even felt a little proud of this grandson. The kid had succeeded without their help. Such a feat was indeed outstanding. Despite the fact that he'd grown up with an ordinary family, he'd still gotten into a famous university with top marks. How impressive was that? Hence, Grandma June looked at Nancy's serious expression and relaxed a little. She even took the initiative to ask, What was Damon's SAT score? It was above 1,550. I forget the exact number, Nancy said with uncertainty. Wow, he did well, Grandma June nodded. She felt a little embarrassed. After all, she'd always looked down on Nancy and Damon, so she didn't know what to say. If they'd been talking about Sawyer, Tyson, or Miranda, the old woman would have been over the moon. However, she still felt a little unwilling to praise Damon outright. However, this news still shocked everyone present. Before, Grandma June would have been happy if she never saw Nancy or Damon ever again. Was she actually changing her tone? For the first time in her life, she was changing her mind about someone. As a result, the women around her felt a bit jealous. However, the old woman couldn't care less what other people thought. In her eyes, a grandchild who she'd all but given up on had suddenly shown promise. 
her mood improved slightly. After all, no matter how large a family was, the older generation still looked to their children for support in the future. If Tyson, Damon, Silas, and Sawyer all achieved great things, then the Brokerton family would become even more prosperous. Hence, Grandma June said, Children are the future. We need to nurture Damon. The boy has a lot of potential. Georgetown is a better university than Meyerson. If Damon wants to transfer, I can make some calls on his behalf. The other women were even more shocked. Was Grandma June actually offering to help the young hooligan? Did she really think that Damon had potential? Tanya, who was sitting beside June, was very jealous. She'd worked hard for so many years to gain the old woman's favor, and she couldn't let Nancy and Damon swoop in and take it away. So she said, Mom, you should focus on Sawyer. His company is going to be listed soon. Can you make some calls and promote his business to your associates? After the company goes public, its share price will rise sharply. Although Silas had a bright future at the Brokerton Group, Sawyer's company was now flourishing. Tanya was very proud of him. After all, this was the result of his hard work. He hadn't had to rely on his Uncle Robert. Sawyer was Grandma June's favorite grandchild. When she heard that his company was going to be listed, she was overjoyed. She laughed and said, No problem. You can rest assured I'll do whatever I can to help. Thus, everyone laughed and talked amongst themselves. <laughs> However, things were no longer peaceful at Damon and Sawyer's table. Sawyer hadn't liked Damon to begin with, and now he was furious because he'd been beaten up. The more he thought about it, the angrier he got. He was thinking about how to get revenge. If he didn't, his cousins wouldn't respect him anymore. He rolled his eyes. When he saw Damon reach out to serve himself another burger, his expression suddenly changed. He reached for the same burger that Damon had already picked up. When Damon saw someone else's hands on his food, he was stunned. He realized it was Sawyer and frowned. What do you want? What do you want? Can't you see that I had this burger first? Get your filthy hands off it, Sawyer complained loudly. The other cousins knew that they were supposed to back him up, but they were afraid of Damon. They had all seen how he beat Ross and Sawyer up earlier. Damon smiled coldly. Let's ask everyone. Who had this burger first? Sawyer gave his cousins a look. Yeah, tell them. In the past, they would have sided with him without question. However, at this moment, no one dared to. They all looked away, pretending that they hadn't heard. Sawyer's expression changed drastically. Suddenly, he ripped the burger out of Damon's hand and threw it on the ground. Listen up, loser, he spat. You think that you're so awesome just because you can fight. Well, let me tell you something. My company is worth a ton of money. When it comes to ability, I have you beat. Do you believe me? Damon looked at the burger that Sawyer had thrown on the ground. What a waste. No one would be eating it now. So he picked up another burger from the platter. He began eating it with relish. After a moment, he put it down and said slowly, I don't care how much money you have. Do you really believe that you're better than me? You can't compete. Damon was the founder of Everbright. He had more money than Sawyer would ever have. Meanwhile, at the table, Denise was starting to feel that her children couldn't measure up to Damon, and she couldn't handle it. She wanted to discredit Nancy's son, so she piped up. Mom, acing one's SATs isn't really all that impressive. Lots of students do it. Besides, these days, cheating is rampant. Although Denise didn't exactly accuse Damon of cheating on his SATs, she was implying it. Grandma June remembered how Damon had beaten up Sawyer and Ross, and her expression darkened. Tanya saw that her mother-in-law's disgust for Nancy was back, and she immediately felt happy. She said arrogantly, That's right, at least Sawyer is honest. Plus, when his company goes public, it's going to be worth a fortune. Nancy was speechless. She couldn't believe that these women were actually accusing her son of cheating on his SATs. This was really too much. Her win over them had been somewhat short-lived. Sawyer and Damon were about to get into another fight. Sawyer was laughing loudly as if Damon had just told a funny joke. Loser, you don't know what you're talking about, Sawyer scoffed. Don't you feel ashamed to say things like that? You really want to compete with me in terms of money. Who do you think you are? 
do you even have money of your own? Just screw off. The other cousins all laughed. Suddenly, someone said loudly, Actually, Damon is the founder of a company worth billions. You're just embarrassing yourself. You should shut up. Everyone stopped laughing. They looked towards the source of the voice and saw Miranda. She had stood up, and she had a proud expression on her face. Sawyer exclaimed, Are you crazy? Do you know what you are saying? Ross nodded. That's right. Miranda, what are you talking about? Did you say billions? I'm not joking. Don't be so narrow-minded. Look at yourselves. Miranda hated Ross the most. He wasn't very smart, yet he always liked to stir up trouble. The rest of the family always had to clean up his messes in the end. In short, he was shameless. Miranda walked over to Damon and put her hand on his shoulder. Everyone, let me introduce Damon Walker, the founder of Everbright. He's the new business leader of our generation. Open your eyes and look. In the future, don't give him a hard time. He's a lot more powerful than any of us, understand? Miranda's face beamed with pride when she introduced him. Initially, she hadn't wanted to reveal his identity. However, she couldn't bear to watch her cousins ridicule him like this. They were all narrow-minded and short-sighted. So she stood up to defend his honor. Everyone around the table was stunned at first. Then, they burst into laughter. Ha 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 ha! Did you hear what Miranda just said? She said that this guy is the business leader of the new generation. Damn, I don't believe it. Ross scratched his head and smiled. <laughs> I don't believe it either. Miranda, are you joking? Do you really expect us to believe that he's the founder of Everbright? Miranda couldn't stand listening to her cousin's ridicule Damon any longer, so she stood up and announced his true identity to the rest of the table. When the cousins heard her claim, they thought it was a joke. They began laughing their heads <laughs> off. Sawyer found it so funny that he even began pounding on the table. <laughs> Ross, you know about Everbright, right? You like to play that company's games. Why don't you tell Miranda who the founder really is? Ross nodded. Okay, listen up. The founder of Everbright is named Damon Walker. He's a top student at Meyerson University. Bang. Sawyer brought his fist down on the table. His eyes were wide with astonishment. What did you just say? The founder's name is Damon Walker. As Ross said this, he finally put the pieces together. He scratched his head. Then, he remembered how Damon had disappeared and spent the last decade with a different family. This explained why he had a different last name from the rest of them. This was the first time Ross had met Damon, so he only now made the connection. Sawyer was in a daze. It took him a long time to come back to his senses. The other cousins were still laughing. However, they saw Sawyer's expression change and realized that something wasn't right. After that, they stopped laughing. They looked at each other in confusion. The mood around the table suddenly felt awkward. Miranda, on the other hand, remained cool. She leaned on Damon's shoulder and said sweetly, Now you know that I'm not lying, right? The founder that Ross just mentioned is right in front of you. Damon didn't say anything about it before because he's a humble guy. Ugh, <sighs> Sawyer... You do have quite a lot of money. However, compared to Damon, it seems that you fall short. <sighs> Sawyer looked at Damon in a daze and muttered, Impossible. Just impossible. How could it be? He had always considered himself the most outstanding young Brokerton. Secretly, he felt that he was even more successful than Tyson. However, in light of this sudden revelation, he was panicking. Since when has this bastard across the table from him become the founder of the most popular new tech company in the country? Sawyer couldn't accept it. He knew that the older generation of Brokertons favored and nurtured the brightest children, so the family would continue to prosper. If Damon was truly the business leader of the new generation, the adults would undoubtedly pour their resources into helping him. This would threaten the other cousins' inheritances. In the end, Sawyer might get less than he'd been counting on. This was a terrible thought. Sawyer's expression darkened. At this moment, the whole table was silent. The other cousins weren't stupid. In the past, they went along with Sawyer because they knew that he was the favorite grandchild. Furthermore, he was rich, so they all wanted to be on his good side. But now, someone more powerful and wealthy exists. Damon was the founder of Everbright. 
Who would have thought that such a person would be sitting in front of them now? Although the cousins were all aristocrats and had seen much of the world, Damon had achieved a lot more. Was this the same guy who they thought was a worthless hooligan? If Damon, the founder of Everbright, was worthless, then who wasn't? If that were the case, then the rest of them were subhuman creatures. In light of this recent revelation, only someone with no brains would continue to side with Sawyer against Damon. No, the cousins weren't that stupid. But this guy was too young to be the founder of Everbright, wasn't he? Ross was trembling. He said bitterly, But, Miranda, don't lie to me. I, I can't handle it. Damon had just beaten him up. The reason he dared to behave so atrociously before was because he had Sawyer backing him. Additionally, Grandma June didn't like Damon either. Now that the truth had come out, it was likely that their grandmother would change her mind. How could she find him worthless now? Damon's status within the family would skyrocket, and unfortunately, Ross had offended him. Damon hadn't shown any mercy before, and now, Ross was afraid that his cousin would never forgive him. Thinking of this, he almost wet himself. Miranda replied, Sorry, I'm not in the habit of lying. Why don't you ask Damon yourself? Damon was too lazy to respond. When Ross saw his cousin's attitude toward him, his blood ran cold. He recalled how the guy had beaten him up earlier and his legs felt weak. He actually started begging for mercy in front of everyone. Wow, really? So it's true, huh? Damon, hello. I can't believe I didn't recognize you before. You are a great man. Please don't waste your time with me. I, I will do whatever you say in the future. You can treat me however you want. I beg you, don't beat me up again. I'm sorry, I made a huge mistake. After all, he was only a teenager. He was so scared that he was in tears. Everyone around the table felt that Ross was an embarrassment, especially Sawyer, who wanted to crawl into a hole and cry. However, it couldn't be helped. Ross was only a 15-year-old kid who used Sawyer's name to intimidate others. In reality, he was just a coward. Usually, the other cousins just laughed this off, but today, they buried their faces in their hands and didn't dare to make a peep. Miranda felt that they were all useless. Now that they knew who Damon really was, they were all scared. What a joke. At this moment, the table where all the ants were sitting was very lively. Tanya fixed her hair and said proudly, Nancy, even though my Sawyer is busy with his business, he still attends Georgetown. If he really focused on his studies, he would have the best grades in his program. But then again, he has a lot of things on his plate right now. When he started his company, he was just having fun. She beamed with pride. He never expected to be so successful. Oh, after the business goes public, you should come and visit. He can give you a tour. Nancy didn't know how to respond. Obviously, Tanya was just showing off. She wanted everyone to know that her son was a hundred times more capable than Damon. Suddenly, the ants heard a commotion at the kids' table. What was going on over there? Of the women, Tanya was the most upset. The noise had interrupted her mid-brags. She turned angrily and demanded, Why are you making so much noise? Can't you see the adults are talking? One of the cousins stammered, Damon, he, he, what about him? I already know that he aced his SATs. What's so great about that? Tanya asked arrogantly. Miranda smiled and looked at her aunt in the eye. She said proudly, <laughs> He not only aced his SATs, but he's also the boss of a big company. The boss? Tanya was stunned. Everyone at her table turned to look, including Grandma June and Nancy. Grandpa Everett's table was a little farther away, and no one over there was paying attention to the aunts or cousins. They just continued chatting happily. Nancy's eyes were wide with surprise. She was also somewhat baffled. Why hadn't she known about this? Could Miranda be talking about Casey Games? But if Nancy remembered correctly, her son had a falling out with the company a long time ago. Apparently, after he left Casey Games, a world-class gaming giant called Everbright had swooped in and bought the rights to the flagship product, New Century. Could he have returned to Casey Games? Nancy didn't know what was going on, so she waited to see what would happen next. Tanya continued, The boss of what company? Does he own the company as well? Ugh, I doubt it. What's all the fuss about? Now, even people who work for MLMs dare to call themselves bosses. Taking a company public is a whole different story. That takes talent. 
Damon's company is listed on the market. It's worth billions. That's right, isn't it, Damon? Miranda asked. Damon nodded. Tanya's expression changed. What did you say? Miranda, are you feeling all right? Had she just said that his company was worth billions? That was crazy. You heard me, Miranda asserted. <laughs> Do you know the company Everbright? I've heard Uncle Simon talking about it before. Its games are incredibly popular. People all over the world play them. After saying this, Miranda pointed at Damon. Well, he started it. He's the founder of the company. Tanya's expression froze. Nancy was also stunned. However, the women didn't seem as shocked as the cousins had been. After all, they were older and they had more life experience. Just because they appeared calm on the surface didn't mean that they weren't secretly surprised, though. In fact, several of them felt very conflicted. However, even more were skeptical, especially Tanya, who had just been bragging about Sawyer. At this moment, she had a look of disbelief on her face. Miranda, don't speak nonsense. You're exaggerating. Ross, is what your cousin said true? At this moment, Ross was looking at news about Everbright on his phone. It was easy to find information about it. After all, the company had been in the spotlight lately. Although it wasn't the biggest new tech company, it was the one generating the most discussion. This was because Damon had recently done an interview for the national news. Popular esports team, the legendary heroes, had also participated. As such, Everbright was making headlines. Before long, Ross found the interview. In the video, the young founder sat on stage and chatted with the reporter. Beside him, the members of the esports team all listened attentively. They seemed to have a lot of respect for this young man. The founder of Everbright was tall and fit. His voice was loud and clear, and he was full of confidence. The same young man was sitting across the table from Ross. So, Ross quietly put his phone away. He looked at Damon and then at Tanya, who was waiting expectantly. Then, he looked around at all the cousins. He nodded. That confirmed it. Everyone had their answer. Grandma June let out a soft exclamation. She looked at Damon. Then she looked at Nancy. At this moment, she was seeing them in a new light. She didn't understand what kind of company Everbright was, but she'd heard what Miranda just said. It was worth billions. Had Damon really started it? Grandma June turned to Miranda and asked, Granddaughter, are you sure you're not mistaken? Have I ever lied to you? Two days ago, I saw Damon give a talk at my school. Grandma, do you know how many women at the academy admire him? She replied sweetly. At this moment, Tanya said sarcastically, What are you so proud of? Even if his company is worth billions, it's only that successful because his parents helped him. My Sawyer started his company from scratch, and he did it all on his own. Tanya assumed that Robert and Nancy had helped their son establish his company. The relatives and friends around her nodded in agreement. They didn't believe that Damon had started it on his own. That was impossible. Robert must have helped him. After all, the Brokerton group had a lot of connections. However, Miranda shook her head. Nope, Damon did it all by himself. Uncle Robert and Aunt Nancy only found him last year. However, at that time, Everbright was already famous around the world. In short, he'd started a huge company worth billions from scratch. If Grandma June didn't believe it, she could ask Nancy if she'd ever invested in the company. Grandma June, Tanya, Denise, and the others immediately looked at Nancy. However, she looked just as confused as they did. Obviously, she knew nothing about the Everbright. Moreover, Miranda was telling the truth. No matter how jealous Tanya was, she would have to accept it. If her niece was lying, she wouldn't have spoken with such certainty. Grandma June, Tanya, and Denise were well aware of this. June looked at her grandson, who she had considered a hooligan until now. When had he become so successful? Business is a battlefield. The fact that Sawyer had been able to fight his way to the top in the business world without relying on his family proved that he was talented. The Brokertons should be proud of the emergence of such a genius in his family. Perhaps he would even be able to shine brighter than Tyson in his career. It was only a matter of time before he moved up in the ranks. However, today, the family discovered that their other grandson founded a company with a market value of billions. That meant that he possessed enormous talent and sharp intelligence. 
and he'd done it all without a lick of help from the family, unlike Sawyer. An accomplishment of this caliber absolutely couldn't go ignored. June was in shock. When she thought of her attitude towards him and Nancy, she also felt a trace of regret. Perhaps even if Damon left the Brokerton family at this moment, he would still be able to live a carefree and prosperous life based on his abilities alone. Out of all of the family members at the party, Tanya looked the most foolish. She'd just been bragging about how her son didn't need to make top scores because he wanted to earn big money instead. She felt like she'd been slapped in the face. Everyone else could almost hear her idiotic bragging echoing ghost-like throughout the room. She wanted to find some words to smooth things over or humiliate Damon, but sadly, she found that in front of absolute strength, her words would mean nothing. At least now it proved that her son Sawyer was not a bit weaker than Damon. One reason was that under the protection of the Brokerton family, he became the boss of a billion-dollar company when he was still a student. She tried to comfort herself that in a bidding war, if two companies with similar market values heard that Sawyer had a huge family backing him, they would choose Sawyer over Damon. However, Damon was different. Ever since he had been exposed to the public more than 10 years ago, he was no longer favored by the family. This meant that Damon had not received any help from his father to get to where he was now. Furthermore, he was the boss of a company worth billions. What could Sawyer use to compete with others? Sawyer's school was ranked higher than Damon's, though Sawyer had entered Georgetown University through the back door. Tanya sighed. Sometimes, it didn't matter how someone had gotten to where they were, only that their achievements looked good on paper. The commotion attracted Grandpa Everett's attention. He looked up with interest from his table. Arnold stood up and asked what was going on. Miranda pointed at Damon and said, Dad, Damon is the founder of Everbright Company. Did you know that? This time, it was Arnold who was shocked beyond belief. After Arnold confirmed with Miranda and Damon, he rushed to Grandpa Everett's side and told him the details about Damon in a low voice. Grandpa Everett stood up from the table, followed by Robert and the rest of the family. Grandpa Everett's face had long been pale due to his bout of serious illness, but a hint of color flashed in his cheeks for the first time in ages. He waved his hand at Damon. Damon, come and sit next to your grandpa. I want to hear all about Everbright. Arnold raised his eyebrows. Damon, you're popular in the industry. We've all heard of your company. I've heard that your company is a global gaming giant. You're amazing. Damon walked over to Grandpa Everett's table. Everyone else looked on with envy. Being invited to that table by the patriarch proved Damon's importance in the old man's heart. In the past, only Tyson had been qualified to sit at that table. But then again, Damon's current achievements were much higher than Tyson's. His achievements were enough to compete with anyone at that table. Damon went to Grandma Everett's table and everyone sat down in their seats. Sawyer looked like he wanted to cry. A group of juniors was talking about the Everbright Company and the two explosive games under their banner. There was even a disciple from a branch family who requested Damon to help him forge a divine weapon for their game, which would be an incredibly popular feature. At June's table, she turned to address Nancy. Do you know when Damon established the Everbright Company? Nancy almost choked on her water. June rarely deigned to speak to her, and when she did, her tone was full of disdain. She slowly raised her eyes to meet June's, unsure of how to respond. She'd been caught off guard by the news and wanted to ask Damon a few questions herself. Denise chimed in. Nancy might not know. I heard that some students start their own businesses while they're in college without telling their families. Now it's just our job to nurture Damon and make sure that he stays on the fast track to success under our family's good name. All of the women at the table nodded in agreement. Once they'd realized what Damon had accomplished, they were quick to change their tune and throw their support behind him. After all, there was a lot of money involved. Rather than criticize him, it would be more prudent that they jumped on the bandwagon. Though there had been many twists and turns that evening, 
Everett and June were pleased with the sudden tide change. Not only was it a grand celebration of Everett's 70th birthday, but it was also a celebration of what their descendants were capable of. The stronger the roots, the taller the tree. And Everett and June could take credit for planting those roots in the first place. This set their family up for a flourishing future. The meal lasted for two hours. Grandpa Everett wanted to ask Robert and his family to stay in the courtyard. After all, this used to be Robert's home, and Grandpa Everett naturally wanted to get closer to his new favorite grandson. He wanted to ask Damon about his achievements after living away from the family for so many years. Just how much did he suffer? How many tears did he shed? Based on Grandpa Everett's understanding, if an ordinary person wanted to achieve what Damon had, they'd have to put in an extraordinary amount of effort. However, when Everett asked them to stay, Robert found a reason to refuse his father's request. Robert knew better than anyone that his wife and son did not want to stay in the mansion. Even though June's attitude towards Nancy had changed slightly because of Damon, the deep-rooted prejudice she had towards Nancy had a long way to go if their relationship was to be repaired. After saying goodbye to his parents, Robert took Damon and Nancy back to the hotel. Robert looked at the flashing neon lights outside the window. He was filled with emotion. What happened today was like a dream. His son was the founder of a company worth billions? No matter how many times he heard it, it still didn't seem real. When Damon introduced his company at the birthday party, it had only been a very short introduction. Now that the three of them were alone, Robert couldn't help but ask Damon for more details. Even someone like Robert couldn't imagine how a young man who solely relied on himself to start from scratch could create a company with a market value of billions at such a young age. Damon told Robert some tidbits of information about partnering up with people, finding financial backers, and how to bring the team to New York to establish themselves before going public on NASDAQ. Although Naaman spoke casually, Robert knew how difficult it was to start a business, and also knew how thrilling it was to finally go public. After listening to what Damon said, Robert and Nancy both beamed with pride. Nancy was so excited that tears fell from her eyes. Robert gently patted his son's shoulders and said, Damon, you have earned your father's respect. Robert was gratified. He'd been worried that Damon would have slipped into bad habits over the years, but he'd never wanted to say it out loud at risk of further alienating his son. However, Damon's excellence exceeded Robert's expectations. Not only had he gotten the highest SAT scores in the state, but now he was the CEO of a billion-dollar company. Damon was more than capable of handling Robert's business dealings with the Brokerton Group if he ever needed to hand them over. At the same time, he knew why Damon was so sure and confident when he faced Victoria Cardiff's provocation. He dared to surpass Victoria's seasoned capital without any help from his family. But then again, seasoned capital under Victoria's leadership was not to be trifled with. Their market value was twice as big as Everbright. Although the Everbright company was very powerful, Robert had also conducted an investigation and obtained some information about the Everbright company and the game. He found out it would be almost impossible to double Everbright's current market value. Even if the Everbright company had some amazing development, it should have passed the two-year agreement long ago. With the current size of the Everbright company, it would be extremely difficult for them to surpass season capital in a year or two. Robert furrowed his brow and looked on the bright side before he came up with an idea that allowed him and his wife to see a ray of hope. Robert said, Damon, the Everbright Company's performance is rising day by day. Perhaps you'd be open to a collaboration with the Brokerton Group? Unexpectedly, Damon saw through Robert's thoughts with a single glance. He was trying to use the corporation between the Brokerton Group and Everbright to stimulate the share price of Everbright so that they could surpass season capital as soon as possible. Damon shook his head and said, No need. Robert felt a little awkward. Nancy anxiously chimed in. Damon, listen to your father. Season Capital is doing well these days, and its share price will only rise. If the Everbright Company wants to catch up, I'm afraid it will be very difficult. If Damon couldn't surpass Victoria after the bet, his company might lose face. However, 
Damon still shook his head and looked out the window with a bitter smile. Currently, the Astromar network's influence was extremely skyrocketing as the number of users increased. If Damon revealed his trump card, it was likely that his parents would be floored. Furthermore, the Astromar network was not listed on the market. As for how much the market value could reach, no one knew. After spending a few days in the capital and settling family matters, Damon, Robert, and Nancy finally boarded the plane back to Boston. As the flight took off, Damon watched the city get smaller and smaller from the window, feeling melancholy. He couldn't believe that he was leaving. Did that mean that he'd never see Fiona again? Though he already had Avery, Fifi had made an impression on him. The city lights looked like tiny, sparkling stars. He placed his hand on the window and sighed, thinking about the tasks that lay ahead of him. His sister, Selena, had been accepted to Meyerson University and was about to enroll. She'd also achieved high test scores and hoped to follow in her brother's footsteps. Damon planned to personally pick up his sister and bring her to the new apartment. His sister's studies had been arduous since she was young. Damon hoped that Selena's college life would be peaceful and comfortable, and he'd do everything possible to make her feel at home. As soon as the plane landed, Damon received a call from Quinn. He wanted to introduce Damon to some important figures in the business world. Ever since Quinn returned from his travels, he had become proactive and confident. In his fourth year as one of the most powerful people at Astromar, he finally had more time to socialize and expand the business network. Recently, he had met a lot of influential people in the financial circle. Those people were eager to make friends with Damon, the real big shot behind the scenes. Quinn felt that their resources would be beneficial to Astromar's strategic development, and he was doing everything in his power to forge strong connections. Damon didn't reject the offer. Although the Everbright company was doing well, it never hurt to do some networking. Pleased that Damon had agreed, Quinn began to prepare for the meeting. The next day, Damon started early and rode his bike, enjoying the scenic views of Boston. He met Quinn in a nice coffee shop downtown. The coffee shop was owned by an influential character in Boston, and many important business people rubbed shoulders there. Damon had dressed to impress, just in case he ran into people who might judge him by his appearance. The coffee shop's decor was unique, but classy. Chandeliers cast a warm glow over the tables inside, and the building was split up into many different rooms to give customers privacy. The parking lot was filled with luxury sports cars, so it was unusual for Damon to ride up on an old bicycle. A car honked its horn behind Damon, Damon turned around and saw a white Ferrari chasing after him. Damon pulled his bike off to the side. Idiot! The man in the Ferrari cursed at him. Damon locked his bike and then stood near the entrance to wait for Quinn to arrive. A Mercedes-Benz pulled into the parking lot and a group of young people spilled out of the car. They strode up to the door, chatting amongst themselves. Suddenly they noticed Damon and looked at him with interest. One of the young women eyed him, then leaned over to another woman from her group. How about we make a bet? She whispered slyly. If I can succeed in seducing that handsome guy, you have to invite him to Europe for a 10-day tour. You have to eat and sleep with him the whole time, and you have to pay for all the expenses. The group of young people were all international students. Taking advantage of the fact that the gathering had yet to start, they figured that they might as well find some random guy to have fun with. The other woman twirled her hair and smiled. <laughs> okay, but what if you lose? Kiki asked her friend Angela. She glanced at Damon from the corner of her eye. What a small world. Who would have thought that she'd run into the man she met on the plane? He'd crossed her mind a few times since then. She'd seen him on the news when he shook hands with the mayor, and she knew that he was more powerful than he looked. Oh, I definitely won't lose. Angela replied confidently. She walked over toward Damon, attracting hoots and hollers from the young men in her group. 
They all knew that Angela was out of this random guy's league. After all, he'd had the gall to show up on a bicycle. Kiki rolled her eyes, but couldn't look away from the mess she knew was about to occur. Damon saw the girl walking towards him. She was indeed quite pretty. When she was standing in front of him, she batted her eyelashes and smiled demurely. Hi, I couldn't help but notice you. Are you here all alone? She asked. Angela stood so close that Damon could smell her peach-scented shampoo. Yes, Damon said with a nod. He grinned at her, then looked at the group standing behind her. He arched an eyebrow when he recognized Kiki. Angela's smile widened. It's like this. She trailed off for a moment, hesitant about whether or not she should continue. But then she remembered that all of her friends were watching their interaction, and she became emboldened. She cleared her throat and continued. My friends are all over there, and they like to play some crazy games. I'm not here on a date, and they told me that if I came here alone, then they'd get me drunk. And my alcohol tolerance is pretty low. She bowed her head. Damon smiled faintly. I'm afraid I'm not interested. Angela was stunned. She hadn't expected Damon to reject her so politely or so swiftly. It was a blow to her confidence. After taking a moment to process this, she pursed her lips and cocked her head to the side. Oh, is that so? Sorry to bother you. She began to walk away. After a few paces, she whirled around and gave Damon a bitter look. Last chance... Damon shook his head and grinned. Forget it. Have fun. Angela tried to keep the hurt and frustration off her face. She contorted her mouth into a smile in an attempt to show him what he was missing. Her friends stared at her as she walked back toward them, their mouths agape. As she got closer, they noticed the exasperated and flustered expression on her face. What happened? One of her friends asked. Oh, nothing. I just changed my mind, scoffed Angela. I mean, just look at his ratty old bicycle. It's disappointing that someone who looks like him would drive around a piece of junk like that. Of course, she couldn't be blamed for being so angry. She was not a woman who was used to being rejected or not getting her way. One of the men in the group snorted and said, It's true that he doesn't know what he's missing, Angela. Just forget about it. It's not a big deal. It's his loss. We're here to have a good time, right? Everyone laughed and walked inside to await the arrival of the business tycoons. Damon naturally didn't know what those young people thought of him, and he didn't care. As he continued to wait for Quinn, he studied the luxury vehicles with fascination. It appeared as if everyone who owned those cars were big shots in Boston. He wondered why so many of them were gathering that day at the coffee shop, which shifted to being a bar and an exclusive club as soon as night fell. Damon guessed that some of these people were likely the ones Quinn wanted to introduce him to. He stole a glance at his watch. Where was Quinn? One of the cars caught Damon's attention. A middle-aged man stepped out, flanked by a few other people, including armed guards. He spoke fluently in a foreign language as he walked inside the building. Damon raised his eyebrows. He recognized those people as old acquaintances, but had never before seen them in Boston. However, he didn't have any intention of greeting them. With a sigh, he slipped behind them into the coffee shop. As soon as they entered, the people inside were hushed. Though the big shots tried to keep a low profile, it was impossible not to recognize them. Look, breathed Ricky Brown, the handsome man from Angela and Kiki's group. That's Harvey Roxburg, the founder of BikeShare. It's kind of like Uber for bikes. You can run a bicycle through their app and leave it anywhere when you're finished. He's worth billions and he's my idol. Oh my god, I didn't expect to see him live and in the flesh. Kiki said proudly, What did I tell you? A lot of important people come here. It's Boston's best kept secret. Harvey Roxburgh seemed to be one of the younger tycoons who'd arrived so far. From a quick look, no one would have suspected him to be the founder and CEO of an innovative startup like BikeShare which had a market value comparable to Everbright, but was expanding even faster and had much wider margins for growth. There were infinite possibilities with a company like BikeShare, especially as users shifted more to in-app experiences. However, 
Harvey still hadn't reached as high of status as the man who stood in the center of the circle. My God, look, isn't that Paul Feinstein of Fantasy Tech? Ricky exclaimed. Angela and Kiki looked in the direction that Ricky was pointing and saw a man in his 40s. Although he was wearing sunglasses and looked very low-key, they recognized him immediately as the founder and CEO of Fantasy Tech, another established startup worth even more than bike share. From this, one could see how high the status of this group of big shots was. The two company representatives standing in the center of the crowd were both international corporate moguls. Then, the group quickly noticed a third. His name was Martin Ungermeyer, the CEO of a famous company that specialized in B2B marketing, and he was the clear leader of the group. Those three were like the holy trinity of the business world. Why were so many business super leaders gathered in this little coffee shop? It would surely be front page news in all of the financial papers the next day. But it didn't seem like anyone was reporting on it yet. How had these men managed to keep such a low profile? At the coffee shop, in the presence of such big shots, the group of young international students rummaged through their bags in an attempt to find paper and pens. They wanted autographs from the tycoons, and some of them even hoped for a selfie. Hey, I know Harvey Roxburgh. I can get autographs for you later, Angela murmured to her friends. Kiki and the others looked at Angela with disbelief, thinking that she was just trying to impress them. But they shrugged and put the pens and paper away. The moguls went upstairs and entered a private room. Ricky nudged Angela and pointed to Damon, who'd slipped into the coffee shop unnoticed behind the businessmen. The students frowned. What was a nobody like Damon doing at a financial summit? How had he even heard about it? Ricky hesitated for a moment, then strolled over to Damon and extended his hand to introduce himself. As the two men greeted one another, Damon looked at Kiki out of the corner of his eye. He smiled at her. Angela gave Kiki a strange look. Kiki, don't tell me that you know this guy, she said in a loud stage whisper. Kiki shook her head and said softly, Your assessment of his status was wrong. He comes from a very powerful background. Why do you think I was so confident that you wouldn't succeed in hitting on him out in the parking lot earlier? What kind of background could he have? Angela scoffed. I mean, did you even see his bike? While Damon was busy greeting the other students, Kiki leaned closer to her friend to clarify what she knew about Damon. Did you know that the last time he was in New York, he was personally received by the mayor himself? That can't be, Angela exclaimed. What does he do? Kiki shrugged. Though she'd seen the mayor greet Damon, she still wasn't exactly sure what line of work Damon was in. At that moment, a staff member of the coffee shop walked in. He scanned the room, then shyly walked over to Damon and whispered, Excuse me, are you the founder of Everbright Company, Damon Walker? Though the staff member hadn't spoken loudly, it was enough for Angela and the others to overhear, but they were sure that they hadn't heard correctly. Perhaps the staff member was mistaking this random nobody for someone important. When Damon nodded, Angela's jaw dropped. The employee's face lit up with a bright grin. Oh, I knew it. My colleagues and I are big fans, the staff member gushed. We just love your games, especially New Century. Would it be too much of an imposition to ask you for an autograph? He held out a piece of paper to Damon looking hopeful. Damon arched an eyebrow. He hadn't expected to be recognized, after all. With the growing popularity of the games, he had shown his face to interact with the players from time to time. So he shouldn't be so surprised. Damon shrugged his shoulders and signed the piece of paper with a flourish. After the staff member received the autograph, he thanked Damon profusely and ran off to show his colleagues. Angela and the other students watched the scene in fascination. Could it be that the man whom they had just been ridiculing was actually the founder of the Everbright Company? This was too shocking. Their faces flushed a deep shade of crimson, especially Angela's. She couldn't help but speak up and try to defuse the awkward situation. Hmm, what's so cool about that? It's just a crappy company that hasn't even begun to hit it big. Harvey Roxburgh, the founder of Bikeshare, is way better than this dude. More accurately, the founder of Bikeshare was someone with whom Angela was already acquainted, 
it was easy for her to try to save face and compare the two. Her friends glanced at her askance. They had heard her voice wavering, and they could tell that she wasn't as confident as she let on. At that time, under the guidance of the coffee shop manager, those business big shots walked towards the VIP rooms. Harvey didn't follow them in. Instead, he looked at Kiki and the others. When he saw Angela, his eyes lit up slightly, and he immediately walked towards them with a smile. Angie, his voice boomed. What are you doing here? You didn't even come to say hello to me. A proud smile appeared on Angela's gloomy face. She quickly stood up and waved at him. Hey, Harvey. I'm just here with my friends. I didn't think I'd run into you. Are you here to attend some sort of conference? I didn't read anything about it in the news. In the eyes of a woman like Angela, a gathering between so many CEOs was big news in the financial circle. Harvey smiled. Today it's just a small gathering of friends from the Kinzer Society, and we'd rather it didn't get leaked to the media. We're here to meet someone very important. The so-called Kinzer Society was just a business circle secretly formed by some very famous tycoons. Those who could join the Kinzer Society possessed only immeasurable wealth and fantastic prestige. The friends gathered around Angela were respectful to Harvey, but they were also envious of Angela for knowing such a prominent business leader. Angela quickly introduced Harvey to everyone, though of course everyone already knew who he was. After the introduction, Harvey turned to look at Angela. Now tell me, who put that sad expression on your face? He asked her. Angela could not help but look in the direction where Damon was sitting. Anger flashed in her eyes. It was him, she replied in a quiet voice. Who is he? Harvey glared at Damon. He might not look like much, but he's the founder of the Everbright Company, Ricky chimed in. He used his status to make fun of us. Ricky was lying to impress Harvey. After all, Ricky was knowledgeable about the business world. He knew that the games market was oversaturated and that a startup like Bikeshare had infinitely more possibilities for growth, so he figured that he'd declare his allegiance early. Adding in the fact that Harvey was a member of the Kinzer Society, Damon might as well have been a piece of litter on the ground. Sure enough, Harvey's eye twitched. He was surprised by the fact that he was coming face to face with the founder of Everbright. He curled his lips into a smile. Well, 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 he said slowly. I didn't expect the CEO of Everbright to be such a whippersnapper. Although Harvey wasn't putting on airs that he was much older than Damon, the way he spoke sounded like he was an elder giving pointers to the younger generation. Ricky, hoping to curry favor with Harvey, bobbed his head up and down. Yeah, he's young. His success is probably only temporary. That's right, Angela smirked. Speaking of which... Everbright Company's performance has been declining recently. It seems like the share price has also plunged. Harvey raised his eyebrows. The Everbright Company has indeed encountered a big problem recently, but judging from the public relations crisis, they haven't yet figured out a way to deal with it. That's why no matter how powerful the Everbright Company is at this exact moment, I'm afraid that it's not long for this world. You hit the nail on the head, Ricky exclaimed. Your analysis is impeccable. I feel like Bikeshare is a pioneer in its field and is light years better than some silly gaming company. Harvey glanced at Ricky and smiled. You don't have to heap praise on me like that. Then he turned to face Damon. Look, I might have a couple of ideas to get the Everbright company out of its current predicament. He put his hands behind his back. The major investors didn't want to dirty their hands with a vision that they didn't trust and that's how Everbright got themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. If we did decide to invest, then a young man like this wouldn't stand a chance. We could take him for everything he's got. Damon didn't know what these people were talking about. He took a sip of his coffee. All of a sudden, his phone chimed. A text from Quinn flashed on the screen saying that he'd finally arrived. Damon quickly stood up and peered out the window to see a black car smoothly driving into the parking lot. Harvey looked over Damon's shoulder. When he saw who he was arriving, he stood up and said, Angie, have fun with your friends. Buy everyone around on me. Someone very important is about to walk in, and I need to be there to greet him. Who is it? Angela asked curiously. Do you know anything about Astromar? Harvey smiled nervously. Well, this person is their general manager. Angela clapped a hand over her mouth. Oh my goodness, yes, of course. 
please go attend to him. She realized why Harvey looked so anxious. She and the other students had heard a lot about Astromar and realized what a big deal it was to do business with them. Although the Astromar network hadn't been listed yet, the number of users already numbered in the millions. The platform was extremely active, and any random person off the street could tell that it had potential. It had premium features and a user interface that was simple enough to use. Though it didn't yet have as many users as TikTok or Twitch, it was only a matter of time before it surpassed every other social platform on the internet and took the world by storm. There was no stopping a force that powerful. If the global general manager of a company as influential as Astromar was going to attend the conference at the coffee shop, it was no wonder that the members of the Kinzer Society were making it a point to show up. When Quinn walked into the coffee shop, surrounded by a few staff members, Harvey, who was already at the door, laughed and said to Quinn, Welcome, Mr. Marvel. So glad you could make it. Quinn shook hands with Harvey and gave him a placid smile. When Angela and the others saw Quinn, who was in his early 20s, their eyes widened. No matter how they looked at it, he was way too young to be the global manager. They blinked rapidly and looked between Quinn, Damon, and Harvey. Now that they saw the three of them together, they realized that the tycoons weren't much older than the students themselves. Some of the members of the group deflated. They felt like they were falling behind in life already. Quinn looked over Harvey's shoulder and soon noticed Damon. He released his hand from Harvey's firm grasp and strode over to his friend. Harvey, who did not know what was going on, naturally followed him. Sorry I'm late, Mr. Walker. Quinn bowed his head respectfully, making sure to emphasize Damon's title. He then introduced Damon to Harvey, who was standing behind him. Mr. Roxburg, let me have the honor of formally introducing you. This is the founder and CEO of Astromar Network, Damon Walker. Mr. Walker, meet the founder of Bike Share, Mr. Harvey Roxburg. Harvey was stunned. No, that couldn't have been right. He looked at Quinn with a confused expression on his face. Could this man be the official founder of Astromar? the company that threatened to surpass bike share before the end of the fiscal year? Harvey was so taken aback when he found out about Damon's identity that he couldn't say anything for a moment. He desperately tried to regain his composure. He was still a man of status, after all. After a beat, he stammered, Um, yes, of course. Uh, hello, Mr. Walker. The brothers of the Kinzer Society are waiting for you in the private room. He had thought that Damon was just the founder of the Everbright Company. He didn't expect that Damon was also the founder of Astromar. Harvey suddenly flushed bright red. Embarrassed that he'd been so patronizing, what right did Harvey have to advise a businessman as powerful as Damon Walker? He hoped that it wasn't too late to get on Damon's good side. Damon naturally didn't know what Harvey was thinking, he smiled and walked into the private room with Quinn and Harvey. The scene shocked Kiki, Angela, Ricky, and the others. Angela stared at their retreating forms. I... I think I heard them call him... Founder of Astromar Network? Is there something wrong with my ears? You heard right, Ricky replied in disbelief. Then Angela turned to Kiki and mechanically said, Kiki, you know him. Do you think you can get us an autograph? If the news got out that Damon had found two successful companies at such a young age, the media would have a field day. Kiki stood there in stunned silence, her eyes shining. Damon is truly a treasure, she thought to herself, feeling extremely pleased. When Damon walked into the private room, he saw that seven or eight outstanding industry leaders were waiting for him while sipping on steaming mugs of coffee. He took note of the faces he recognized. Among them was Paul Feinstein from Fantasy Tech and Martin Undermeyer from B2B Space. Together, the entire group must have been worth tens of billions. Harvey and his bike share startup were only a small portion of that total. This also indirectly proved how powerful the Kinzer Society would be. When this huge force was fully integrated, no one would dare to ignore it. When the VIPs noticed Damon entering the room, they were a little surprised. Damon was young, too young, 
How could such a young man create an explosive social platform like Astromar? And according to their understanding, he'd done it all by himself. Although Astromar was not yet listed on the market, its size was simply too huge to be brushed over. To be able to attract someone like Damon to the Kinzer Society would undoubtedly be a great boon. Damon was willing to deal with the eminent members of the Kinzer Society. At his level, money aside, he needed to expand his sphere of influence and network. Otherwise, he feared he'd be limiting himself. With the Astromar Network, Everbright Company, and the power of the Kinzer Society combined, Damon's future would be set. It was only natural that he'd be welcomed into the fold. However, when he joined the Kinzer Society Society, it would be difficult for him to hold any real status. The Kinzer Society had been running for so many years and had exerted a lot of power in the capital circle. Apart from internal solidarity and hard work, it couldn't be separated from the effective core team and board of directors. With Damon's strength and the Astromar network behind him, it wouldn't make sense for him to just be an ordinary member. The members of the society knew that Damon possessed astronomical assets, but he was ridiculously young. Some people had already started to question whether such a young man would be able to take on a great and demanding role. Furthermore, Damon had started from scratch. This meant that Damon was capable but he hadn't had his family's support. Family resources were important to the higher-ups of the Kinzer Society. Many of their parents had been even more powerful than they could ever hope to be. This was the so-called background that they wanted him to have, and it was something that the Kinzer Society valued. At their level, although they were in business, they had to have some political power, otherwise it would be very difficult for them to survive. They were concerned that Damon wouldn't be able to keep up. The business people chatted amongst themselves. Damon's position in the group had yet to be decided. Damon stood there awkwardly, drinking his coffee and speaking in a low voice with Quinn while the society members discussed the predicament. After chatting for a long time, Martin, the chairman of the group, suggested that they go out for something to eat. Outside the coffee shop, Angela and the others were sitting in the parking lot, chugging the last dregs of coffee from their paper-to-go cups. From time to time, they looked in the direction of the coffee shop. When they saw Damon and the other prominent business people coming out, their eyes lit up. Angela urged Kiki again to hurry up and ask Damon for his autograph. Suddenly, another group exited. They were the acquaintances Damon had noticed when he first entered the coffee shop. Mayor Francis was among them. When Mayor Francis appeared, everyone stood up straighter. The members of the Kinzer Society had great influence in the financial circle but it was still difficult to get close to political leaders like Mayor Francis. The CEO of Fantasy Tech, Paul, had met Mayor Francis a few times. He chuckled and moved closer to Mayor Francis, then said some flattering words. A few of Paul's colleagues didn't recognize the mayor at first. When they found out how powerful Mayor Francis was in political circles, they inhaled sharply. What was someone like Mayor Francis doing in a small coffee shop downtown? Paul was also a person of status, although it was inappropriate for political figures to get too close to businessmen, since Paul took the initiative to greet him. Mayor Francis could only shake his hand with a smile, but tried to maintain a respectful distance. Today, Mayor Francis had a political mission. He was personally accompanying two foreign dignitaries to tour the city and smooth over some diplomatic disputes they'd been engaged in. If he could succeed, it would undoubtedly secure Mayor Francis's re-election and could potentially be a stepping stone to future political endeavors. One of the dignitaries, Jean Blanchett, was a loyal fan of Damon's games. He'd engaged in countless video calls with Damon, and Damon had done him several favors in the game, such as giving him extra equipment and power stones. When Mr. Blanchett saw Damon, he immediately recognized him. Hey, buddy, how are you, Damon? His tone was a little excited, and his eyes were filled with anticipation. Damon nodded. Hello, the undisputed king of the game. Hey, my god, my old friend is you. I didn't expect to see you here. This must be a miracle. Mr. Blanchett, who had been pretending to be dignified, suddenly started dancing with joy. Then he threw himself at Damon and gave him a big bear hug. Everyone looked on with interest. Mayor Francis stared blankly at Mr. Blanchett. He did not understand what kind of relationship this young man had with a dignitary 
who hailed from tens of thousands of miles away. Mayor Francis is my old friend that I've been talking to you about. He is the one who called me and told me to open up the border. Mr. Blanchett smiled from ear to ear. Mayor Francis suddenly remembered how he knew the young man who stood before him. No wonder Mr. Blanchett was so excited when he met Damon. Mayor Francis took a deep breath as understanding washed over him. It was Damon, his daughter's classmate, who called Mr. Blanchett and saved the mayor's younger brother, Rex. Back then, his daughter, Emily, had tried to tell him that her classmate was familiar with Jean Blanchett. Mayor Francis had never believed it, but after seeing his face today, he realized that his daughter had been telling the truth the whole time. Without waiting for Mayor Francis to greet Damon, Mr. Blanchett pulled Damon over and said to one of the other dignitaries, Basil Levine, This is the founder of the Astromar Network and the ever-bright company, Damon Walker. The old century game we play is his masterpiece. Hearing Mr. Blanchett's introduction, Mr. Levine immediately shook Damon's hand. Hello, Mr. Walker. This is truly an honor. Jean and I are huge fans of your work. Although Damon was a businessman, Mayor Francis had never held people in the gaming industry in high esteem. However, seeing the warm way that the other dignitaries greeted him and remembering what he'd done for the mayor's brother, Damon's status was quickly being raised in the eyes of the mayor. His mind raced. Perhaps this could help boost the mayor's career. Hello, Mr. Walker. We only met briefly before. I never expected to see you here. What a lucky day. My daughter has always mentioned you. Thank you so much for saving my brother's life. If you need anything from me in the future, just say the word. Mayor Francis spoke from the bottom of his heart. For Damon's role in saving his brother, he couldn't express his gratitude enough. Mr. Blanchett laughed and said, Hey, buddy, are you free? If so, I'd love for you to grab a bite to eat with us. Oh my God, I have a lot to say to you. I'm so happy. Mayor Francis also took the opportunity to say, Mr. Walker, Damon, if I can be so bold, if you have time, why don't we have a meal together? I still need to buy you a couple of drinks and thank you properly. This time, Damon was in a dilemma. His original intention was to have a meal with the members of the Kinzer Society, but now he was stuck between two fruitful options. Which should he choose? Mayor Francis knew that Damon was in a difficult position, so he smiled and said, Damon, we'd love for you to join us. I'm happy to call a restaurant and make a reservation right now. From a few feet away, Paul eagerly chimed in. Mayor Francis, there's no need for you to call and make a reservation. How about this? I happen to own the Tribbiani Hotel. It has a great restaurant and it's not too far from here. How about we join groups and all go eat together? That sounds perfect, Mayor Francis agreed. Paul looked at his comrades from the Kinzer Society beside him, who nodded enthusiastically. It would undoubtedly be beneficial for them to be friends with Mayor Francis. Therefore, everyone was happy. They talked and laughed as they made their way across the parking lot. Damon was undoubtedly the core of the circle. The members of the Kinzer Society exchanged knowing glances as if to silently continue their discussion of what position Damon might hold in their group. The biggest problem that had prevented Damon from becoming a key member of the Kinzer Society was his background. But now, from observing Damon's interactions with the mayor, as well as the enthusiasm of his two distinguished friends, who would dare say that Damon didn't have a background? After all, no one else had been personally invited to eat with Mayor Francis. Gradually, the din died down as the group walked toward their cars and the coffee shop was quiet once more. At Meyerson University, maple leaves fell from the trees, covering the ground with a layer of gold. The campus was full of joy today. The antique door was covered in moss. A group of undergrads and grad students chatted excitedly under the big elm tree near the entrance, and moving vans dotted the landscape. Selena had finally arrived at the Meyerson that she'd dreamed about. Although it was a little old, the school gate looked majestic, every bit as beautiful as it had been in her imagination. Today was the day of the new students' enrollment. The moment Selena appeared, it immediately attracted the attention of many of the men hanging around the gate. No sooner had she stepped foot on campus when a swarm of people rushed over, offering to take her bags, help her unpack, and show her around. 
Selena was a bit frightened by all of the seniors gathered around her. They acted as if they were there to protect her, but it seemed like she needed protection against them. In the end, Selena chose to let two student council members with badges help her carry her luggage. The other animals immediately grumbled and dispersed. Selena had come to the school alone. Originally, her father Andrew and her brother Damon were going to accompany her and get her settled in. However, Selena decided that she didn't want her dad to be with her, so she told him not to come. Damon had a meeting that popped up last minute and couldn't be there until the afternoon, so Selena was left to her own devices. Since her brother wouldn't be there for a while, Selena decided to follow the student council volunteers to the assigned dorms to store their luggage. After that, they went to register and follow the rest of the check-in procedures. The one who sent Selena to the dorms and was in charge of carrying her luggage was a sophomore male student from the student council. His name was Steve. When he saw Selena's beauty, he started boasting, trying to impress her. It was said that freshmen were the best to lie to because they had no basis for comparison. Furthermore, a girl like Selena could not help but make her heart skip a beat. Steve wanted to rely on his eloquence and charm to make a good first impression with the hopes of winning her heart further down the road. What's your name? What are you majoring in? Steve asked. I'm Selena, she responded. I'm studying business and finance. Oh, financial school? I know the student council vice president of your school. We're good friends. In the future, if you have any questions, you can look for me and I'll help you with anything you need. Um, thanks, Selena replied, taking a swig from her water bottle. Right. Do you want to join the student council in the future? I'm a student council member and I've got some connections. If you want, just let me know and I'll help you join the student council. There are a lot of benefits to joining. Not only will you get a scholarship, but you'll also get points. Most importantly, if you want to become a class committee member, it will also be very helpful. My God, you don't know how awesome the people in the student council are. The current vice president runs a bar outside the school and does very well for himself. Everyone in the club is super talented. You might even have a chance to join the school rock band if you join. He paused to take a breath. Selena cocked her head to the side and waited for him to continue, sure that he wasn't finished. She was right. Of course, only joining the student council is only the first step. After joining the student council, you'll have a chance to join a higher organization. Do you know about the Association of Entrepreneurs? That is the ultimate existence at Meyerson. Most of the members have their own businesses and companies outside of school. Everyone looks up to them. They're like gods on campus. Steve kept talking while Selena pretended to listen carefully. She nodded and smiled from time to time. Although Selena had a noble heart, it was still her first time stepping foot on a university campus. She was easily confused by Steve's experience and all kinds of advice. When she walked into the dorm, her roommate was already inside. The roommate's name was Phoebe Green, and she'd grown up not far from Meyerson. She was pretty, with long dark hair and piercing blue eyes. She also had a unique sense of superiority that only the locals had, similar to Hector and Xander, Damon's former roommates. Although Phoebe had the pride of being a local, Selena greeted her with a broad grin. Coincidentally, Phoebe also had to go through the admission procedures. She had originally planned for her father to accompany her to handle it, but when she saw that Selena was with the upperclassmen from the student council, she decided to tag along. Of course, Steve readily agreed, excited to have two beautiful freshmen to show off around campus. The three of them walked out of the dormitory, Steve enthusiastically brought Phoebe and Selena to complete the items on their checklist. First, they had to go to the registrar's office. Then they had to take their ID pictures. Then they had to collect their book list and so on. Selena thought that the list would never end. There was an air of nervous excitement as they walked around. Steve took the lead, repeating to Phoebe everything that he'd told Selena in the hopes that she'd be impressed enough to go out with him. Since Phoebe was from the area, she was more familiar with the campus than Selena was. When Steve mentioned that he'd be participating in student council elections as well as the Association of Entrepreneurs, she frowned and said softly, My sister is in the Association of Entrepreneurs. Steve was shocked when he heard that. Your sister is in the Association of Entrepreneurs? It can't be. What does your sister do? 
BB just gave him a mysterious smile and didn't reply. This was enough for Steve to look at Phoebe highly, and he didn't dare to recklessly reveal his superiority as an experienced person in front of her. Suddenly, Selena's phone rang. Damon had finally arrived at the school. Selena said that she and some new friends were in the auditorium filling out paperwork, so Damon asked Selena to wait for him before hanging up. Selena grinned, happy to hear that her brother was on his way. Phoebe asked curiously, Who's coming? My brother. He's a senior. Selena replied proudly. No way. Steve was stunned for a moment. Phoebe's elder sister was in the Association of Entrepreneurs, and Selena's brother was a senior. Why did he feel that his posturing today might fail? Not long after, Damon appeared. Selena immediately cheered and threw herself into Damon's arms. Damon couldn't help but chuckle. Did you miss your brother? You know I did, Selena giggled. Steve was not willing to let the two beautiful girls, who were about to get rid of him, leave just like that. He stood beside Selena and looked at Damon, giving him a curt nod. Damon nodded back. When he found out that Steve was helping Selena and Phoebe familiarize themselves with the campus environment, Damon politely thanked him. It's nothing, Steve said with a dismissive wave of his hand. So, are you on the student council? No, I've never attended a meeting. A strange look flashed across Steve's eyes, and then he laughed. Good, then I can be the one to lead the young ladies to the student council. Things will be smoother with me around. Steve had finally found the superiority of his status, and he also had an excuse to stick around. Damon was an experienced person. He knew exactly what Steve was doing, but he didn't point it out. He simply fell into step with Selena, Phoebe, and Steve. Steve was very talkative. As he went through the enrollment procedures, he asked Damon, Hey man, have you never attended a student council meeting before? No, I'm pretty busy and just don't have the energy for something like that. Damon replied, Oh, joining the student council can be pretty beneficial. It's a great networking opportunity to set up for your future after you graduate. It looks great on a resume or job application. I mean, you've joined other clubs in your time at Myerson, right? Steve arched an eyebrow. Damon shrugged. I didn't participate in that either. Most importantly, I don't have time. Steve threw back his head and laughed, baring his throat. <laughs> wow, you're that busy at school? Classwork can't take up that much of your time. Yes, very busy, Selena interjected. I mean, he's a senior, just like you. There's a lot to finish up in those last few semesters. Sure, sure, Steve nodded quickly, but his attitude towards Damon changed slightly. After all, Steve was managing a full course load in addition to various clubs and student council obligations. He privately judged Damon for being so bland and not being able to handle extracurricular activities. Big Brother, have you participated in the Association of Entrepreneurs? Selena asked. Selena's sudden question attracted Steve and Phoebe's attention. Selena was smart. She could feel the subtle change in Steve's attitude towards her brother, but she was also embarrassed to say how much her brother was worth. She didn't want to out him as being so accomplished before he was ready to do so himself, but she hoped that her deliberate question would give him a nudge. Didn't Steve just say that everyone in the Association of Entrepreneurs was very powerful? Even the people in the student council thought that it was a great honor to be able to join the association. Selena knew that if Steve found out that her brother was already a member, he'd be quite impressed. To Selena's surprise, Damon shook his head. No, I haven't joined the Association of Entrepreneurs. Damon didn't need to. He was already accomplished enough. Selena's expression was slightly awkward. Steve and Phoebe exchanged a glance. With Steve helping them along the way, it saved them a lot of effort. In addition, Steve had deliberately pulled some strings for Selena and Phoebe, so he'd found a way to let the two girls go through the admission procedures rather quickly. Damon was very satisfied with Steve's efficiency. Although Damon still didn't trust Steve fully, at least he was proactive in helping his sister. When he thanked Steve, he even politely invited Steve to have a meal. However, Steve rejected him with the excuse that he still had other classmates who needed help. After all, there were more than a few new students who entered the school today. Phoebe also wanted to meet up with her father for dinner. Damon and Selena were about to break with the two of them when they suddenly saw a few school leaders not far from the auditorium. 
They were chatting and laughing as they inspected the new students' enrollment progress. Among them were Shayla Doyle, the president of the Student Council and president of the Entrepreneurship Association, and James Upperton, the president of the university. President Upperton and Damon saw each other at the same time. President Upperton smiled and waved. Damon, what are you doing at the enrollment fair for new students? Damon walked over and shook the president's hand. Hello, sir. My sister just happened to be a new student today, so I accompanied her here. Steve's jaw dropped. Did Damon have a personal relationship with the university president? President Upperton looked at Selena, who stood next to Damon and said with a smile, What's your sister's name? So nice to meet you, sir. My name is Selena Walker, Selena replied, shaking his hand. President Upperton was stunned for a moment. Then he grinned and pumped her hand up and down. Are you telling me that you're Selena Walker, the top humanities scholar? You had a near perfect score on your SATs. Selena nodded. President Upperton laughed and said, Damon, you are really good. I remember when you entered Meyerson as a provincial top scholar. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Meyerson University is extremely proud and humbled to have the two of you on campus. Although Meyerson was also one of the top five schools in the country, most of the top test scorers and valedictorians were often snatched away by competitors. So President Upperton paid special attention to the scholars who chose to attend Meyerson. Damon laughed. Thank you for the compliment, sir. President Upperton suddenly changed the subject. So I called you over here for a reason. My eyes lit up when I saw you. I want to help you with something. Damon was stunned. He did not understand why President Upperton wanted to help him. President Upperton nodded. You're in your fourth year, so you know that the employment situation is getting more and more serious. Your Everbright company business is booming. When are you going to arrange for your company to come to our school for recruitment? I will personally speak at the event. I'm telling you, it'll be mutually beneficial. You'll be able to recruit Meyerson's best and brightest, and I'll be able to help my students with their careers. It's a win-win. The president smiled triumphantly. Though Everbright wasn't as powerful as Astromar, students entering the workforce who chose to pursue careers at Everbright could expect to earn a decent salary and health benefits. Damon frowned, but before he could say anything, President Upperton continued. It's not difficult for the founder of a company worth billions to recruit people, right? Besides, the students of Meyerson University are outstanding. Your company needs to recruit people. You've made it this far. Can't you find it in your heart to help your peers and help the university in the process? Damon thought about it for a moment, then nodded. Okay, sir. I'd be honored to have a recruiting pool as distinguished as the students of Meyerson. After getting Damon's affirmative answer, President Upperton grinned. Great. Exactly what I expect from the CEO of such a successful company. I can't wait to sing your praises in the school newspaper so that the other students can learn from your example. In the future, I plan to publicize your deeds so that our students from Song Chang University can learn and observe. Take your schoolmates as an example. Oh, we don't have to go that far, Damon said sheepishly. Don't be modest. You are the pride of our school. When I was your age, I wasn't even half as accomplished as you are. President Upperton laughed loudly as he spoke, and the staff beside him also laughed. Damon chatted with President Upperton for a while, and then brought Selena, Steve, and Phoebe out of the school gate. Phoebe and Steve smiled and said goodbye to Damon. After that, Damon left with Selena. Steve, who was walking towards the entrance of the campus, started to lose his composure. When he saw a few classmates, he wiped the sweat from his brow and ran over to tell them what he'd learned. You might not believe me, but just now I bumped into a god among mortals. He's just a fourth year student here and he's already the president of two companies worth billions of dollars. Steve still had lingering embarrassment when he thought about how he'd behaved in front of Damon. Fortunately, Damon had been magnanimous and hadn't ridiculed him. Otherwise, Steve would have been so humiliated he'd want to drop out of school. Thinking of this, Steve took out his phone and scrolled to Selena's name in his contacts. He stared at the little icon of her face. He thought she was cute and he wanted to flirt with her, but now that he knew who her brother was, he sighed and decided to delete Selena's number. Steve knew his limitations. Selena was gorgeous and intelligent, but the difference between their life experiences was stark and he didn't need to chase after something that was never going to happen. She was simply out of his league. 
he pressed the red button to erase her contact from his phone and tried to put it out of his mind. That afternoon, Damon drove Selena to the Riverside Villa he'd picked out to take a look. He'd bought one for himself and another for his parents and sister in case they needed a place to stay. He'd included their names on the ownership certificate. Now, the renovation had finally been completed, and Damon was over the moon to be able to show Selena, though she didn't yet know where they were going. After driving for about half an hour, they arrived at their destination. The two-story villa was connected to Damon's, and it was in an excellent location. It faced the river and a lush green park. To make his family comfortable, Damon spent a huge sum of money to hire a top interior designer. The courtyard boasted a gazebo and a fountain. There was even a swimming pool. Though the villa was luxuriously decorated, it did not lose its warmth. So, sis, what do you think? Damon asked. Selena looked around, taking it all in. She'd never seen such a beautiful place. It was a far cry from what she's grown up around. She marveled at the light glimmering off the ripples of the swimming pool. It's breathtaking, she replied. Whose is it? Why did you bring me here? Damon took a ring of keys from his pocket and handed it to his sister. Selena, if you like it, it's yours. I've already signed the paperwork and your name is on the deed, along with mom and dad. You can come to stay here anytime you want especially if you need to escape the dorm life. Selena couldn't believe it. She hesitated for a moment before meekly accepting the keys. She was speechless. Damon had bought these villas for the family? It had to have cost him millions, especially since it was right in front of the river. She knew that she couldn't refuse a gift from her beloved brother, whom she had always regarded as a role model. After a beat, Selena chose to accept it vowing to repay her brother's love by working as hard as possible to be as successful as he was. They would always take care of each other. That evening, Damon treated Selena to dinner at a restaurant nicer than she'd ever been to. She was acting a little shy and reserved, which tugged on Damon's heartstrings. At dinner, he presented her with a bank card with an extremely high limit. She tried to demure, but he insisted that she take it. He didn't want her to suffer in college or deprive herself of experiences due to lack of funds. Their family had never been able to spoil her the way that she deserved, and now that he had the resources, all he wanted to do was take care of his little sister. After they finished dinner, he took her back to campus to familiarize herself with the school grounds. Selena was practically floating on air. It wasn't until after 10 p.m. that Damon finally sent Selena back to the girls' dormitory. Then. He also went back home to take care of some official business. Recently, the Everbright company spent a lot of money to launch a new game that was grander than the others. After his experience with the first two games, Damon was confident that this game would be even more successful because this was a game that he'd poured all of his efforts into. Investors were already lining up to claim their stakes. The game had thus far taken two years and millions of dollars to develop. No matter how one looked at it, this game was a big production. If it was launched, it could single-handedly save the future of Everbright. The game was called World War Web. Damon followed the game, beta testing it as much as he could. He wanted to get every detail right, down to the last speck of dust. Though he had to be on the lookout for errors and continuity issues so that he could fix them himself. After being busy for half an hour, just as Damon was about to sleep, he suddenly remembered that he hadn't logged on to his Astromar account for a long time. The last time he was online, he'd had a great chat with Veronica, but somehow it had been months since he'd checked his messages. He wondered how Veronica had been doing. With this thought in mind, Damon opened his Astromar account and found that Veronica had left him some messages not long ago. They were all asking where he was. Damon frowned. Why had Veronica been looking for him? He wasn't in a hurry to reply. He first clicked on Veronica's recent trends and saw that Veronica had recently updated a note. Has anyone ever moved back home from abroad? Can you tell me the pros and cons? Seeing this, Damon's heart began to beat faster. Why was she posting those questions? He racked his brain and figured that she was probably still trying to go to grad school in Berlin. That would mean that she'd be there for another four years. In that time frame, Damon was sure that she'd fall in love with someone and end up staying there forever. That meant that they might never see each other again. He started spiraling, despite himself. He thought back over the beautiful times they'd shared, 
They were classmates for six years, and for the first three years, they had every class together. Those six years had been the most beautiful time of his youth, even if he could not have Veronica. In a sense, they'd been childhood sweethearts who were always in the right place at the wrong time. In addition, he had saved Veronica twice and could be considered a friend. He had feelings for Fiona and Avery, but in the back of his mind, he'd always held out hope that he and Veronica would end up together. But that was all in the past. Damon quickly returned to reality. After all, Avery was still in his life, and Veronica had flown halfway across the world to pursue her dreams. He contemplated a bit, then replied to her message, Hey, remember me? He waited for Veronica to reply, but after five minutes, there was still no movement from Veronica's side. Just when Damon thought that Veronica was not there and was about to go to bed, he suddenly found that Veronica's profile picture had lit up. He then saw Veronica reply with a blushing emoji, followed by a reply. Damon, you're so busy. Every time I want to chat with you, you're nowhere to be found. Damon couldn't figure out if she was flirting or complaining. Although this was more or less a bit of fantasy, it was somewhat different from Veronica's aloof personality in real life. Damon's pulse quickened. He replied, It's true, I've been busy. I brought Selena for her first day of school today and showed her around campus. Is that so? Veronica sent a surprised emoticon. Wow, time flies. I can't believe that little Selena is old enough to go to university. Sigh. Damon tried not to respond too quickly, but he couldn't help himself. Yeah, time is so fast. In a flash, she'll be graduating and off to bigger and better things. Oh, I miss the time when I was that carefree. Now everyone's going separate ways. She accompanied this with a sad face. Veronica, I saw the note you posted. What's going on? Oh, well, my classmates and mentor are trying to persuade me to stay, so I'm figuring out whether or not I should renew my visa. Geniuses like Veronica, who would have some achievements in academics or the business world in the future, would be treated as treasures by any country. Damon did not doubt that she'd be an asset to any program and get her visa approved in no time. Then congratulations, he typed. I'm surprised that it didn't happen sooner. I guess I won't be seeing you anytime soon. Honestly, that'll be a huge loss to our country. Oh, do you want to see me? Why didn't I know that before? Veronica replied, accompanied by a playful expression of disbelief. Didn't you feel it? Who wouldn't want to take another look at a beauty like you? Damon sent the message before he could second-guess himself. As he chatted with Veronica on Astromar late into the night, Damon thought to himself, why can't Veronica see how beautiful she is? All of the guys he knew from school had been obsessed with her, but she'd never taken any of them seriously. Damon had chased after her for years, but he now thought that it was better to keep a distance so that his heart didn't get bruised any further but Damon couldn't say those words, no matter what. Seeing that Damon wasn't responding to the message thread, Veronica jumped in. I don't like Germany. I'm still not used to living here, and I don't like the food. I don't know if I even want to renew my visa. Wait, you don't want to officially immigrate? Damon asked. Veronica did not speak for a long time. Just as Damon was about to turn off his computer and go to bed, Veronica finally said, no, I don't, but right now I can't find a good reason not to go through with it. What kind of reason are you looking for? Damon responded. The other side was silent for a while, then said, I feel like there is something important in the country waiting for me to firmly grasp it. If I don't go, perhaps I won't feel at ease for the rest of my life. Damon tapped his chin. What was Veronica searching for so desperately? Three little dots appeared on the screen. Damon, didn't you tell me that if I go through with it, then it would be a huge loss? Why don't you just tell me not to do it? Damon was embarrassed that it could all be so easy. He hadn't even considered that he could play a factor in her decision. He thought about it for a moment, then shook his head. If she decided not to stay based on his input and things eventually went wrong, then wouldn't that be his fault? Veronica seemed to have guessed Damon's thoughts. She immediately backtrailed. Chill, I was just joking with you. Hmm, maybe I'll wash my face and ease into my day before I make a decision. I know it's late on your end. Good night. She sent a gif of a cat going to sleep. Then, her profile picture turned dark. How long had it been since they talked? Although Damon was still unsatisfied, he knew he couldn't force it. 
He lay down in bed and carefully recalled the conversation with Veronica. Suddenly, he felt that it was a little ambiguous. She'd acted so casual, almost coquettish. If it was in the past, he would have thought he was dreaming. After tossing and turning, he couldn't fall asleep. He decided to open his laptop again and start playing. Now that he was in his fourth year, he had a reduced course load and was mostly just working on his thesis. The other guys in his dorm were using the time to their advantage. Quinn was busy with Astromar business. Xander and Theo were pursuing their dreams of going pro with basketball. Even Hector had abandoned playing games all day long and went out to look for an internship opportunity. As for the old Levi, he'd graduated early and made a name for himself in the music industry. On the other hand, Damon seemed to have nothing to do. Currently, Damon was the only one left in the dormitory. He logged back on to Astromar and connected to the game. Due to the huge number of users in the Astromar network, Everbright and Astromar network worked together, so users could link their accounts and play Everbright games with their Astromar social icons. With his familiarity with this game and many bugs that only Damon, the developer, knew, he always did well when he decided to log on and take the game for a test run. He usually played alone so that he could find the game's shortcomings and correct them. However, this time, he received a friend request as soon as he got online. It was from a woman with the username CloudBusting24. Without thinking, Damon clicked the reject button. As soon as he did, his notifications chimed with another friend request, CloudBusting24 again. Damon once again reject. As soon as he did, he was hit with his third consecutive friend request from the same account. Damon had no choice but to click accept. He didn't expect that CloudBusting24 would send a message as soon as it was accepted. Hmph, why do you keep rejecting me? Damon furred his brow. For a moment, he wondered if he was being catfished. After a beat, he replied, what's the matter? He then checked his account to make sure that he was logged on as a normal player and not as an administrator. Why had this random user added him when he disappeared into the crowd? Can't I add you as a friend if I have nothing else to do? Where are you in the game? I'll go look for you, the mysterious user typed back. She seemed to be quite familiar with Damon. Damon sighed and typed, Black Tortoise Safety Zone. Hee hee, all right, wait for me. I'll be right there. Since he wasn't doing anything else, Damon figured that he might as well just stand in the safe zone and wait for a cloud busting 24 to arrive. He wanted to see what she was up to. Soon, a beautiful light flashed in the safe zone and a female mage with a beautiful profile picture and top quality equipment appeared. When she saw Damon, she immediately ran over. It was indeed Cloud Busting 24. This made Damon click his tongue in wonder. The other great function of the game was to use AI to alter one's profile picture and figure according to one's figure and appearance. Therefore, the appearance of all the players in the game world wasn't that far off from how they looked in real life. Cloudbusting24 was one of the most gorgeous players he'd seen yet. Let's go to the marriage hall. I already have the ring. Let's get married. The message bubble popped up above the mage's head. Get married? Damon was shocked. This was coming out of left field. From Damon's tone, Cloudbusting24 seemed to have guessed Damon's stunned expression behind the computer. Immediately, Cloudbusting24 gently said, What is it? You're not willing to marry a beauty like me? This gave Damon pause. After all, no one wants to refuse a great opportunity. However, Damon was still skeptical. What if his proposed bride was just some random dude sitting in his mother's basement trying to trick gullible game players? Why do you want to marry me? You should be looking for a warlord with your set of top-grade equipment. Damon opened his equipment stats window. His equipment was rubbish. No matter how he looked at it, he couldn't be confused with a warlord. Cloudbusting24 sent a bashful emoticon. Hee <laughs> hee, if I said that I knew you in real life, would you believe me? Damon found it hard to imagine. Furthermore, his personal account had never been revealed to anyone. Who would know, unless... Could it be someone related to the Everbright Company? Perhaps Isabel Branto from Silly Goose Company. As the Everbright Company and the Silly Goose Company's operations deepened, they'd started to pool some of their resources. If the enigmatic user was Isabel, it would make the most sense but Damon still couldn't imagine that she'd be so forward with an in-game marriage proposal. It was impossible in the real world, but the virtual world was different. Come on, why not? You have nothing to lose. Cloudbusting24 hovered over the safe zone as light as smoke. Damon's avatar still didn't leave with her, 
Sorry, I can't marry you. I have a girlfriend. I know. Cloudbusting24 sent another cute smiling face over and typed, and I also know that your girlfriend in real life is very beautiful. Besides, this is a game and not a real marriage. What else can you do? Damon threw his hands up. Okay, sure, you're right. Why not? Then he followed Cloudbusting24 to the marriage hall. Yes, it was just a virtual world, and Damon wanted to see what Cloudbusting24 was up to. The marriage system was the standard for almost all role-playing games. After so many years of development, practice proved that this system was very popular among players, and there had been countless game couples becoming real partners. In New Century, the player's funding could define the scale of their marriage. It seemed that Cloudbusting24 had planned this marriage for a while, so she had prepared it especially grandly. She had taken out all kinds of items to increase the festive mood. The only regret was that both parties did not have family and friends in the game to come and congratulate or support them. Damon played this game to find and eliminate bugs to improve. He did not have any contact with any players, so naturally he didn't have any other online connections. Cloudbusting24 didn't have any close connections either. Damon was dumbfounded. Was he the only person to whom she'd sent a friend request? Such beauty was a hot commodity in the game world. Moreover, she was wearing top quality equipment, so she must have played for a long time. She wouldn't be playing alone, right? Damon decided to speak up. Why don't you have any family or friends in the game world? Don't tell me we're secretly getting married. You've been playing this game for a long time, haven't you? Cloudbusting24 smiled and said, Oh yes, I've been playing this game for a long time, but I don't have a family or friends group because I've always played it alone. Damon raised his eyebrows. Then you can play it all by yourself and you can play with such fierce equipment. You're very powerful. But is it fun to play this game by yourself? Damon had a detailed understanding of the new century equipment system. After all, he'd personally designed it. It was meant to be a team effort. If Cloudbusting24 had gotten this far alone, then she must not be an ordinary user. I don't know. I just like to mess around when I have some free time, typed Cloudbusting24. Anyway, if I said that the reason I played this game was to wait for you, would you believe me? Damon was baffled. Why would she have been waiting for him? LOL, it's true, Cloudbusting24 said. Why don't you just treat it as a fun distraction to lighten your mood? That's what I do. Damon didn't know whether to laugh or cry. For a moment, he considered the possibility that Cloudbusting24 had deep feelings for him. But after all, he had never seen her before, so he felt that it was a bit ridiculous. Though they had no user connections between them, Cloudbusting24 had used her coins and gone all out to make the wedding ceremony a showstopper. She'd even specially invited a power player with the username Marky46 to officiate the wedding. Marky46 solemnly began the ceremony. Cloudbusting24, are you willing to protect him for the rest of your life, in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, sharing equipment and bonus missions as long as you both shall live? Cloudbusting24 quickly typed, I do. Then Marquis64's avatar turned toward Damon. Are you willing to protect Cloudbusting24 for the rest of your life, in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, sharing equipment and bonus missions as long as you both shall live? Damon hesitated. He didn't even know when this game would be shut down, so it really might be for the rest of his life. Cloudbusting24 was a little anxious. Hurry up and say it. Don't tell me that you're backing out now. She sent a sad face emoticon. Damon felt like he'd been backed into a corner. He sighed and typed two simple words into the chat box. I do. Okay, your marriage is officially established and you will receive the blessing and protection of the whole old century world. Mark Key 46 waved his hand and grinned. After that, a huge fireworks show was set off in the Black Tortoise District. As soon as the marriage was official, notes appeared under Damon and Cloudbusting 24's usernames to indicate to other players that they were married. Damon had an awful feeling in the pit of his stomach. After marrying user Cloudbusting24 in the game and seeing their relationship status change on their profiles, Damon felt weird. He never thought that there would be a day when he would be in an online relationship. Now that we're husband and wife, you can only call me a wife from now on, all right? Cloudbusting24's avatar said and made a shy expression. This is a bit awkward, Damon typed. Humph, what's there to be embarrassed about? It's already good enough that I didn't ask you to call me sweetheart, 
Cloud Busting 24 pouted. Come on, let's go fight monsters together. Cloud Busting 24 brought Damon to a wild beast land that was higher than Damon's level. Damon couldn't win, but his new wife had brought him there to gain experience so that he could increase in the rankings. Since he was on his regular user account instead of the admin account, Damon was a little flustered. One slap from the monster could make Damon bleed. If Cloud Busting 24 hadn't ferociously guarded Damon, he would have been torn into pieces by the monster. Though his new game wife was protecting him, she was also taunting him. I thought you were smarter than this in real life. You're such a clumsy player. Run, idiot, hide behind me. You're going to be eliminated. Damon rolled his eyes and typed, I'm not stupid. Don't panic, you have a wife to protect you. Please don't be afraid. Damon was a little embarrassed by Cloud Busting 24's words. However, her movements were smooth and natural, and despite himself, he trusted her. Damon had already saved himself from the effort to fight monsters. With Cloud Busting 24 helping him, his experience points increased rapidly. He also rather enjoyed watching Cloud Busting 24 fighting monsters. As he observed her swift movements, he almost felt intoxicated. Who was this woman in real life? Did she have a crush on him? In the future, you can come online and play games with me every day, okay? Cloud Busting 24 said as she fought off the monsters. I don't want to play for long. As long as you accompany me for a while, I'll be content, Damon replied. Cloud Busting 24 blew up another monster who'd crossed their path. Oh, right. You're now in your fourth year. Your internship is coming soon. Are you nervous? Well, with your talent, it's not hard to find a good job. How did Cloud Busting 24 know that he was in his fourth year? She didn't know that he was the boss of Everbright Company. This denied the possibility that Cloud Busting 24 was Isabel. Just as they were having fun, three male players suddenly appeared in front of them. Cloud Busting 24's figure and graceful fighting caught their attention, and they wandered over. Wow, hey gorgeous, can you level with me? I'll take you to fight the boss, exclaimed one of the male players. Yeah, why are you playing with this trash? Another player gestured at Damon's avatar. Isn't it a complete drag? He's a rookie. Just look at his lousy equipment. Get lost, the gentle and amorous Cloud Busting 24's expression changed when she came face to face with the group of hooligans. The other three players were amused. Who said you could talk to us like that? The first one said, looks like we need to teach you a lesson. Two of them rushed over and surrounded Cloud Busting 24 while the other one of them took care of Damon. Seeing the hooligans surround them, Cloud Busting 24 pretended to be afraid and hid behind Damon. She sent him a private message. Hubby, I'm afraid. Please protect my family, okay? Damon felt helpless. How could he protect Cloud Busting 24 with his trash equipment in this game? Even if he had good skills, he could do almost no damage to these gangsters. On the contrary, they could probably kill him with a single slash, and he knew that they wouldn't hesitate for a second to do so. Go! The three rogue users typed at the same time, then attacked. Damon's avatar was instantly beaten to a bloody pulp. Cloud Busting 24 originally wanted to see how Damon would play a hero to save the damsel in distress in the game, but she quickly realized that Damon was indeed quite weak. There were a few times that if he hadn't run fast enough, he would have almost been killed. Cloud Busting 24 finally got angry enough to attack the gangsters herself. She caught them off guard while they were busy trying to kill Damon. One by one, she took them out. <laughs> I didn't expect you to be so powerful in real life, but so weak in the game. You wanted me to protect you. Damon's jaw dropped. In real life, she must be very familiar with Damon. He summoned his pride and said, Oh, believe me, I'm stronger than you in the physical world. If you talk such a big talk, then can you put it to good use and protect me for once? Cloud Busting 24 sent another bashful emoticon. Although it was just a game, Damon's heart started to beat faster when he saw it. They continued playing the game and time passed quickly. Damon realized that he and Cloud Busting 24 lived an unusually relaxed life together. Not only did Cloud Busting 24 take care of him, but she also knew how to be considerate. She always asked Damon if he was doing okay, and from time to time she would send flirtatious emoticons. After they got more comfortable with one another, she messaged him. You know what? I think that calling you husband is a little too cutesy for me. How about from now on I call you stupid pig? I don't like that, Damon protested. Okay, stupid pig she said with a winky face emoticon. It was already past two o'clock in the morning. Damon was a little tired. He typed out a quick message. 
Look, wifey, this has been fun, but I'm going to log off. I'll play when I have some free time. His new game wife sent back a string of angry faces. If we continue playing, I won't be able to get up tomorrow and I have a lot to do. Damon made a sad face. Cloud Busting 24 sent a broken heart back and said, Are you logging off to go spend time with your beautiful real life girlfriend? No, I have to go to bed. Besides, my girlfriend is pretty busy with her career in LA right now, Damon explained. Is that so? Cloud Busting 24 shot back. Then, since your girlfriend is not by your side, can you come online every day to play games with me? I don't need you for long, even if it's just for 10 minutes. Just talk to me, okay? Crying face emoticon. She was terrified that Damon would refuse. I guess it just depends on how much free time I have, Damon answered honestly. After all, Damon had too many matters to attend to. He did not have much free time to waste on the game. Then I'll take that as a yes, Cloudbusting24 said. She waited until Damon's avatar disappeared and he had logged off. Then she begrudgingly logged off as well. Damon turned off his computer and laid down on his bed, thinking about his cooperation with Cloudbusting24 in the game. What was wrong with him? Why did he suddenly fall into an online relationship? The next day, Damon slept until 9 o'clock in the morning. The sun was shining brightly when he woke up. After Damon finished his morning absolutions, he called Selena to ask what she was doing. But she was busy with her roommate and didn't need anything from him. Damon hung up the phone and prepared to go to the Everbright office. The recently produced Global Hegemony was in the beta phase. Damon planned to personally go to the company to collect data and listen to the feedback of the players. In a few days, Damon needed to discuss a collaboration project. Although Everbright Company's market value was already in the billions, it was still expanding to develop other games to recruit employees. Therefore, the expenses were colossal, and due to the expansion phase, there wasn't much of a cash flow. He wanted to further expand Everbright's financial performance. The Everbright Company team had already made contact with many financial institutions. After the initial round of eliminations, they'd retained a few companies that would be open to collaboration. Unfortunately, the most lucrative option would be Season Capital. Not only could Season Capital afford a high price, but the person in charge of Season Capital had also seen the global hegemony game developed by Everbright Company and had a great experience. It was expected that this game would become popular and push the share price of the Everbright Company to new heights. That was Season Capital was more than willing to pay a pretty penny in exchange for shares. Damon was pleased because when he rushed to the company and asked the players in the beta testing for their feedback, it was all positive. Almost all the players in the beta testing were looking forward to when Global Hegemony would finally be released to the public. Everything was going even better than expected, but Damon still felt resistant to potentially joining forces with Season Capital. For selfish reasons, Damon didn't want to have any relationship with that company. He'd never forgotten the way Victoria Cardiff looked at him when they first met. It was hard to imagine what the outcome would be if he decided to work directly with one of his biggest enemies. However, Damon was very clear about public and private matters. The Everbright Company now owed a lot of money to the bank and their investors, and they needed to continue financing to solve their predicament. Since Season Capital could afford to pay, Everbright naturally had to cooperate with them. Damon would have to personally go to the headquarters of Season Capital to sign the contract with their leaders. According to Damon's understanding, Victoria was the second in command, and he was hoping that he wouldn't run into her. In short, this would be a huge test for both Damon and Everbright. After spending his day running around and handling matters related to Everbright, Damon returned to his dorm alone to study global hegemony closely. After the internal testing, many bugs had been detected. Damon did some adjustments and improvements in areas that the players were not particularly satisfied with. Although all these could be done by the staff, Damon took pride in perfecting the problem areas himself. He believed in his expertise and trusted his judgment more than anyone else's. After he'd finished the necessary work, it had gotten late. As soon as Damon's head hit the pillow, he suddenly Cloudbusting24, whom he had met yesterday when playing games. Although he didn't know who Cloudbusting24 was in real life, she'd been incredibly seductive in the game. So seductive that they'd joined their avatars in marriage. Avery was still busy with her career in Los Angeles and didn't have much free time. They spoke on the phone once a day, but only for a few minutes. 
Since Damon was in a long-distance relationship and his roommates had moved on to bigger and better things, it was only natural that Damon would feel lonely when he was left behind. Damon climbed out of bed and turned on the computer. Sure enough, as he logged into the game, Cloudbusting24 immediately sent him a message. Stupid pig hubby, you're here? I was afraid that you would stop playing and abandon me. I miss you. Come over, Damon replied. 30 seconds after he finished playing, Cloudbusting24 ran to meet Damon's avatar. Wow, lightning fast, Damon complimented her. Cloudbusting24 threw him a shy glance. Oh, I've been waiting for you here since I got online. I wanted to see you as soon as possible. What do you do? Don't tell me you play games all day long. Cloudbusting24's avatar bowed her head. Damon waited to see what she would say next. Damon and his wife in the game, username Cloudbusting24, were sending each other private messages as they moved through the levels. Hee hee, Cloudbusting24 typed. I'm also studying, but those studies are too simple for me. There's no challenge at all. And she paused a bit before continuing. I don't want to do anything right now. I just want to be with you. Is that okay? Damon was slightly touched by Cloudbusting24's vulnerability. Luckily, this was just a game. If there was a girl in real life who had such deep feelings for him, Damon would not be able to handle it. I might only play for a short while, Damon responded. Cloudbusting24 ran to Damon's side and used a set husband and wife movement to hug and kiss him. Instantly, a sweet kiss mark appeared on Damon's avatar's face. After the kiss, Cloudbusting24 asked Damon, Did you like that? Damon said awkwardly, This is just a game. I can't feel it. Ugh, you are a pig. Cloudbusting24 used a special movement to stamp her feet again and pretended to be dissatisfied. That was my first kiss ever, and I've rejected more men than I can count. Oh yeah? Damon scoffed. Since so many men love you, why are you going after me? Cloudbusting24 replied, How would I know? Maybe you, a stupid pig, poisoned me when I wasn't paying attention. I have a girlfriend, so there is no need for that, right? Why are you acting so familiar with me? Don't be so presumptuous. Damon furrowed his brow as he typed. In the game, Cloudbusting24 lazily killed a monster, then responded, Stupid pig, let me ask you something. In novels and movies, it's said that there is a kind of poison in the world. As long as the person you love consumes it, then the person you love will only love you forever. They will never leave you. Do you think this is true? Damon wanted to say that this was false. However, when he thought of the many miraculous things that happened to him, it also meant that some things weren't just the stuff of legends. Maybe it was true. Cloudbursting24 didn't wait for his reply before saying, Hee hee, if there is this kind of poison, I will do everything I can to get it. Then, one day, I will quietly come to your side and let you consume it when you aren't paying attention. Then, we will work together and travel the world together. Oh, come on, Damon said, you're exaggerating. Cloudbusting24 was quiet on the other side. The user behind the avatar slumped her shoulders and thought, You'll never be able to see me as I truly am. I can only talk to you this boldly in the virtual world. I would never dare to do so if we were speaking face to face. The two of them arrived at a higher level training ground. This was the place where Cloudbusting24 usually fought demons. Cloudbusting24 had brought Damon here because she wanted him to level up faster. When Damon was with Cloudbusting24, he found that time passed very quickly. Cloudbusting24 chirped happily and asked Damon about his studies and his life. Just as they were chatting and having a good time, something came in to disrupt them. New Century had been developed by Damon himself, so he naturally knew how difficult it was. At that moment, though he was still on his regular user account rather than the admins, he could see that there was a group of three to five people not far away. One of them was a guild alliance called the Los Angelinos Overlords. Their equipment rivaled Cloudbusting 24s, and they didn't look like they wanted to back down anytime soon. This time, it was not a disturbance from a gangster. The leader of the group, someone with the username Bukowski95, looked at Cloudbusting 24 and asked, When did you get married to this trash? Did he know Cloudbusting 24? Damon felt that things were more complicated than he thought. So he chose to wait and see what would happen next. Cloudbusting24 roughly knew the personality of these people and was worried that they would harm Damon, so she bravely stepped in front of him and spoke directly to their harassers. Her tone was cold. Identify yourself. I am Bukowski95. I've been chasing you for so long. 
Tell me where did this trash come from? This is my husband. Go away. If you harm him, I will not rest until you die, Cloudbusting24 declared. Bukowski95 let out a wild laugh. Then he turned to Damon and said, Which damn rat hole did you crawl out of? If you have the guts, don't hide behind your woman. Stand tall. Damon couldn't bear to remain silent. This is my woman. You better get lost. Don't think that I won't dare to kill you just because you have better equipment than I do. Immediately, the people from the Los Angelinos overlords started typing and laughing wildly. Bukowski95 felt like his stomach was going to explode. Who gave you the guts to talk big? Cloudbusting24, I will count to three, and you will get out of my way so that I can fight this trash one-on-one. -on -one. If not, I won't hesitate to kill you as well. If you dare to touch my husband, you'll have to step over my dead body. At this moment, Cloudbusting24 stood in front of Damon fearlessly. Bukowski95 was a warrior himself. He had a lightning bolt saber worth 200 coins in his hand. Without a second thought, he threw it at Cloudbusting24. As the developer, Damon knew that this saber was one of the best weapons in the whole game. Cloudbusting24 had no way of blocking it. He couldn't help but type angrily, Wifey, run, I'll take care of this. Before anyone got a chance to defend themselves, Bukowski95 used the super pay-to-win player skill to lock onto Cloudbusting24 and Damon, giving them no chance to escape. What Bukowski95 wanted was to ruthlessly humiliate Damon and Cloudbusting24 and take them out once and for all. Be careful, Cloudbusting24 typed in a private message to Damon as she fought side by side with her would-be husband. Bukowski95 smiled. Okay, today I will let you two fight together and let you die a quick death. With his top-grade equipment and combat strength, Bukowski95 was one of the highest scoring players in the game. Since Damon wasn't playing on his admin account, their skills weren't comparable. The only thing Damon could do was taunt Bukowski95 from the side and let Cloudbusting24 do him in. Damon's skills were quite strong, however the difference in levels and equipment was too great. Damon only revealed a slight flaw, and Bukowski95 quickly caught it. The lightning bolt saber in his hand drew a shocking arc in the air, and then fiercely struck Damon. In an instant, Damon was on the verge of death. Stop! Cloudbusting24 quickly typed. If you dare to kill my husband, I will find you and kill you, no matter where you go. Unfortunately, this was just a game. This kind of verbal attack was useless in front of a fierce man like Bukowski95. Bukowski95 waved the weapon in his hand and blade marks slashed through the virtual sky. Luckily, Damon managed to maneuver away from the other user's murderous intent. He'd been hurt, but he was still alive. Cloudbusting24 was overjoyed. She quickly picked up her weapon and rushed to help Damon. Since you want to die, then I will fulfill your wish. Bukowski95 waved his weapon. Cloudbusting24's equipment was indeed good. However, Compared to what Bukowski-95 possessed, it was still a grade lower. Cloudbusting-24 was still doing a fantastic job going up against this arrogant youth, but she couldn't fight by herself for much longer. Damn it, what are you guys doing? Hurry up and help me get rid of these two. Probably because he felt threatened by Cloudbusting-24, Bukowski-95 had long forgotten about the words and weapons he needed to fight one-on-one. -on -one. He angrily scolded his group for not having his back. His lackeys were startled to attention. They surrounded Damon and his game wife, not wanting to suffer the scolding for nothing. Damon knew that he wouldn't be able to weather the damage, especially now that his account was tied to his wife's. When they felt that Damon couldn't do them any harm, they started to attack Cloudbusting24. She had good skills and good equipment, but what she met today was a group of wolves with better equipment and no sense of shame. Damon's heart stirred. For the first time, he felt like Cloudbusting24 was his wife. What kind of shame was this? Seeing Cloudbusting24's health falling under the siege of the villains, Damon rushed in with all his might to save her. However, his equipment was too lousy. Just as he rushed into the center of the battle, a contestant's blade's tail stabbed Damon. With a scream, Damon fell to the ground and died. Cloudbusting24 exploded. She chased after the user who'd killed Damon, her exquisite skills killed that contestant in just a few moves. But a miracle would never happen. After Damon died, he didn't immediately come back to life. 
He watched Cloudbusting 24 get killed by Bukowski 95 with one big move. However, Bukowski 95 and the others also paid a heavy price for their deaths. Damon's anger burned wildly as he typed, Just wait for me. I will massacre your guild. Ha <laughs> ha Did everyone hear that? This random nobody said he wanted to massacre our guild. Good. I'll wait for you in Vermilion Bird City, you piece of garbage. Bukowski 95 didn't think that Damon could pose any threat to the Los Angelinos overlords. After Bukowski 95 and the others left, Damon turned to the resurrection point of the Black Tortoise Zone. Cloudbusting 24 was already waiting for him. Damon checked Cloudbusting 24's equipment and found that Cloudbusting 24 had lost a necklace. I'm so sorry that I couldn't protect you. No matter what, Damon blamed himself. <laughs> Don't worry about it, it's just a game. Cloudbusting 24 comforted Damon. Damon felt like crying. They not only insulted you, but also dropped your equipment. Trust me, I will get justice for you. LOL, okay, I believe that you'll help me get revenge. But please don't take this so seriously. Cloudbusting 24 wasn't stupid. She knew that in the real world, Damon could take on the Los Angelinos overlords with no problem whatsoever. Damon was powerful, but he also needed her protection in the game. This secretly delighted her. It proved her basic theory. No one is perfect. Damon was still playing the game with Cloudbusting24, who'd just been insulted by a rogue guild called the Los Angelinos Overlords. I will make them pay double for the insult you received, Damon said firmly. This was his promise to Cloudbusting24. Although it was just a game, it still had dignity. And as the developer, Damon had full confidence in saying this. Cloudbusting 24's heart fluttered. Although she didn't believe that Damon, with all his rubbish equipment, could go head to head with the Los Angelinos overlords, she could still feel Damon's persistence, and it took her breath away. In the virtual world, just as in real life, she was learning that she could count on him to protect her. Damon, is what you just said true? She typed. Damon was stunned. He didn't know which sentence Cloudbusting24 was asking about. Cloudbusting24 was anxious. She immediately stamped her avatar's feet and said discontentedly, Pig, you just said that I'm your woman, don't you remember? Damon finally remembered, and a trace of embarrassment appeared on his face. Cloudbusting24's expression was once again shy. I'm asking you again. Are your words true? You're just my wife in the game, but I take that seriously, Damon replied. Cloudbusting 24's mood instantly dropped. What Damon was referring to was only the game, but not reality. She should have known earlier that there should not be even a trace of fantasy. He had Avery in real life, so why would he care about her? Ugh. However, why would he, who had always been indifferent, also feel heartache? Could it be that he had feelings for her? Cloudbusting 24 decided to stay in her fantasy world for a little while longer. The truth would come out eventually. The in-game tragedy shocked every major player. As the developer, Damon was familiar with a bug hidden deep in the game, which was commonly known as the back door. At the same time, he controlled the source code and had all the backstage permissions. Damon had only told Cloudbusting24 about his plan to take revenge for her. Of course, to hide his identity, Damon hadn't been using his Demon Slayer admin account he didn't want to be recognized, nor did he want other users to think that he had an unfair advantage. Instead, Damon was using his alt account under the name Hellscream. Although it looked like a normal account, it had been modified by Damon to reduce all the damage the enemy dealt to him to the minimum. Even if the enemy had a divine weapon, it would still be able to cause a huge amount of damage to Damon, but it wouldn't be able to kill him. Thus, Damon wore a set of ordinary equipment, and only modified the background damage of the character as he charged toward the Los Angelinos Overlord's guild in the Vermilion Bird region. He was all by himself, and he was able to move the mountains, rivers, and other obstacles that crossed his path. Cloudbusting24 knew that Damon was going to attack the Los Angelinos Overlord's guild in advance. Cloudbusting24 originally planned to fight alongside Damon, but Damon warned her that this was a battle between him and the Los Angelinos overlords, and would not allow Cloudbusting24 to join in. Damon knew very well that if Cloudbusting24 joined the fight, 
she would use her main size and use all her strength. No matter who won or lost, she'd likely lose all of her equipment. Furthermore, the name Cloudbusting24 would spread throughout the entire game, which could turn her into a target. Under Damon's insistence, Cloudbusting24 finally agreed to hang back. If she couldn't fight alongside him, then she didn't even want to watch. She had long recognized Damon's ability, but this time, Cloudbusting24 couldn't see how Damon would win. Could it be that he would use all his useless equipment to attack the headquarters of the Los Angelinas overlords? If so, that would be digging his own grave. Cloudbusting24 didn't want Damon to become the laughingstock of the entire gaming circle the next day because of her. It wasn't worth it. That night, although Cloudbusting24 knew that Damon was online, she didn't dare to chat with him. She was worried that she would distract him, even if there was no chance of winning this battle. Contrary to Cloudbusting24's expectations, after midnight, the entire Vermilion Bird region was in an uproar as Damon began to attack the entire Los Angelinos overlords under his Hellscream username. The guild had thousands of players, but because Damon knew all of the secrets of the game, they were no match for his hacks. Blood flowed like a river through the streets. After Damon had slaughtered hundreds of guild members, he sought out their leader, Bukowski95. The mountain opening blade faced him with an indomitable will. Bukowski95, who was wearing top quality equipment, was killed at least 10 times until his lives and coins had been reset to zero. Countless players heard the news and raced their avatars over to watch the unprecedented battle. However, there were simply too many members of the guild for Damon to take all of them on at once. In the face of the overwhelming wave of people from the Los Angelinos overlords, Damon, who had changed his stats to become as strong as a god, was severely wounded. However, it didn't matter. After he died, he would return to his spawn point and resume his attack. Damon didn't have any good equipment on him. Ordinary equipment wouldn't affect his combat strength much. After all, it was an abnormal combat strength that had been modified by the backstage and dropped equipment. He would still be able to kill his way in and out. The one who suffered the most was Bukowski95. Furthermore, Damon had secretly changed the attributes of his weapon, increasing the chances of utter destruction. Every time he made a kill, he collected weapons from the victims and enabled users who weren't members of the guild to do so as well. Originally, the guild's restricted area didn't allow ordinary people to enter, but today was special because Damon alone had turned the entire Los Angelinos overlords upside down. All the members of the guild were busy exterminating Damon, so how could they have time to take care of other idle people? This caused complete chaos. Some users even formed a group to enter just to watch the fun. I heard that the Los Angelinos Overlords Guild has the equipment to pick up. Let's go and take a look, one of the random users typed. Hmm, I've been wanting to see what's going on in this guild for a long time, typed user Elfblood3000. Fogbreath574, I just picked up a rare item. It's a Sunset Saber. I'll sell it to the highest bidder. Naturally, these idle people would have enough time to pick up the equipment, watch the show, share resources, take advantage of the situation, and cause trouble. They would take the opportunity to give the Los Angelinos overlords a few hits. If there was enmity, they would finally be able to take their revenge. In the end, Bukowski 95's top grade equipment, which was worth millions of century coins, was destroyed and stolen in the fray. A character could revive without limit, and it was impossible to truly kill them. However, the destruction of equipment was worse than losing a life or two, since it took painstaking effort and countless hours of gameplay to obtain the equipment in the first place. On the contrary, the spectators who were watching the show didn't mind at all. Many lucky players made a lot of coins just by picking up the best equipment and reselling it on the black market. With tonight's battle, the Los Angelinos Overlord's strength in the entire gaming circle would be greatly reduced, and they might even be disbanded. The other guilds and independent users watched with glee and fascination. One of the reasons why the game was so popular was because its top-grade equipment was extremely hard to come by, and it was something that could only be chanced upon by luck. People rarely sold their rarest weapons. Cloudbusting24 was so touched that she cried in front of the computer, she didn't go to the scene because she didn't want to see her hero being miserably beaten. However, she'd been watching the ticker and the message threads, 
and she'd gotten wind of a single person challenging the entire guild and almost defeating the Los Angelinos overlords, she knew without a doubt that it had to be Damon. She wished that she could marry him in real life, but she knew that he was still with Avery. The thought of this made her heart ache. She watched the scene unfold secondhand from other users, excited posts, and smiled through her tears. Her hero was protecting her, and that's all she needed for now. The next day, the news of a person massacring the entire world quickly made headlines in online gamer mags. In Gamer World, there was a rumor about how this person called Hellscream was wearing low-grade equipment but possessed amazing skills, and how he fearlessly smashed the Los Angelinos overlords into pieces. Other users were still surprised and grateful that they'd been able to pick up new armor for free. People were especially giddy to have witnessed the takedown of Bukowski 95. No one could talk about anything else. All the players in the area were discussing the massacre. Due to the powerful influence of Everbright in the gaming circle, it began to leak out to websites focused on startup and business news as well. A controversy started brewing. The Los Angelinos Overlords Guild couldn't accept their defeat and decided to appeal. They thought that the player Hellscream changed all the data through the background bug. Otherwise, he never would have been able to accomplish the mass killing of a guild that boasted thousands of members. Everbright's game department began to conduct a comprehensive investigation. They wanted to find out how such a person who'd seriously broken the balance of the game had infiltrated so smoothly. But of course, they couldn't find anything. The parts that Damon modified couldn't even be found by the highest ranking internal staff or content moderators of Everbright. After searching for a long time, Everbright couldn't find so much as a clue, so they decided to just give Hellscream the win. They didn't want to see such a serious disruption of the balance of the game happen again. Everbright's internal investigation came up blank. Not only was there nothing they could find to implicate Damon, but they couldn't even trace the IP address of the user Hellscream. They figured that the player had to have been using a VPN, and there was nothing they could do but record the results of the battle in their system and count it as a win for Hellscream. Of course, Damon had already expected this outcome. Damon's alternate account was the destroyer of the order. Damon used his status as the top game developer to let Bukowski95 know the scope of his strength without revealing his true identity. At the same time, he also helped Cloudbusting24 save her reputation after being humiliated. Cloudbusting24 would never understand how Damon used his ordinary equipment to slaughter his way in and out of the huge guild and almost wipe out the entire Los Angelinos overlords in one fell swoop. The game had ended, so they had to return to reality. With Cloudbusting24's company in the game, Damon felt that time passed very quickly. But in real life, his fourth year life alone in the dorm made him feel a little melancholy. After all, the other students had gone out to do their internships and further their careers. The structure of Astromar was stable, but Everbright was still finding its sea legs as a company. Everbright burned a lot of money. There was more being spent than there was being earned. They needed new investors, and quickly. Damon oh. sighed. Finally, it was time for Everbright to sign the contract with the season capital. On the day of the signing ceremony, Damon brought the entire Everbright team for moral support. Initially, the season capital was going to send a car to pick them all up. After all, it was a billion dollar contract which warranted a grand gesture. Damon rejected their good intentions. They weren't far from the headquarters, so it wouldn't make sense to take a car, and it was important to Damon that his company didn't look like a charity case. The Season Capital office branch was located in a skyscraper in the bustling financial district downtown, spread across several floors in the tallest building in the city. Damon quietly judged Season Capital for their ostentatious display of wealth. As Damon and his team strode over to the building, a luxury car suddenly appeared behind them. It didn't slow down in the crowded square. Instead, it sped past the square and rushed towards the underground garage. It was going too fast. It nearly plowed through the pedestrians. The driver of the car hit the brakes and skidded in the direction of Damon and the Everbright team. Damon was shocked. He quickly pulled the staff behind him and jumped to the side. 
The staff was terrified and scattered in all directions. The deputy director of the IT department, Jim, was frightened when he saw the car rushing over, but he was slower than the others. At the last minute, he remembered to leap to the side. The car quickly braked, stopping within inches of Jim. Before Jim could say a word, a tall and burly man ran out from the driver's seat and roared, Are you blind? If you want to die, don't drag yourself under my tires. Get out of the way. Jim saw that the car the man was driving was a handsome sedan that was rarely seen on the market. It was estimated to be worth at least a few hundred thousand dollars. He guessed that the man must be rich, famous, or both. He was so shocked that he could not speak for a moment. Horace Forbes, another senior officer at Everbright, couldn't stand it any longer. He took the initiative to step forward and said to the man, You're in the wrong here. You were driving like a madman. Who drives like that? The man scowled. What the hell do you think you're talking about? Don't think that you can intimidate me just because you have a huge group to back you up. I had to swerve to avoid you, and the damage is going to cost a pretty penny, so I suggest that you pay up immediately. After saying that, he stretched out his hand. He had the nerve to ask Jim to pay for it. Just as Horace was about to say something, Damon squeezed his shoulder, indicating that he should step aside and let Damon handle the situation. Damon walked forward. He sized the man up, then squinted his eyes to peer through the dark windows. He noticed the outline of another figure sitting in the back seat. If Damon wasn't wrong, then this aggressive man was merely a driver employed by someone far more important. He smirked. I don't want to argue with you. Go ahead and call your boss over. I think this conversation would be much more productive if I could speak to the owner of the car. The man rolled his eyes and sneered. Who are you? Either do as I say or get lost. Damon growled. The man clenched his fists, preparing for an attack. But before he got a chance to hurl a punch, Damon's hand landed on his face. Ah! The man screamed, clutching his cheek and stumbling backward. He fell on the hood of the car and dented it. The driver was too dizzy to get up, so he rested there for a second, his face stinging. That was the last straw. The back door opened and the person finally stepped out. Everyone's jaw dropped. The person who emerged from the back seat was a woman, an extraordinarily beautiful woman. She wore a tight black and green dress with matching high heels. A large pair of sunglasses rested atop her nose. She was like a ray of light shooting forth from the darkness. She wore a cold, proud expression. The male employees of Everbright tried not to gawk, but they couldn't help themselves. Damon was also stunned, but not because of her beauty. It was because he knew this woman. It was Victoria Cardiff, or Vicky, as many people called her. She was the vice president of Season Capital. Vicky took off her sunglasses, and when she saw Damon's disgusted face, she rolled her eyes. God, why can't I go anywhere without running into you? Damon practically spat at her. Vicky's eyes widened. Damon, what do you mean? You just attacked my driver. Do you think that you're above the law just because you're suddenly rich and powerful? You have an obligation to society, you jerk. Facing Vicky's questioning, Damon took out a cigarette from the pack in his pocket and lit one up. As he smoked, he slowly said, You drove around like a mad dog and almost hit my staff. There's no way that you can blame me for your irresponsible and reckless actions. I don't care, Victoria sniffed. Anyway, I saw that you were the one who attacked my driver. That's assault, and it's your fault. I want you to apologize immediately. What the hell is there to say? Damon scoffed. What can you do to me? Vicky narrowed her eyes. She wasn't used to people defying her wishes. She considered who she was dealing with. He was Robert Brokerton's son, as far as she knew, and Robert's reputation was sinking by the day. Not to mention that the signing ceremony with Everbright was about to begin. This had been the reason why Vicky asked the driver to speed up. If she picked a fight, then it could ruin Season Capital's expansion plan. Finally, she gritted her teeth and said coldly, Okay, Damon, I'll let this slide for now, but don't think that I'm afraid of you. You can be arrogant and do whatever you want to others, but your actions have consequences, and you're nothing but a useless idiot. Trash will never change. Damon smiled. You don't need to care about who I am. It's better to take care of yourself. Really? Vicky smiled disdainfully. Don't be so proud of yourself. Do you remember the bet we made? There's still a year and a half left. I hope you don't forget that when the time comes, you'll be a disgrace. 
You don't have to worry about that. I think you will see how I will crush Season Capital in a year and a half. I hope so. Vicky rolled her beautiful eyes and looked at the sky. She didn't take Damon's words seriously. As the driver slowly lifted himself from the hood of the car, she said to him, Go and park the car. We're running out of time. I'll get to the office on my own. Previously, whenever Bright and Season Capital were talking about cooperation, Horace had been the primary contact, but he'd mostly spoken to administrative assistants and lower-level executives. He'd never come into contact with Vicky. Horace couldn't help but lean over and whisper to Damon, Boss, who is she? Damon smiled indifferently. Oh, you'll find out in due time. The group of people from Everbright made their way toward the building and swarmed the lobby. They boarded the elevator and headed to the 53rd floor. When the elevator doors opened, Damon was surprised to see that they had quite a welcome wagon. Dozens of well-dressed professional employees of Season Capital stood in the foyer to greet them. Seeing Damon and his team appear, the eyes of the senior vice president of the Season Capital, Trey Distler, lit up. He walked to Damon with the entire group of leaders and said in an extremely respectful tone, The employees of the Season Capital welcome the leaders of Everbright. Horace shook hands with Trey and the others. Then, he introduced Damon and Trey to each other. When he heard that Damon was the founder and CEO of Everbright, Trey raised his eyebrows. Hello, Mr. Walker. It is such an honor to finally make your acquaintance. Originally, our vice president came to welcome you personally, but just now, there was an accident downstairs. Our vice president has suffered some minor injuries and is currently undergoing treatment in the office. Season Capital had high hopes for a strong alliance with Everbright. Anyone with good eyesight would be able to see the inestimable competitive strength of Everbright, especially with the release of their new game. Users were already flocking to the platform. If Season Capital and Everbright worked together, as long as they didn't make a huge mistake, they could take the entire gaming market by storm. A conservative estimate would at least double the market value. They were also hoping to expand into mobile apps, and Horace Forbes, one of the higher-ups at Everbright, had personal connections with prominent app developers. Thinking of the potential wealth that could be created, the big shots of Season Capital could not stop smiling. Trey quickly led everyone into the company's huge conference room, followed by a throng of reporters. Because it was such a big merger, journalists clamored to publish the news on their respective outlets. A buffet table was set up in the conference room for the employees and reporters. When the journalists saw Damon, they abandoned their sandwiches and drinks on the table and burst into an uproar. Countless cameras were aimed at Damon. Trey leaned over and murmured, Mr. Walker, wait a moment. I'm calling Season Capital's vice president, Vicky Cardiff, to come in here. Now that the media is here, we can begin the signing ceremony soon. Damon nodded and watched Trey leave. He was already dreading coming face to face with Vicky for a second time that day. He sighed and massaged his temples. Regardless of the animosity between the two of them, Damon would never put that above what was best for the company. If he wanted to become a successful leader, he would have to distinguish between public and private matters. This would be a test of his leadership skills. Although the countless wealthy capitalists were waiting to sign a contract with Everbright, there were not many players who could go out on a limb and sign a contract of this proportion. Season Capital was naturally the best choice. Since that was the case, Damon would do everything in his power to ensure that Everbright's development plan wouldn't be ruined due to personal grudges. Damon sat down in the conference room and welcomed everyone. He was immediately swarmed by reporters who all hoped to interview him. Damon was undoubtedly a rising star. He usually kept a low profile and rarely granted interviews. Now that he'd finally appeared, the reporters naturally didn't want to miss out on this rare opportunity. While the Everbright team was being interviewed by the reporters, Trey went to Vicky's office upstairs and said that the boss of Everbright had arrived and was waiting for her in the conference room. Vicky was nestled in an armchair rubbing her injured feet and forehead. When the driver's car hit the curb, the impact sent Vicky flying forward. Though her injuries weren't serious, she was sprawled out dramatically with an ice pack balanced on her head. When Trey walked in and gave her the news, Vicky shot up from the armchair. The ice pack fell to the floor. She reapplied her lipstick as she followed Trey downstairs, 
peppering him with questions. When did they arrive? How's everything going? How many people are down there? They've only been here for about five minutes, Trey answered, choosing his words carefully. There's about a dozen of them, including their founder and CEO. Oh, and the press, of course. Vicky nodded and a faint smile finally appeared on her cold face. She was looking forward to the cooperation between Season Capital and Everbright. After all, the cooperation between the two companies was mutually beneficial. Vicky had reason to believe that the prospects of cooperation between the two super companies would be limitless. Lost in thought, Vicky couldn't help but think of the founder of Everbright. The outside world had already given this young man countless accolades, and though Vicky wasn't in charge of following Everbright, she'd heard of their leader. It was said that he was only in his 20s, and he was already a world-renowned gaming giant who hadn't benefited from nepotism or family money. It was an earth-shattering feat. Vicky understood why so many members of the press had shown up to attempt to snag an interview with the young prodigy. Even though Vicky was the vice president of Season Capital, which had a higher market value than Everbright's, she already had dollar signs dancing in her eyes when she thought about the impending merger. The beta testing of Everbright's new game had been so popular, they were having to turn users away. It was only a matter of time before Everbright became the world's number one gaming company, and Vicky would be damned if she didn't get a piece of the pie. Vicky rubbed her hands together and looked forward to the cooperation between the two parties even more. When they entered the conference room, the reporters had already finished interviewing Damon and were preparing their cameras and notebooks to document the historic merger. They're here, they're here, one of the reporters shouted. Every face in the conference room turned to look at Trey and Vicky as they walked in. Everyone was stunned when they saw Vicky. They didn't expect such a young and beautiful woman to be the vice president of Season Capital. When they thought about the fact that the founder of the Everbright was also as young as her, they experienced renewed and profound hope in the younger generation. Trey brought Vicky to the table, where mid-level leaders of Season Capital were discussing with the Everbright team. Trey strode to the center of the crowd, and then Horace stepped forward. He shook Trey's hand once again, then looked at Vicky. Vicky didn't make eye contact with Horace. Her gaze jumped over him and landed on Damon. She was puzzled. Why was Damon at this meeting? Vicky hadn't foreseen this strange turn of events. She had always ridiculed the man who had no future. Vicky's eyes only lingered on Damon for a moment. Then she turned to look at Horace and the others. A glimmer of surprise flashed across her face when she realized that these people were part of the very same group with which she'd had a conflict after her driver jumped the curb in the square. She tried to regain her composure and exude an air of professionalism. She looked at Horace and said gently, Hello, are you the founder of Everbright? My name is Victoria Cardiff, but you can call me Vicky. I'm the vice president of Season Capital. I'm so excited for the opportunity to collaborate with Everbright. Vicky tried her best to make it seem like nothing had happened between them earlier. She smiled expectantly. Meanwhile, the Everbright team members exchanged surprised glances. None of them had known that Vicky was such a high-ranking person at Season Capital. They were starting to get nervous. If their CEO had a beef with the vice president of Season Capital, then it could potentially affect all of their contracts. Luckily, Horace was shrewd. He knew that they were dealing with billions of dollars and it all hinged on their cooperation. Horace gathered up all of his courage and said, Hello, Miss Cardiff. I'm so glad that we're finally able to join forces with Season Capital. Please allow me to introduce our CEO, Mr. Damon Walker. In the middle of shaking Horace's hand, Vicky froze. Slowly, she raised her gaze to make eye contact with Damon. She tried not to let her hand shake in Horace's firm grip. Damon looked at Vicky, a serious expression on his face. Director Cardiff, we meet again. I'm so glad that we have the chance to work together. He extended his hand, but Vicky didn't take it. Was this a joke? If so, it wasn't funny at all. She felt like she'd been slapped in the face. Vicky shook her head in disbelief. This was a nightmare. How could she wake up from this? She contorted her face into a wan smile and pinched herself to make sure that she wasn't dreaming. Vicky wasn't stupid. Before signing the contract, she had already obtained some detailed information about Everbright. 
She also knew that Everbright had been established two years ago, which meant that Damon had done everything by himself with no help from his family. Not many people saw Vicky's stiff expression, but Horace was one of the few to notice it. He accurately guessed that Vicky had a conflict with his boss. Vicky's heart was filled with sorrow. She once again thought of the time in Los Angeles, the first time she met Damon. At that time, Vicky had said that she would never marry someone like Damon. She'd never expect that they would later be meeting in a professional capacity. Before, Damon had been incredibly arrogant, and Vicky had written him off as a conceited guy just trying to take over her business. However, Damon had gone behind her back and managed to succeed. Vicky was having a hard time believing it. Shock, anger, and despair washed over Vicky's face. As expected of the vice president of Season Capital, she'd seen the tides rise and fall. She stared at Damon and said indifferently, I understand now, so you're the founder of Everbright. I admit that I was wrong, and you hit it very well. Damon held his breath, waiting to see what Vicky had to say next. Sure enough, Vicky paused for a moment and continued, If I might be so bold, I'd like to advise you to not get complacent. Season Capital has surpassed you in every way. I'm sorry to say that you didn't win our bet. Damon let out a soft <sighs> sigh. He said faintly, Miss Cardiff, that's our grudge, so I suggest that you put it aside. I'm now representing Everbright, and you are representing Season Capital. We have bigger fish to fry than some old water under the bridge. Let's just let bygones be bygones. The reporters around them began to adjust the cameras, preparing to witness the moment when the two large corporations joined forces. Just as Damon finished speaking, he was suddenly interrupted by Vicky's sharp voice. Under the stunned eyes of the reporters and Trey's shocked gaze and in front of all season capital and Everbright employees, Vicky's eyes flashed with anger. Damon, do you think it is fun to toy with me? Will it satisfy your shameless vanity? Let me tell you, Everbright will never surpass season capital. Damon furrowed his brow. What do you want? Do you still want to sign this agreement? There's no need. I think the previous strategic cooperation between season capital and Everbright can be canceled. Thank you. Vicky snorted. Damon's face turned gloomy. Are you sure that you want to go back on your word? Are you even the person who can make that decision? He asked. Vicky sneered and whirled around to address Trey. Tell him who makes the decisions around here. Trey looked at Damon and then looked at Vicky. Finally, he nodded nervously and replied, Miss Cardiff makes the decisions and her word is final. Thank you, Trey, said Vicky. She simpered at Damon. You heard the man. I'm in charge here, and what I say goes. Read my lips. Season Capital has revoked its decision to invest in and merge with Everbright. You can consider our partnership officially over. The crowd went wild. Everyone started talking over each other at once. Vicky crossed her arms and arched an eyebrow, waiting to see how Damon would react. Vicky Cardiff's last-minute refusal to invest in Everbright would undoubtedly become the biggest news in the financial circle. Damon's face was calm, but he was furious. He said in a deep voice, Be careful, Vicky. This is an extremely rash decision. I hope that you won't regret it in the future. Vicky threw back her head and laughed. I've never regretted my actions. Also, I don't think that your company is so powerful. There's a lot of competition among tech startups these days. You might be flying high one week, but your market value could be zero the next. You must first ensure that your company can get through this crisis. Don't break the contract with your debt. Vicky turned to address the reporters. I'm sorry, everyone. Today's outcome may have disappointed you, but it doesn't matter. As a token of appreciation and to express our most sincere apologies, we've prepared some goodie bags for all of you. Originally, those gifts were supposed to be distributed to the reporters after the two companies reached a strategic partnership, but now that the negotiations had gone down the drain, Vicky figured that she might as well distribute them anyway. The reporters were immediately delighted. Many of them were even excited that the investment plan had fallen through. After all, the failure to cooperate and reach a strategic agreement would make for a more interesting story and more eye-catching headlines. Of course, the outside world wouldn't assume that it was because of a personal grudge between the two parties. They would likely think that Season Capital had discovered a flaw in Everbright's business plan, which would shed a bad light on Everbright. 
readers would be trying to determine the cause of the fallout for weeks. This was what Damon was most worried about, but if Vicky didn't want to continue the business relationship between their two companies, there wasn't much that Damon could do about it. He was incensed that Vicky had gone back on her word and seemed to have no intention of helping him. He was also concerned that Everbright's reputation and stock prices would tank as people speculated about what happened. Damon squeezed his eyes shut and contemplated the hypothetical headlines. Loopholes in Everbright. Is Everbright becoming forever dim? Financial fraud hits major gaming startup. He was sure that if Everbright suffered a blow, then it would give potential investors pause. He glared at Vicky. Thanks for nothing, he glowed at her. Then he gestured to his team. Come on, we're leaving. The team followed Damon out of the conference room, their heads hung low. After the Everbright team left, Season Capital began to distribute goodie bags to the reporters. Then, they invited the reporters to the five-star restaurant downstairs for dinner. Vicky and Trey went back upstairs to her office. Trey didn't understand why Vicky had halted the merger. He tried to bite his tongue, but his curiosity got the better of him. Miss Cardiff, I have to ask, why did you do that? Though a hint of regret flashed in her eyes, Vicky tried to keep her tone light. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of explaining the matter to the shareholders and the CEO. Oh, all right then. Since Vicky would personally explain, Trey finally let out a sigh of relief uh. that he wouldn't have to come up with excuses in front of his superiors. Trey, thanks for all your help today, but I'm exhausted. I'm going back to the office to rest. Please go and enjoy a nice meal. Use the company credit card to leave a big tip. Vicky waved her hand and dismissed Trey, then walked into her office, made a cup of coffee, and sank back into the armchair. She stared out the window, watching traffic go by. Her mind was a mess. Nothing about this day had gone as planned. To be honest, Vicky was a little contrite about her impulsiveness just now. She'd gone against the advice of her colleagues and data analysts and killed a project that could have been a major boon for Season Capital. Now, all of their company's efforts had been wasted. The more she thought about it, the more upset she became. She thought back to the expression on Damon's face. He must be laughing at her for the inability to control her emotions. How did he think that Everbright would succeed without a company like Season Capital backing them? Although Damon was the founder of Everbright, he mustn't get carried away by his success. Though the current market value of Everbright hadn't surpassed that of Season Capital, if the share price of Everbright soared, would the share price of Season Capital remain the same? Suddenly, a thought occurred to her. If everyone thought that the contract hadn't been signed due to Everbright's ineptitude, then that could cause stock prices for Season Capital to rise. Trust in their company would increase if people assumed that they had found a flaw in Everbright's business plan. Vicky's lips curled into a grin. The Everbright team was enraged. They never thought that they would be tricked by Season Capital in the end. What a waste of time and energy. The news would spread like wildfire within hours. Season Capital had stabbed them in the back. The negotiations between Everbright and the Season Capital had broken down in less than half an hour. On the internet, technological and financial media outlets were already starting to report on it. The focal point of everyone's attention was the reason. Conspiracy theories began to sprout up. Was there some secret behind this? People claiming to have insider information spread rumors about financial fraud and tax evasion? The comment sections were going wild. Investors who had been enthusiastic about giving money to Everbright were now hesitating. They didn't want to get wrapped up in the controversy. Everbright had no choice but to hold a press conference so that they could personally clarify these baseless rumors. However, it's easy to spread gossip, but it's much more difficult to get rid of it, especially since the anonymity of internet commenters prevented them from finding the sources. Misfortune often comes in pairs, unfortunately. Just as Everbright was trying to put out one fire, another sprang up. It was worse than they could have possibly imagined. Thundercloud Games, one of Everbright's rival game companies, launched a new game called Evil Blaster Plan. As soon as the game was released, it quickly became popular all over the world and kicked Everbright's games down the rankings to reach the top of the global leaderboard. It was sweeping the gaming community with unstoppable momentum. The comments and feedback rolled in online. User Sunbot57 commented, Oh my god, I once thought that Old Century from Everbright was the most fun game, but after playing Evil Blaster Plan, I have to admit that I was wrong. It's the perfect game. Anti-Rain23 typed, 
I heard that Thundercloud Games spent several years producing this game and sank millions into it. They beta tested with thousands of users who all had to sign NDAs, and the final product is so worth it. Epic win. Though Everbright's games received high praise and rave reviews, Evil Blaster Plan was blowing them out of the water. For the team at Everbright, it was an absolute nightmare, made worse when they found out that Evil Blaster Plan was an exact copy of Global Hegemony. It was true. Thundercloud Games had ripped the entire idea from Everbright. Every single blade of grass, every single tree, and every single person in the game was a complete replica. The only change was that everything in the game that contained the elements of Everbright had been changed to fit Thundercloud Games. They didn't even include Everbright in the credits. The global hegemony game, which Everbright had spent a huge amount of money to develop for several years, had been shamelessly plagiarized. What surprised Damon even more was that this game had always been kept top secret at Everbright. They were still applying for their patent, so they'd been extremely careful to not leak any information. However, Thundercloud had fast-tracked the patent application process for Evil Blaster Plan, and now the product was officially theirs, leaving no trace whatsoever of Everbright. Only the internal staff of Everbright, as well as a few players who had participated in the beta testing, knew how similar the two games were. Global Hegemony had consumed almost all the energy of Everbright in the past few years, and they had placed high hopes on it. The source code of the Global Hegemony had also been classified as top secret, only Damon and a few major shareholders knew about it. There had to be a mole. Someone had to have maliciously stolen the source code to duplicate the game. That was it. Everbright had to abandon the project. There was no hope that Global Hegemony would be successful. They would probably even be accused of plagiarizing Evil Blaster Plan. The press would have a field day if that happened. They would learn that Everbright had burned millions of dollars without producing any results. They were already deep in debt but they'd been looking forward to paying back their loans as soon as Global Hegemony was released. Now that would never be a possibility. They would go bankrupt and investors wouldn't trust them. The day after Everbright started appearing in the news, the bank's payment notice was placed on the desks of Everbright executives. They'd have to sell all of their assets. Their stock prices plummeted. This was an unprecedented collapse in the world of gaming startups. Shareholders pulled out in record numbers. Sooner rather than later, their stocks would be worthless. In just 24 hours, Everbright had been pushed to the brink. How could they possibly make a comeback? The banks had lost their confidence in Everbright. No one else wanted to invest a single cent in the failed company. Even the devoted players of the Century series of games deactivated their accounts and flocked in droves to Evil Blaster Plan. Everything went downhill so quickly that Damon was almost convinced that there was someone out there who wanted to take him down or get revenge. All of his dreams were dead. Who was behind all of this? News of Everbright's failure spread like wildfire. The news was so big that even non-gaming related media outlets were covering it. The mainstream media gleefully reported that Everbright was in a debt crisis and that the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Damon's worst fears had been realized. The headlines he dreaded finally came to fruition. He scrolled through the news of his phone and turned on search engine notifications. Each headline was worse than the last. Everbright's light flickers out. Founder of Century Game Series can't compete in the 21st century. Famous game company mired in controversy, left in financial ruin. Damon oh. sighed. He knew that it wasn't healthy to read the news, and even worse to read the comments, but he couldn't help himself Damon knew that his name would be tied to this colossal failure for the rest of his life. After all, the internet was forever. Even if he tried to get some of the articles scrubbed from the search engines, the news would still appear in forums and on social media. If anyone in the world tried to seek out the news, they'd only be a few clicks away. At the DC Academy of Music, Fiona was using her phone to read the news about Damon over and over again. It had been trending on Twitter, and she was appalled by what she read. She looked out the window, her eyes filled with worry. She wondered how Damon was going to make it through. Was he finally going to fall from glory? Fiona decided to call her mother. Karen picked up after the first ring. Fiona lowered her voice. Mom, I want to ask you something. You want to ask me to help Damon, don't you? Karen knew her daughter very well. She already figured out why Fiona was calling. Oh, Fiona replied softly and then said, Mom, 
I want to know if your company would be willing to loan some money to Everbright. You can treat it like you're buying shares. Damon is so talented. I do not doubt in my mind that he'll be able to get back on his feet in no time. What? I can't do that. Everbright is a sinking ship, Karen exclaimed. There was silence on the other end. Karen realized how harsh she sounded, so she tried to soften her tone. Baby, it's not that mom doesn't want to help you. It's just that Everbright is powerless to turn this situation around. It's almost like someone has a personal vendetta against them. If someone in a position of power is trying to shut them down, then no amount of money will help. Isn't there another way? Will all of his efforts have been for nothing? Fiona's tone was filled with despair. No one can help him. He got himself into this mess, and he'll have to get himself out of it. Perhaps he was too arrogant and his ego finally dealt him a heavy blow. However, this setback will help him in the future. Karen sighed. Honey, you're not even dating him anymore. I think you should let this go. It isn't your responsibility. With that, Karen ended the call. Fiona stared off into the distance. She felt like she could sense Damon's despair from afar. Where was he right now? What was he thinking? In Berlin, Veronica was also sitting in front of the window, staring blankly at the computer. Everbright was trending on German Twitter, and people were ripping the company to shreds. Veronica raised her eyebrows when she noticed users discussing the founder of Everbright. They said that he was a fourth-year student at Meyerson University. She blinked rapidly for a moment, then immediately started Googling. She ran across a recent interview with the founder of Everbright. Her jaw dropped. It was him. The boy who sang Time Flies to her. The boy who put his blood, sweat, and tears into every project he was involved in. The boy who had risked his life for the sake of justice. Veronica finally understood why Damon had come to Berlin that year. He said that some things needed to be dealt with. Had he been there to deal with matters related to Everbright? It was all starting to fall into place. Back then, he could accurately predict the market value of Everbright in front of the old professor. Well, of course he did. It was his company, and everything had been within his control. Veronica had always thought that Damon was an extremely powerful person, but she never thought that one day this young man would create a billion-dollar company while he was still going to college. Like Fiona, she wondered how Damon must be feeling. He had been so prosperous. The fall from being a leader in his industry to going bankrupt must be devastating for him. Veronica was convinced that Damon was suffering. She took out her phone and almost dialed his number. But after considering it for a moment, she decided against it. She put her phone away and continued scrolling through Twitter, following every hashtag relevant to Everbright. Naturally, Robert and Nancy Brokerton had also been closely following the news. They just wanted what was best for Damon, and no matter what, they were extremely proud of everything he'd managed to accomplish. However, they couldn't help but feel a little embarrassed. What if Damon's debt crisis reflected poorly on his family? Robert had even called the bank and consulted with the lenders. He knew the exact amount that Damon owed, down to the last penny. It had all gone toward game development, but Everbright had nothing to show for it. Instead, the two previous games had been destroyed once again due to the source code being leaked. Currently, Everbright had nothing left in the company coffer. Otherwise, they wouldn't have requested funds from Season Capital in the first place. Robert didn't have any time to investigate whether Damon had personally offended anyone. Nancy urged him to quickly buy stock in Everbright, but Robert refused. He knew that Damon didn't want the Brokerton Group to have any official involvement with Everbright. Nancy pleaded with him to buy stocks under his name as an angel investor, and after much begging and wheedling, Robert finally agreed. Nancy breathed a sigh of relief. This was her son's hard work, and Nancy would never allow anyone to destroy it. All of a sudden, Everbright had a powerful backer. With Robert's financial resources, it would be a piece of cake for him to save Everbright. Vicky knew that if Everbright obtained the help of the Brokerton Group or Robert in this predicament, it meant that Damon couldn't defeat her and had no choice but to fall back on his family's money. It would be a massive source of shame for Damon. Even if Damon relied on his ability and was somehow able to counterattack, Vicky had enough reasons to not marry Damon. It would give her the upper hand in their battle. She wondered if he'd lose his career entirely and become penniless and destitute. She didn't want her name to be associated with someone like that. When Robert called Damon and said that he could lend his money to Damon to get through this crisis, Damon refused. 
Damon didn't want Robert's money. He was determined to find a solution on his terms. After all, he wasn't just the boss of Everbright. He still had Astromar, which was a huge platform in its own right. Selena was quite concerned about her brother's well-being. She gave him a call and invited him to go to dinner. If it had been anyone else, Damon would have declined. But since it was Selena, he reluctantly agreed. Brother, I heard that Everbright is in a financial crisis. Dad and Mom are very worried about you. I want to return the key to the villa so that you can sell the house and pay off your debts. Selena had been using the villa to escape from her dorm ever since Damon had first given her the key. She loved the house more than anywhere she'd ever lived. That kind of extravagance wasn't something that Selena had ever dreamed she'd experience. In the lap of luxury, she noticed the envious looks of passers-by. Even her roommates were jealous. When she spent time at the villa, she finally felt like she was the person she was always meant to be. However, Selena had a good head on her shoulders, and she loved her brother more than anything. She was grateful for everything that Damon had done for her, but it was time to make a difficult choice. A gorgeous house by the river was nothing compared to her brother's career. She would sacrifice everything she had if it meant that she could help him out. Anyway, she adored the villa, but in the end, it was just a house. Her brother was a real human being who needed her help. She knew that selling the villa wouldn't erase all of his debts. It might just be a drop in the bucket, though it was worth millions. Selena still figured that it was better than nothing, and that Damon should seriously consider selling his assets to finance his future and not go personally bankrupt. However, Damon returned Selena's key to her. He gave her a sad smile. Sis, please don't worry about me. I haven't hit rock bottom yet, and I'm not planning on doing so anytime soon. Selena was a little anxious. But the media said that the bank is pressing you to pay your debts urgently. Your company needs to sell assets to repay your debts. I heard that you don't even have enough money to cover salaries for your employees. She sighed and took his hand in hers. I love that villa, but compared to what you're going through, it's worthless to me. In the future, you can buy more houses, but you're on the verge of losing everything. It'll be incredibly difficult for you to crawl out of this. A single tear rolled down her face. Damon was touched by Selena's deep concern. He squeezed her hand and said softly, Sis, don't be silly. I don't want you to worry about me. Do you think your big brother can be knocked down so easily? You know that I won't go down without a fight. Let me tell you, I still have a trick or two up my sleeve. Even if Everbright goes bankrupt, I will remain calm. If Everbright went bankrupt, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. It would be easier to find out who was behind all this. Selena naturally didn't know what Damon's next move would be, but she was comforted by the certainty in his voice. Of course, he had a backup plan. They changed the subject and finished their meal. That night, Damon received a call from Mr. and Mrs. Walker. Both of them anxiously asked Damon about Everbright. They didn't understand the rules of capital, but they knew that something terrible had happened. They were up to their eyeballs in debt themselves, and they were terrified that Damon might have to go to jail if he ended up getting in trouble with the IRS. If that was the case, his entire life would be ruined beyond repair. They didn't understand how everything had been ruined so quickly. Though the Walkers lived in relative poverty, they were proud of their children and only wanted them to be safe and happy. When he heard their terrified and helpless voices on the other end of the phone, Damon's heart softened. He never wanted to make them feel like that. He tried his best to reassure them that everything would be okay. His phone had been blowing up with calls and notifications all day. Later that evening, Damon received another phone call. This time, it was from Avery. Hey, how are you feeling? She asked. Have you eaten anything? Please take care of yourself. I know that your senior year is difficult. Avery didn't seem to know that there was a problem with Damon's company. Avery had been busy recording songs, filming, preparing for concerts, and so on. She didn't have much time to pay attention to areas that were not related to her or to scroll on Twitter to follow trending hashtags. It made total sense to Damon that she hadn't heard about the debacle, and he was extremely relieved to talk about other things. After chatting for a while, Avery made a polite exit. Damon sat by himself in his dorm room. His phone was quiet. Finally, he was all alone. After Avery hung up the call, Damon felt slightly disappointed. After all, Everbright was in a critical moment of life and death. As a girlfriend, Avery's encouragement to Damon was undoubtedly more powerful than anyone else's. Damon <sighs> sighed. He also understood that Avery's career kept her extremely busy. 
and she didn't have time to constantly monitor the news. He tried his best to be understanding. Suddenly, he heard footsteps outside. He cocked his head to the side and listened as footsteps got closer. After a moment, a series of light knocks sounded at the door. Damon was very puzzled. Who would be visiting him at this hour? Ever since he entered his fourth year, all the students in the dormitory had been busy with their matters. Most of his peers were either away for study abroad or internships, or else they kept themselves studying and playing games in their rooms. When Damon opened the door, a beautiful woman stood before him. Her long hair was parted down the middle and her big blue eyes looked up at him expectantly. Hey there, handsome. Did you miss me? Damon's jaw dropped. How had Avery carved time out of her busy schedule to surprise him with a visit? Damon's heart raced. Am I dreaming? He mumbled, a grin spreading slowly across his face. Avery giggled, pleased that her surprise had gone off without a hitch. Silly boy, aren't you going to invite me in? She rolled her eyes flirtatiously. Damon blinked for a moment, then came back to reality. He reached out, grabbed her by the waist, and pulled her inside, closing the door behind them. Avery snuggled into Damon's warm embrace and let out a long, satisfied <sighs> sigh. They stood there for a few seconds, swaying back and forth, arms wrapped tightly around one another, drinking each other in. After a beat, Avery opened her eyes and looked around the dorm. It was the first time she'd ever been there, and she wasn't sure what to expect. The dorm was fairly minimalistic, but Avery had to admit that it was clean and tidy. Avery arched an eyebrow. Where are your roommates? She asked. They went to pursue their dreams. They're all off studying abroad and doing internships, Damon replied. He poured her a glass of water and handed it to her. Didn't you tell me that you've been busy filming recently and that you're deep in preparations for your next concert? How did you find time to visit me? Why didn't you tell me about it in advance? Whoa, easy there, tiger, Avery laughed. Can't a woman surprise her boyfriend now and then? She nudged him playfully. No matter how busy I am with my career, I'll always make time for you. You know that, right? Especially, well, especially if you're going through something. Damon was shocked. Had Avery caught wind of the troubles he'd been having with Everbright? His heart swelled with adoration for her. Can you tell me what happened? Avery looked at Damon with hopeful eyes and reached out to squeeze his hand. I promise that I won't judge you. We share our joys and sorrows, success and failures, right? Damon shook his head and said, Don't worry, it's not a big deal. Trust me, I can solve it. As he spoke, he gently stroked Avery's soft hair. He inhaled the familiar scent of her chamomile rose shampoo. He couldn't help but lower his head and softly kiss Avery's tender lips. Avery pulled away, blushing ever so slightly. She reached up and wrapped her arms around Damon's neck, then pressed her mouth against his once again. Time slowed down as the two of them embraced. Avery's miraculous appearance in front of them today had made Damon wild with joy. He was so excited and touched that he couldn't put it into words. He was already dreading the moment that she would have to leave. He hadn't realized how much he had missed her until he saw her in person. It was autumn, but the weather was still fairly warm. Avery had arrived wearing a paisley patterned sundress and a thin denim jacket. She wore minimal makeup, only using a touch of blush, a coat of mascara, and a dab of tinted lip gloss. Damon thought she'd never looked more gorgeous. He pulled her even closer. Avery let out a moan as if she could not bear Damon's willfulness. Her knees went weak. She finally opened her eyes. How about I come back tonight and we can pick up where we left off? She breathed. Damon was overjoyed. Really? Oh, now I really must be dreaming. Pinch me. Though he'd only been speaking rhetorically. Avery tightly pinched his arm. Ow, what was that for? Damon whined. What do you think? You have a dirty mind. Avery replied, but her expression betrayed her. She looked just as excited as he did. Avery pulled back and gave Damon a look. Damon, in all seriousness, I want to talk to you about something. Don't lie to me, okay? What happened with Everbright is all over the news. I read that the company owes millions to the banks and the investors. Tell me, are you at risk of bankruptcy? It was precise because she knew that Damon was in big trouble, that Avery had put her work aside and rushed to check on him. She wanted to tell him face to face that she was there for him, and wouldn't abandon him in his time of need. Damon felt the love radiating off of her. He kissed Avery's lips again and said gently, don't be afraid. Everbright can still pay that debt. We're going to be just fine. Avery furrowed her brow. She still wasn't convinced. She bent down and reached into her purse. 
After fumbling around for a moment, she took out a bank card and handed it to Damon. Please take this, she said. This is the money I earned from movies, concerts, and events in the past two years. It should have a balance of a few million. Can you take it for emergencies? Although the money wasn't even a drop in the bucket compared to what Everbright owed, it was all Avery's savings. It was her way of letting Damon know that even if he went bankrupt, Avery would still be with him. Looking at the bank card in Avery's hand, Damon was touched by her generosity. He knew that Avery thought he was lying to her, so he pushed her hand back and shook his head. Keep your money. Trust me, there will be another way. Avery felt helpless when she saw Damon insist on not taking it. She thought maybe he was proud and cared too much about saving face. She opened her mouth to say as much. But Damon held up his hand and spoke before she got a chance. Hey, since you're here, how about we go out somewhere? I'm sure you're hungry. Let's go find something good to eat. Go out to eat? Avery blinked her beautiful big eyes. But it's so late. Are you sure the restaurants will still be open? Looking at Avery's blank face, Damon said somewhat anxiously, Didn't you just say that we... I mean, you said that you wanted to hang out tonight, right? Oh! Avery finally understood what Damon was thinking. Her face flushed a deep shade of crimson. Avery could not help but roll her eyes at Damon. Damon's face fell. He'd been looking forward to a romantic night with Avery, but now it seemed like she didn't want to follow through. He tried to keep the disappointment from his expression, but the truth was, he missed her so much, and it had been torture being far away for so long and not getting to touch her and hold her close. Avery was smart. She could tell what Damon was thinking. She blushed and wrapped her arms around him. She bit Damon's ear and said softly, Silly, of course we're going to hang out tonight. That's why I'm here, remember? But I don't think we need to go anywhere. There's no one else here in the dorm. Why don't we just stay in? Damon's heart beat faster. Did she mean what he thought she meant? They'd slept together before, but it had been a long time. Nevertheless, the last time it had happened, it had been beautiful and intimate. Avery remembered it fondly. Avery liked how comfortable Damon made her feel, but she still sometimes grew a bit bashful when it came to matters of the heart or matters of the bedroom. She took another look around the dorm to assess the environment. Avery was a bit of a germaphobe, but things mostly looked to be in order. However, she still noticed a thin layer of dust on the kitchen counter and various articles of clothing strewn about the room. She quietly helped Damon tidy up until she was satisfied, and then she spritzed her perfume around the room to give it a fresher scent. She smiled. The room looked brand new. The scent of the perfume was intoxicating to Damon. It made his entire dorm smell like Avery. It was floral, but it had a slight musk to it. Every time he breathed in, he imagined that he was smelling Avery's soft neck. When she was finally done cleaning, Avery let out a sigh of relief. She looked at Damon and said, I think I'm going to take a bath. Because the wall around the bathtub was semi-transparent, one could see the figure of the person bathing inside from the outside. Damon watched as Avery's silhouette stripped out of her clothes. As he listened to the splashing sound of water, Damon's mind was in turmoil. Should he go in and join her? She'd left the idea a tad ambiguous. He wanted nothing more than to slip into the bathtub beside her, but he was worried that he would startle her. He bit his lip. Finally, he couldn't resist the urge. He'd made his decision. The bathroom door was ajar. He leaned against it and pushed it open. Damon took off his clothes and rushed into the bathroom where Avery was taking a bath. She was startled at first and gathered some foam and bubbles to cover herself up. But as soon as Damon slipped in beside her, she relaxed. There wasn't much space in the bathtub, so their bodies quickly became intertwined. After a little while, the bathroom door opened and Damon carried Avery to the bed. Avery's lips were curled into a grin and her face was flushed. She snuggled into Damon's chest, her arms wrapped around his neck. At first, Avery had been annoyed that Damon had barged in while she was taking a bath, but her annoyance quickly turned to a bashful excitement. She reached up and playfully punched Damon's bicep. It's all your fault, she pouted. You took advantage of me. Is that so? Damon glanced at her out of the corner of his eye to gauge whether or not she was joking. After a beat, a sly smile appeared on his face. Something tells me I wasn't the only one taking advantage of an opportunity. Avery blushed even more after Damon's words because she knew that he was right. Avery had been an active and willing participant in everything that had just gone down in the bathtub. Damon hadn't asked to come in, but when he did, Avery couldn't believe that she hadn't invited him in the first place. 
Their bodies had missed each other as much as their hearts had. She tightly wrapped her arms and legs around Damon, not letting go. Damon gently set Avery on the bed and then joined her under the covers. Night had fallen and it was getting chilly. They moved closer to one another to stay warm. Damon softly stroked Avery's clean, smooth skin. Avery instantly let out a moan and trembled ever so slightly. She didn't slap Damon's hand away. Instead, she held Damon's neck with both hands as if she was encouraging him. Damon, if something really bad happens to you, are you going to let me take care of you? Avery asked, breathing into his ear. Damon shuddered with pleasure, but responded. Don't worry about it, Dave. I can handle my matters. You just worry about your career, okay? Avery didn't believe that Damon could pull himself out of something so serious. She knew that Damon was intelligent and capable, but this was the biggest problem he'd ever faced. He couldn't just charm his way out of millions upon millions of dollars in debt. Furthermore, Everbright was the hottest topic in the news, and none of the press painted the company in a good light. Investors were backing off and banks were sending their final notices. To survive a crisis of this magnitude, Damon would have to be some sort of superhero. There was a high probability that they would have to sell the company's assets to pay off their debt, or they'd be absorbed by one of their rival companies. Regardless, Avery would choose to stay with him. He was handsome, intelligent, talented, courageous, and stubborn. That kind of man might only come around once in a lifetime, and Avery didn't want to let him wiggle out of her grasp. Since Damon was so sure of himself, Avery figured that the conversation had run its course and there was nothing else to say about the subject. She decided that she wanted to drink. She asked Damon if he had any wine, but he shook his head apologetically and offered her a beer instead. Avery shrugged and took the beer out to the balcony, grabbing her coat to protect her from the chill. She stared at the buildings in the distance as she sipped her beer. Avery's alcohol tolerance was not good to begin with, and after she finished her first beer and moved on to the next, her eyes were a little hazy. She lightly leaned on Damon and said, I think we should get married after we graduate. What do you think? Damon raised his eyebrows. He was still in a euphoric state from their tryst in the bathtub and from Avery's surprise visit. Without hesitating, Damon nodded. He couldn't think of any reason to reject her. He could easily let go of any residual feelings he felt for other women. From here on out, Avery would be the only one for him as long as they both should live. Okay, Damon agreed. Really? Oh my God, Avery squealed. She flung her arms around his neck and inhaled his scent. You're making me the luckiest girl in the world. You know that, right? Damon chuckled. I should be the one thanking you, babe. Avery looked up at him. So, future hubby, she said flirtatiously. What's the craziest thing you've done in college? Damon looked at her, a confused expression on his face. Why do you ask? Avery winked, surprising herself with her boldness. She lowered her voice to make it sound more sultry. I've never really done anything crazy, she whispered. But today, I want to live a little bit on the wild side. I'm your blushing bride, after all. How about we repeat what we just did in the bathroom? But this time, we do it right here on the balcony. Her face flushed a deep shade of crimson. Neither of them could tell whether it was from the alcohol or the sensual suggestions she was making. But since Damon liked to live his life with no regrets, he immediately took her up on the offer. Across town, on the 53rd floor of a skyscraper, an extremely beautiful woman stood in the office of her multinational corporation, feeling like she was floating high in the clouds. Through the floor to ceiling windows, she could see that there was a sea of people under her feet. It was a busy scene. In her eyes, all living beings were ants, and the capital and authority she possessed were enough for her to toy with this world in the palm of her hand. Boss, are you sure you want to torture the Everbright Company to death? Her assistant asked with trepidation. We have already made our move. Do you think there is still room for negotiation? The beautiful woman spoke slowly. Her eyes flashed with a fierce light. But the assistant hesitated for a moment. Everbright Company is our partner. It was supposed to be a mutually beneficial relationship. There is no need to be like this. Do you think I'm cruel and merciless? This is a business after all. The beautiful woman snapped her fingers and the assistant quickly served her a cup of coffee. The woman took a sip of the coffee, then she said leisurely, Everbright Company has a chicken with golden eggs. Although we work with them, in the end, the golden egg is still in their hands. We only get a small portion of it. Why don't we divide it more? Hold the chicken that laid the golden egg tightly in our hands. 
So, are you saying that we should cooperate with Thundercloud Games? The assistant asked. Yes, the beautiful woman replied. The game Evil Blaster Plan is currently popular all over the world, and we now have 80% of the shares. This will bring immeasurable benefits to our company. If we take on Everbright and absorb their global hegemony game, we could be looking at profits in the hundreds of millions. We've never had a game with such a powerful money-making ability. When the assistant heard the astronomical figures, she was amazed. The designer of Everbright Company must be a genius. Unfortunately, in front of corporations much bigger than he was, he'd be crushed if he didn't play his cards right. The beautiful woman continued, If this game was still in the Everbright Company, I would not be willing to accept it. We only had a 20% share with them. Four times the difference is enough for me to take the risk. To support her luxurious life, the more capital the better. For example, the coffee she was drinking right now was a rare Guatemalan bean with a price tag of $40 per pound, and it was a fact of daily life for the woman. To continue her lifestyle, she needed a large amount of wealth, and she was convinced that this was the way to go about obtaining it. Defeating Damon and making him eat crow would be just the cherry on top of the cake. The woman could admit that Damon possessed talent, but she felt that it was better to destroy him on the spot rather than to let him slowly grow stronger than she was. She wanted to throw him so far into the abyss that he'd beg her to take him back. Once the Everbright Company was destroyed and under the circumstances that no one was willing to buy them out, the beautiful woman planned to buy the Everbright Company at the last moment at a price not to exceed one billion dollars. In any case, it was just enough to pay off the Everbright Company's debt and still have some surplus. At that time, the Everbright Company would be in the woman's pocket, just like she'd always wanted. This meant that not only would she get the Everbright Company, but she'd also receive Everbright's entire team. She'd finally have the golden egg, and the source codes to go along with it. The assistant kept quiet out of fear. She knew that her boss had always been a hero among women, displaying great ambition and unmatched business prowess. However, she also knew that the beautiful woman had some feelings for Damon, and that if she were scorned, she'd be ruthless enough to kill him. The morning sun shone on Damon's body. Damon felt an itch, so he opened his eyes. He saw Avery playfully tickling his nose. Avery quickly closed her eyes and pretended to be asleep, but Damon suddenly reached out and grabbed her hand. Avery didn't move. Damon lifted the blanket, revealing her flushed and naked form. Recalling what had happened on the balcony the night before, Damon's heartbeat accelerated. He never thought that there would be a day when Avery would show such a wild side. Avery was usually as dignified as a princess, but when she was deep in love, she was like an entirely different person, throwing herself at him with wild abandon. When he saw Avery sleeping sweetly in his arms at the end of the night, an indescribable sense of satisfaction spread through Damon. He couldn't believe that he had wanted her for so long, and now here she was, both in his bed and in his heart. He glanced at Avery, exposed to the morning sun, and he couldn't help but pounce on her. Avery wrapped her arms and legs around Damon. Her eyes slowly opened as the two of them shared a more passionate morning than they ever had before. Avery and Damon cuddled in bed, wrapped around each other so tightly that they could hardly tell where her body ended and his began. Avery emitted a satisfied sigh. Damon knew just how to handle her. Seeing Avery's shy and sweet expression, Damon also felt a sense of accomplishment. So did you like what we did? He couldn't help but tease her. Silly. Avery pinched Damon's arm. Damon arched an eyebrow. Come on, babe, answer the question. Avery bit her lip, then smiled bashfully. Yeah, of course I liked it. I had a lot of fun with you last night. Twice. And this morning. Twice. She giggled and hid her face behind her hands, peering at Damon through her spread fingers. She reached over to pinch him again, but before she got the chance, Damon leaned down and met her mouth with a deep, passionate kiss. She melted into his arms. As the saying went, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Avery and Damon spent as much time together as they could, but time passed quickly, and after a couple of days, it was time for Avery to bid farewell to Damon and return to the pressing demands of her career. Though Avery protested, hoping to spend more time with Damon, he insisted that she not put her entire life on hold for him. After all, she was behind her performance schedule, and her agents were getting desperate for her to return. Avery reluctantly agreed, and the two parted ways, 
clinging to each other until the last possible second. Everbright's debt crisis had entered deep waters. No one was optimistic about the future of the company. The press continued to excoriate them as their stock prices plummeted. As a business, they were worthless. Everbright decided to cut their losses and accept that they were finished. They prepared to sell their assets and lay off the team. However, at the very last possible second, another company decided to swoop in and offer to buy them out. It was incredibly abrupt. Everbright's performance had declined and their new products died prematurely. No one thought any other company would be willing to take a chance on a bunch of junk shares. But now they had received an offer, and it was for almost $2 billion. The news rocked the gaming world. Who in their right mind would take a risk on Everbright at a time like this? And for such a large sum of money? Even Season Capital had capped their contribution at $1 billion. For a short while, the name of the company was kept secret. Unfortunately, in this day and age, nothing can be secret for long. The internet can find out anything about anything. This is its ultimate strength and most terrifying power. The company's name was Astromar. Astromar was more than 10 times larger than the Everbright company. With the expansion of the Astromar network's business, development was swift and fierce. Their daily users numbered in the hundreds of millions and showed no sign of slowing down. However, Astromar was still more popular overseas, with users spread out all over Asia and Europe. They had yet to fully crack the market in the United States. That is, until they decided to purchase Everbright. The Everbright company had been saved from the abyss, and Astromar was on the path to total world domination. When the news broke, internet sleuths immediately caused Astromar and Everbright to trend on all social media platforms. The amount of Google searches went up tenfold. This kind of press was unprecedented for those two companies. They would be pulling in millions just from ad revenue alone. Many people were curious about both the structure and the founder of the company. Though Everbright had once been successful, they'd fallen fast and far from grace. On the other hand, Astromar kept a low profile, but they were so much bigger and more potent than Everbright, and they hadn't even gone public yet. However, Astromar was still shrouded in secrecy. The information regarding the founders and leaders of the company remained confidential, which made the general public even more intrigued as to who was behind the international multi-billion dollar company. After the meeting was held and the board of directors signed off on it, Astromar completed their acquisition of Everbright, merging the two companies forevermore. On the 53rd floor of the skyscraper, the beautiful woman sipped her coffee and listened attentively to her assistant's detailed report regarding both Everbright and Astromar. These days, to create negative news about the Everbright company, the beautiful woman had spent a lot of money. And the results were remarkable. It was because of the negative news that investors were running away from Everbright faster than anyone could count. The beautiful woman successfully made everyone think that the management of the Everbright company had run out of talent. New Century and Old Century, games that had once been popular all over the world, were declining in popularity at a rapid pace. The beautiful woman couldn't be more pleased. The other game that burned hundreds of millions of dollars also confirmed this point. The game that had been developed throughout and had now disappeared without a trace. Rumors were spread that the founder and CEO of Everbright was quite young and naive. He'd fallen back into his success without putting in the work, and all of the money he'd borrowed from the bank wasn't used to develop games, but to go out on the town, racking up bills at expensive restaurants and clubs to attract women. Now that everyone assumed that Damon had partied the money away and been careless with the source codes, their profitability would continue to decline. And it was all because of rumors that the beautiful woman planted herself. The beautiful woman knew better than anyone else that the Everbright Company team was very talented. The previous two games, New Century and Old Century, had become a real virtual world. Global Hegemony, which was later stolen and turned into the evil blaster plan game, had surpassed everyone's expectations. What the beautiful woman wanted to do was to use all her strength to utterly destroy Everbright. She would take over Everbright and take complete control of the team. She'd force them to create a new sensational world-building game, then the parent company would be able to pocket the profit. It was the perfect plan. However, never in her wildest dreams did she think that Astromar would snatch up Everbright from right under her nose. The beautiful woman was furious. When it came to the powerful Astromar network, her company was useless. 
Astromar was incredibly strong and was only getting stronger. Even if the beautiful woman's parent company went head to head with Astromar, it was impossible to determine who would emerge victorious. Since she couldn't get what he wanted, then she would destroy it. Vicky Cardiff had also paid attention to the news that the Everbright company had been purchased by the Astromar network. She didn't know much about the inside story, so it was hard to tell who had gained the upper hand in the deal, but Vicky was excited to hear the news. She still remembered the first time she met Damon. It was at a party. Everything that Damon did make Vicky dislikes him. Vicky was a woman who had received the highest education. She had big dreams of traveling the world and having deep conversations and intense love with someone who could protect her from harm's way. She thought that Damon was rather frivolous. Vicky could not help but think of the masked man who saved her when she was in danger on the plane. She worried that she'd never see him again. Damon was nothing like that mysterious savior. He wasn't even remotely like a man she could be attracted to. He'd never heard of the finer things in life, the art auctions, the yacht parties, the wines. He couldn't keep up with their conversations about luxury cars or horse racing. He couldn't even dance. Vicky really couldn't imagine how boring and desperate life would be if she lived with such a person. Yes, he would inherit billions of dollars in the future. However, he had been living among the common people since he was young, and his views and values were completely different from hers. Fortunately, Everbright had gone bankrupt and was being bought out. Vicky didn't have to see Damon again, so the problem had been resolved. Thinking about it, when she ran into Damon at the season capital meeting and found out that he was the founder of Everbright, Vicky's heart was in turmoil. She never thought that this young man would start from scratch and establish such a successful company. Vicky admitted that she was afraid. What would happen if Damon's market value surpassed season capitals? She'd be ruined. That was the real reason she destroyed the contract. Her efforts were not in vain. Now the dust had settled. The Everbright company had been bought out by the Astromar network and Damon's business had completely failed. He no longer could fight back. When she thought of this, Vicky's lips curled into a sly grin. She began wondering about Astromar. As a multinational giant in the tech world that had risen in recent years, even Vicky couldn't help but marvel at the size of this company. She furrowed her brow. Come to think of it, she didn't know the founder's name. Who could it possibly be? Astromar's acquisition of Everbright was huge news. When Selena caught wind of it, she immediately called her brother and invited him to lunch. As they ate, Selena watched Damon closely. Selena had been concerned about whether or not he was taking care of himself, so she was trying to see if he looked healthy and if he still had a voracious appetite. She quickly realized that in terms of Damon's appetite, she had nothing to worry about. His mental state also seemed to be stable. Selena was surprised as she watched him devour his burger and fries, chattering excitedly about this and that. When Damon was in the middle of a story about one of the guys in his dorm, Selena put up her hand and interrupted him. Hey bro, what are you talking about? I'm glad to see that you're having a good day, but your company has been bought out. Aren't you even a little bit sad about that? Damon chuckled. Everbright had been purchased by Astromar, which was also owned by Damon, though most people didn't know that little detail. It was like he'd just switched his wallet from his left pocket to his right. Of course, he was disappointed by Everbright's fate. The leakage of the source code had been disappointing and the plagiarism left him enraged. All of his team's hard work had been stolen. However, the original energy was still there. The shareholders had been spooked by the high interest rates and the low return, but Damon still had full confidence that he and his team could deliver a solid product. Furthermore, Damon guessed that there was definitely someone who planned to purchase Everbright's shares at the lowest price, and he didn't want someone to swoop in and steal it right out from under his nose, so he decided to make the first move. He purchased his own company at a competitively low price, increasing his own market value tenfold. Astromar was a powerful company, so it was only a matter of time before Everbright recovered its vitality. There was no doubt in Damon's mind that Everbright would return to its peak performance, and Damon had even turned a profit. Although Selena was suspicious, she was pleased that her brother seemed to be doing okay and wasn't spiraling into depression over what had happened with his company. She finished her lunch and didn't interrogate him further, choosing to believe that if he had faith in himself, then she could too. After eating, 
The two siblings strolled around campus arm in arm. Selena had finished her adjustment period and had now settled into university life. Not only did she have a good relationship with the girls in her dormitory, but she also participated in many school clubs and was making excellent grades. Damon was happy that his sister was thriving at Meyerson, but it felt bittersweet to him. She was only a freshman with her whole college career ahead of her, and Damon's own time at college was drawing to a close faster than he ever thought possible. After returning to his dormitory, Damon looked at the empty bed and felt a little bored. He thought about what to do. Then a thought occurred to him. He hadn't logged onto the game in a while. Could Cloudbusting 24 still be waiting for him? Damon remembered how much he'd enjoyed the feeling of being with Cloudbusting 24, although he didn't know what she looked like in real life. He really liked her avatar and he thought that her messages sounded clever. Although Damon had a girlfriend, he still hoped to maintain some sort of a relationship with Cloudbusting 24. When he finally logged into the game, Damon found that not much had changed, even though Everbright had been purchased by Astromar. The only major difference was that in order to entice users to return to the Century series, Astromar had given out gifts and held promotional events for players all over the world. The moment he logged in, a system notification popped up. Your wife, Cloudbusting24, is located in the fairy forest. He didn't expect Cloudbusting24 to still be here. Joy surged in Damon's heart. Before Damon could say anything, Cloudbusting24 had already sent a message. No way are you actually logged on right now. Well, it's good to see you too, Damon replied. Wait for me, I'm coming to find you, typed Cloudbusting24. Within seconds, her character teleported and appeared beside Damon. Damon was surprised to see that she was still using the same equipment as she was using a few months ago the last time they met. Have you been playing the game? He asked her, puzzled. Not really, she typed back. I've mostly just been hanging out in the forest. Honestly, I wanted to see if you would turn up. She sent a crying face emoticon. Unfortunately, you haven't been here for a long time. I, I thought you had forgotten about me. How could I have forgotten? For some reason, Damon felt a little heartache. He hoped that he wasn't becoming obsessed with his online girlfriend. It's good that you won't forget. Cloudbusting24 came to Damon's side. Her avatar planted a kiss on his cheek, then said with a shy smile, I was so afraid that you had suddenly stopped playing this game. What have you been up to recently? Damon's heart fluttered. Could his game girlfriend actually have real feelings for him? How? She didn't even know anything about him. Not much, Damon typed. My girlfriend came to visit me, so I spent some time with her. Oh, is it Avery? Cloudbusting24 swiftly replied. No wonder. I guess that only a girl as pretty as Avery would make you forget about coming back to the game, right? Although he could not see the expression on the other side of the screen, Damon could feel a sour jealousy in Cloudbusting24's tone. I mean, she's my girlfriend, and she came to surprise me. I had to hang out with her while she was in town, Damon explained. Sure, I totally get that, Cloudbusting24 responded. She's super cute and talented. I'd feel the same way if I were you. How was your time with her? What did the two of you do? Damon hesitated. They had barely left Damon's dorm the whole time that Avery had been in town. In fact, they'd barely gotten out of bed. Naturally, he didn't want to share that information with Cloudbusting24. When Damon hadn't replied after a few minutes, Cloudbusting24 guessed the reason why. So, I'm guessing the two of you had fun, she typed. There was still no response from Damon. A veritable tidal wave of jealousy surged in Cloudbusting24's heart. She didn't dare to show it when she was facing Damon face to face, but in the game, they were husband and wife. Cloudbusting24 pouted and sent an angry face emoticon. I knew it would be like this. Damon, have you ever considered my feelings? She felt like such a fool for logging into the game day in and day out, just hoping and praying that Damon's avatar would pop up on the screen. Tears began forming behind her eyes. Damon was stunned by Cloudbusting24's sudden anger. He guessed that Cloudbusting24 might be jealous, but he hadn't realized to what extent. He frowned. He had nothing to feel guilty about. After all, Avery was his girlfriend in real life. His relationship with Cloudbusting24 only existed in the context of the game. It was fake. Damon felt like this was the time to make that fact extremely clear to his virtual wife. He couldn't help but say, look, we're just a virtual couple. We should not bring real feelings into the game. Anyway, I have to tell you something. Avery and I plan to get married after we graduate. 
What? Cloudbusting24 exclaimed. It's true, Damon replied. Cloudbusting24 was silent for a long time, trying to digest the shocking news. After about 10 minutes, the three message bubbles appeared above her avatar, indicating that she was typing. After you get married, are you still going to play this game? Will you still chat and interact with me? Damon replied, I don't think so. Now that he was chatting on the internet with Cloudbusting24 behind Avery's back, Damon felt guilty. If he were to flirt with others on the internet after marrying Avery, it would be no different from cheating on her. He planned on being faithful to Avery to the best of his ability. Okay, typed Cloudbusting24. If you marry Avery, I won't expect you to log in. In fact, I'll quit the game. I'll never bother you again. I wish you and Avery all the happiness in the world. Damon didn't know what to say. He really enjoyed Cloudbusting24, but he also knew that he and Cloudbusting24 were playing with fire. It was the right choice to cut off contact. They decided to just play the game together. They fought off monsters and leveled up, but their hearts weren't in it. Cloudbusting24 didn't send any messages. She was more aloof and unapproachable than ever. Damon sighed. He could see that their relationship had changed. He might as well just delete his account as soon as they finished leveling up. It wasn't worth it anymore. In this way, it would be the last time he would be with Cloudbusting24. So even though she was mad at him, Damon tried to cherish their time together. He admired her fighting skills and appreciated her intellectual prowess when solving riddles and finding coins. He could admit that she was an excellent player. In fact, she was protecting him from the monster rather than the other way around. Two hours passed. Damon was getting tired, so he typed a message to Cloudbusting24. Hey, this has been great, but I think it's time for bed. I'm going to log off. When are you coming to play next time? Although she had neglected Damon the whole time, Cloudbusting24 was still reluctant to part with him. I'm not sure about that. Damon had told her that he'd delete his account, but he'd given her the impression that it wouldn't be until after he married Avery. He didn't think it was very nice to tell her that he'd be deleting his account that very evening. To her credit, Cloudbusting24 was an incredibly smart person. She immediately replied, Oh, if my guess is right, do you plan to delete your game character as soon as we're finished tonight? Damon's jaw dropped. If Cloudbusting24 was able to read his mind like that, what kind of outstanding person must she be in real life? I get it, Cloudbusting24 typed. I know that you don't want to let Avery down. Damon massaged his temples. It's true, I don't. I just don't know if this is healthy anymore. So I guess this is goodbye. He moved the cursor to the settings, about to click the button and log out. But suddenly, one more message popped up from Cloudbusting24. She'd only typed one word. Wait. When Cloudbusting24 told Damon to wait, he delayed logging out of the game. What's wrong? Damon typed. If you delete your account, then how will I get in touch with you? She asked. I want to contact you in the future. You don't have my contact details? Damon was surprised. He didn't know who she was, but he had a feeling that if she wanted to contact him, she'd be able to find him. He wasn't difficult to track down in real life. Cloudbusting24 didn't immediately respond. Of course, she had Damon's contact information, but she didn't want him to know who she was. In reality, they were just friends. She'd never talk to him in real life the way she talked to him in the game. She wouldn't even flirt with him. Cloudbusting24 looked at Damon's character in the game and imagined that was looking at the real Damon standing in front of her. She typed slowly, Damon, what if I regret it? Regret what? Damon was confused. Cloudbusting24 sighed, What if I regret what I said about wishing you happiness with Avery? I don't just want to cut off all contact when you get married. You can contact me as friends. Damon suggested. But I don't want to just be ordinary friends. What I want is, is to have the same relationship as your relationship with Avery. Cloudbusting24's eyes on the other side of the computer had a pleading look. But of course, Damon couldn't see that. I don't know if that's going to be possible, replied Damon. Cloudbusting24 sighed. I thought I'd be able to handle it, but just now, when you said that you were going to marry Avery, I... I suddenly felt very uncomfortable. What should I do if I can't accept it? Damon was speechless. I know what you're thinking, Cloudbusting24 typed. I get that I'm putting you in a difficult position. After all, you don't know me, so Avery would naturally be your priority. 
Can I tell you a couple things about myself? Uh, sure, Damon said, unsure of where this conversation was going. Okay, here goes, began Cloudbusting24. I've always been obedient. I was the good kid in my family, in the eyes of my teachers and friends. I wanted everyone to like me, so I was very careful not to offend anyone. I bent myself to fit the shape of everyone else for so long. Now I'm wondering what it would be like to just be myself for once. Why can't I follow my own heart instead of living on everyone else's terms? Damon raised his eyebrows. Who was this willful woman? She surprised him with every message. Although he could not see Cloud Busting 24's face, Damon could still feel the struggle in her heart. Damon quietly turned off the computer and deleted the character in the game. It was as if the short period of love with Cloud Busting 24 had never happened. He put his laptop away, closed his eyes, and drifted off into dreamland. Damon dreamed that he met Cloud Busting 24 in real life. At first, she looked just like her avatar from the game. Then she morphed into Jillian, a woman with whom he'd once had a relationship. After a while, her face shifted into Lily's, then Fiona's. In the end, she looked like Veronica. It was as if his brain was desperately trying to solve the mystery of who Cloud Busting 24 really was. But when he woke up in the morning, he was no closer to finding the answer than he had been when he fell asleep. After he woke up, he threw himself into his work. He had devised a plan to revive Everbright under the Astromar umbrella, but it involved developing a new game, which would take time and money. Damon already had a headache just thinking about the funds he would need to raise. Though Astromar was successful, the multi-billion dollar buyout of Everbright had tightened the cash flow considerably. Damon pondered what to do. Short of publicly listing Astromar on the stock market, he wanted to do so eventually but he just didn't feel ready to expose himself as the founder and CEO. And if they were put on the stock market, that would become open access information. There were already many organizations trying to contact Astromar. Among them, there was no lack of international financial giants, such as Berkshire Hathaway and Morgan Stanley. They were all optimistic about Astromar's prospects and expressed their willingness to invest. They also sincerely invited Astromar Network to consider being listed on the NASDAQ, Season Capital was also conducting intensive research about Astromar and concluded that they wanted to collaborate. Vicky herself reached out to Astromar, hoping to be put in contact with their CEO. Of course, Vicky had no way of knowing that their CEO was the very same man whose company she had single-handedly destroyed. Damon was quite pleased that Astromar was able to receive the support of global financial institutions. This meant that if Astromar went public, it would have good market value. Damon was inclined to go for it. It would be beneficial to Astromar's development, and they desperately needed the money. He <sighs> sighed, wondering how to put his fear of exposure to the side and do what was best for his company and his team. As Damon struggled to make a decision, he received a phone call from Nancy. She'd been calling him a lot lately. After Damon answered the phone, Nancy made some small talk, asking about how his senior year was going and how he was feeling about graduating. The truth was, Nancy was concerned about him. She knew that Everbright had been bought out by Astromar. It was splashed all over the front pages of financial magazines and newspapers. Nancy had even received push notifications about it from the news app on her phone. Robert and Nancy were worried that Damon would not be able to take this kind of stimulation and become dispirited. Any young man with dreams would feel crushed after suffering a major entrepreneurship failure such as this one. To check in on his mental health and make sure that he wasn't spiraling, Nancy called him every other day. Sometimes she even sent care packages or showed up out of the blue with a pizza and a smile. Meanwhile, Robert had instructed his team to contact Astromar behind Damon's back, hoping to buy Everbright from them at a higher price. However, Astromar rejected him time and time again. Because the Astromar network was not listed on the market, the various structures and company information had not been revealed to the public. The Astromar network was also Damon's, but Robert and Nancy could not figure it out, even if they racked their brains. What surprised Nancy and Robert was that Damon did seem to be doing okay. He was full of energy and had a great appetite. He graciously accepted the food and drinks that Nancy sent over, as if the problems of the Everbright company did not bother him at all. While the husband and wife were puzzled, 
they were also glad that Damon wasn't feeling worse. As long as he did not collapse, with Damon's talent, there would be a day when he could make a comeback. For this reason, Robert even invited Damon to participate in the internal affairs of the Brokerton Group, hoping to groom Damon as his successor. But Damon rejected the proposal. Damon was already having a hard time dealing with the matters of his own companies. He simply didn't have the time or energy to begin working with the Brokerton Group, no matter how much Robert tried to convince him. Later that day, Damon received another phone call. This time, it was from Mayor Francis, asking Damon to drop by the city council offices when he had the time. The last time Damon had seen Mayor Francis, they'd been at the coffee shop with the other entrepreneurs and international students. Mayor Francis had been friendly with Damon, trying to show him that he had Damon's back. Now there was the news that Astramar Network was going to be listed, so Mayor Francis hoped to have a good chat with Damon. Mayor Francis was very happy that Damon had the time to meet him. Although the mayor occupied a high political position in the city, he didn't dare display his arrogance in front of Damon. He had the utmost respect for the young entrepreneur and felt like he'd more than proved himself to be equal. This was not the first time Damon had come to the city council offices, which were located in the Francis family home. The first time he had come, it was Frank and Alex who'd invited him. At that time, he was blocked by the guards outside and was not allowed to enter. What surprised Damon was that the one who came to pick him up this time was Emily. He heard that Mayor Francis had an important committee to attend at the last minute, but it shouldn't take long, so he asked Emily to go downstairs and receive Damon. When Emily saw Damon, her eyes narrowed. It was hard to imagine that her father would invite Damon to his house as a guest. Emily only knew that Damon had once made a strange phone call, and then her uncle, Rex, survived a near-death experience. She heard that Damon's phone call had alarmed heads of state and other important figures from all over the world. She didn't understand how some random boy whom she'd met in New York City had tried to step in and help her uncle Rex. But of course, she still didn't know the whole story. But today, her father invited Damon to dinner at home, which surprised Emily even more. It was hard for her to imagine what a person like her father, who was harsh and even old-fashioned towards his children, would want to discuss with someone like Damon. What did the two men have in common? Emily couldn't wrap her head around it. Why are you so familiar with my father? Emily asked, curious, her eyes wide. Um, I don't know, Damon mumbled. Maybe he just wants to get to know me better. Yeah, right, Emily rolled her eyes at Damon. Well, I guess it's good that you're here. My brother Frank left to go hang out with other people today, so I've just been doing my own thing at home. I was going to go with him, but I was tired this morning, so I decided to stick around. Lucky you. Damon was stunned for a moment. He remembered the last time he came here to look for Emily, Frank, and the others. Wasn't Emily the only one home at that time? Then, for various reasons, the two of them developed an ambiguous misunderstanding. At this moment, Damon's heart was still beating slightly when he thought of it. The weather outside was very cold, but the heater was on in the living room. Emily felt that it was a little hot, so she took off her coat. Only then did Damon realize that her coat had been covering up a perfect figure. She wore a thin tank top and a pair of stretchy bike shorts as if she'd just come in from working out at the gym. Damon tried to avert his eyes. He didn't want to come off as creepy or weird. Emily stretched her arms up and fiddled with her long hair. She turned her head. Her expression changed abruptly. What are you looking at, big pervert? Hm, haven't you seen enough? Damon was awakened by Emily's roar and realized that he'd been staring blankly into the distance. He focused on the ceiling, trying to look anywhere else. Emily's cheeks flushed a rosy red. Look, if there's nothing else you need from me right now, you can wait in the study. She pointed to a door on the other side of the room. My dad heard that you like to read, so he set a couple of books on the coffee table if you're interested. Damon raised an eyebrow, but didn't protest. He nodded curtly at Emily instead of saying goodbye, then strode purposefully toward the study. Damon walked into the study at the mayor's house. He strolled over to the bookshelf and pulled out a book that looked interesting. Suddenly, he caught a whiff of strong coffee. He turned around to see Emily offering him a cup. Here you go. You're a guest in our home after all, Emily said, passing the cup to Damon. Damon hesitated for a moment, then tentatively took it from her. Emily rolled her eyes. Don't worry, I didn't do anything to it. Damon shrugged his shoulders, then nodded, 
thanked her, and took a sip. Emily didn't leave the room. She sat down on the couch opposite Damon, then reached for a book from a stack on the coffee table. She perused a travel book about Spain with great interest, kicking her shoes off and stretching her legs out on the sofa. Damon looked at Emily out of the corner of his eye. Though he hated to admit it, she looked extremely cute and curled up on the couch like that. Damon's gaze was drawn to the loose tendrils of hair in front of her eyes, the way the muscles in her calves flexed when she stretched, and how her lips pursed ever so slightly as she read the book. Damon couldn't concentrate on reading anymore. He set his book down and stared at her. Emily looked up. Take a picture, it'll last longer, she snapped. Damon startled out of his reverie. He immediately started blushing when he realized how he was staring. He quickly picked his book back up and put it in front of his face. I don't know what you're talking about, he mumbled. Emily sat up straight and crossed her legs. A real man wouldn't be such a coward, she scoffed. She pointed to the book in front of Damon's face. I know you're not reading that. Look, it's upside down. Damon was extremely embarrassed. Emily put down her book, rose from the couch, and walked over to Damon. Say it, she hissed. Say that you're a pervert. I know that you were looking at me. Don't lie to me, Damon. Emily's tone was getting even more aggressive. Damon knew that he'd been caught red-handed. He wanted to deny it, but wasn't sure how to form the words. Emily took another step forward, her finger pointed accusingly at Damon's chest. Just when she opened her mouth to continue her verbal attack, her knees suddenly buckled. Her whole body went limp as she fell to the ground. Damon leaped up from the couch and hurried over to help. Emily, what happened? What's wrong? Are you okay? He picked her up and asked. After a moment, Emily's eyes fluttered open. She gazed up at Damon. I don't feel very well, she muttered weakly. Please set me down on the couch. He gently helped her to the sofa, averting his eyes so that she wouldn't notice how he was looking at her exposed midriff. Are you feeling any better? He murmured. I told you that I wasn't feeling well this morning. That's why I chose to stay home instead of going out with my brother. Emily replied, taking a small sip of water. I think I'm running a fever. Do you know if there's any medicine around here you could take? Damon asked. Emily nodded. Go to the downstairs bathroom and look in the medicine cabinet. I'm sure there's something in there that would help. Damon hurried out of the study to find the medicine. After searching for a while, he found some ibuprofen in the cabinet. Then he went to the kitchen to refill Emily's water cup. He entered the study once more and offered the water to Emily. Hey, try to sit up and drink some water, he said softly. Emily looked up at him, her face pale. I don't have any strength to do that, she whispered. At least, not all by myself. Damon frowned. Emily could not drink water or take medicine by herself. Did she need him to feed her? He'd be happy to do it, but he didn't want to make an assumption or have Emily believe that he'd taken advantage of her when she was in a vulnerable position. Emily noticed that Damon was hesitating. Please, don't be stupid, she wheezed. Just help me. Well, okay, Damon said, uncertainty in his voice. He tried to prop Emily up and lean her against the side of the sofa, but Emily shook her head. This isn't comfortable, she whimpered. The sofa is too hard. I need to lean on your shoulder. Damon bit his lip. Looking at Emily was one thing, but getting physically intimate, even in a non-sexual manner, was another. Did this count as cheating on Avery? He thought about it for a moment, but soon realized that Emily needed his help as soon as possible. He could figure out how to explain it to Avery later. Without further ado, Damon helped Emily into a sitting position and took her in his arms, allowing her to lean against his chest. He placed the pills in her mouth, then brought the water to her lips, tilting her head back so that she could drink the water and swallow the medicine properly. After Emily took the medicine and rested for a while, Damon looked at her with concern. So did it help? Are you feeling better now? Emily nodded. Yeah, I do, she replied. The color was starting to return to her cheeks, and she was finally able to sit up by herself. Sometimes, when I'm sick, I get dizzy and lightheaded, she explained. Then she narrowed her eyes. I bet you liked having me so close to you, so weak and helpless, didn't you? Damon hadn't expected Emily to suddenly ask such a question. Truthfully, he had liked it, maybe a little too much. But he would never admit that out loud to Emily. From her smirk, Damon could tell that she knew that he'd liked it. But if he answered honestly, he knew that he'd never hear the end of it. I, I didn't think much about it, quite frankly, 
he stammered. I mean, you were sick. I was just helping you out in a time of need. You wouldn't have been able to take the medicine otherwise. Oh, come on. I know you enjoyed it, Emily replied. But look, I'm still not at 100%. Is it okay if I just lie on your lap and read my book? Damon wouldn't refuse Emily's request, but he still had some concerns. Aren't you afraid of being so intimate with me? What if your father comes back and sees us? I don't want to be accused of inappropriate behavior. You've already engaged in inappropriate behavior with me. Emily's face could not help but turn slightly red. She had the impulse to grind her teeth. Damon was rendered speechless. Why was Emily so determined to cast him in a negative light? Seeing Damon being humiliated, Emily finally felt that she had the upper hand. She grinned. All right, all right, I won't make things difficult for you. When my dad comes back, I'll hear him open the front door. There will be plenty of time for me to sit up and act like nothing's wrong. Emily changed into a comfortable position as she spoke. She reached for her book and reclined, resting her head in Damon's lap before he could utter a word of protest. To Damon's surprise, their time together passed pleasantly. They quietly read their books. From time to time, they laughed and shared passages from what they were reading. After a little while, Emily sat up and made eye contact with Damon. I have a question for you, she began. Can you tell me the story of you and your girlfriend? Like, how did the two of you get together in the first place? Why are you interested in this? Damon asked suspiciously. Emily suddenly looked bashful. She let out a shy giggle. Well, the truth is, you're not as bad as I thought you were. Your actions this afternoon proved that to me. I just want to know what your girlfriend sees in you and what you see in her. What makes you so sure that she's the one? My relationship with my girlfriend is very good. Don't think about me, Damon muttered. Emily threw back her head and laughed. Really? You can't be serious. I know that every guy dreams of cheating. Besides... I like you, and judging from how you were enjoying yourself just now, you should have a good impression of me as well. Why don't we get together? I'm not looking for a relationship. Maybe we could, you know, hook up every once in a while. Damon raised his eyebrows. What nonsense are you talking about? Go and find someone else to play with. I'm taken. Damon saw the teasing expression in Emily's eyes and deliberately put on a stern face. Sure enough, after a beat, Emily chuckled. Okay, okay, I admit it. I just wanted to see if you really have unrealistic thoughts about me. If you went along with it, then I'd run and tell your girlfriend. Women have each other's backs, you know. Hm. So you better not be a scumbag or I'll destroy you on behalf of justice. So Emily had just been testing him. A bead of sweat dripped down his brow. Thank God he hadn't taken her seriously. He let out a sigh of relief. He'd have to be careful around Emily. It seemed to Damon that she was a master manipulator. At that moment, the two of them heard the front door squeak open and then slam shut. Loud voices entered the foyer. My brother is back, Emily exclaimed. I think he brought his friends with him. Emily was still leaning on Damon when she heard the sound of the door opening. She jumped up like a frightened rabbit, afraid that the others would see her cozying up to Damon and get the wrong impression. Damon coughed, then smoothed out his wrinkled clothes and followed Emily downstairs. Frank and Alex were shocked when they saw Damon. Frank knew that his father had a guest coming today, but he didn't know who it would be. Damn, Damon, why didn't you tell us that you were here? Frank gave Damon a friendly pat on the back. The other friends hung back awkwardly for a moment. Damon recognized all but two of them. He took particular note of Alex's friend Chloe, who was especially surprised by Damon's presence. A strange look fell over Chloe's face. She remembered him well. She recalled how frightened he'd looked in the boxing match and how he'd swooped in to save Chloe at the last minute. What on earth was he doing at the mayor's house? Chloe came from a rich family, so she had seen quite a few big shots in her life, but she'd never seen someone so deftly defeat competitors the way that Damon had. It seemed to Chloe that Damon was no longer that random nobody who tried to pull himself up by his bootstraps. This was no longer within the scope of Chloe's understanding. Frank hurried to introduce the two friends that Damon hadn't met, a man and a woman. The man was called Jason Delberg, and the woman was Annabelle Raymond. They were both from Los Angeles and had ostensibly come to town to visit their friends. After the introduction, Frank's gaze landed on Emily. He arched an eyebrow and leaned in conspiratorially. Hey, Damon, be honest with me. Did you just come here to hit on my sister? 
The two of you seem pretty comfortable with one another. Emily pinched her brother's arm, ignoring his squeals. Oh, shut up, she said. If you keep making assumptions like that, then I'll start spreading rumors about you to our friends too. <laughs> Sis, you can't blame me for thinking that, Frank replied, rubbing his arm where Emily had pinched it. I bet this is the real reason that you didn't want to hang out with us today. You said that you weren't feeling well, but you had a secret date with Damon. Emily stomped over to Frank and hissed into his ear. Bro, it was our dad who invited Damon over as a guest. You'd better stop talking now. Frank's jaw dropped. No way. What? Dad asked Damon to come over? Em, you better not be making excuses. Everyone whirled around, looking at Damon for confirmation. They wouldn't believe it until they heard it from the mayor's lips. Frank, Alex, and the others stared at Damon, their mouths agape. They knew Mayor Francis to be unfriendly and unyielding. He didn't have a lot of respect for young people. Was it true that he invited Damon to his home? Only Chloe believed it without hesitation. From the day she saw Damon in the boxing competition, she knew that he was no ordinary college student. Emily nodded vigorously. I also find it hard to believe, but Dad did invite him. Dad just went to hold a meeting and will be back soon. If you don't believe me, you can ask him. Frank arched an eyebrow. Well, if you say so, sis. I guess we'll just have to wait for Dad. He turned to Damon. Hey, man. You should know that my little sister looks up to you. She said that you're a great writer, even better than she is. Damon tilted his head to the side. He didn't think that Emily talked about him at all. She always acted like he was a scumbag that she couldn't wait to make fun of. Emily blushed. She glared at her brother, then at Damon. What the hell are you looking at? So you occasionally come up in conversation. Big deal. Don't get cocky about it. Damon smiled helplessly wanting to change the subject so Emily would stop giving him a death glare. Yo, Frank, what were you guys up to earlier? Were you playing a game? You're covered in sweat. Frank wiped his brow. Oh, yeah, we just came in from the court. We were playing basketball against this group of idiots, but we beat them to a pulp. He laughed. But don't change the subject. Why did my dad invite you here? What could he possibly have to talk to you about? Damon shrugged. Beats me. I also want to know why your dad wants to talk to me. Emily frowned. She thought that Damon was bluffing. Of course he knew why her dad wanted to talk to him. She opened her mouth to say something, then closed it again. Maybe it would be better to just watch the whole thing play out when her father returned. They wandered into the living room and spread out over the sofas and chairs. Some people played games, some turned on the TV, and some went to fetch snacks from the kitchen. Damon was interested in the two people, Jason and Annabelle. Though he couldn't determine much about their identities, he surmised that Annabelle's father seemed to have a close relationship with politicians in Los Angeles, and that Jason had some important political connections himself. He wondered how Jason and Annabelle had befriended Frank and Alex. Suddenly, they heard the sound of the front door opening. It was Mayor Francis, who had just finished his meeting with the regulatory committee and had finally returned. When he saw Damon, Frank, Alex, and the others waiting for him, he smiled and greeted Damon first. Well, hello there, he said, shaking Damon's hand. How long have you been waiting? Not that long, Damon assured him. Oh, good. I was supposed to wait for you at home, but I had a committee meeting at the last minute, and I had no choice but to attend. Please forgive me. Mayor Francis gave Damon an apologetic look, then turned to address the others. Son, you and Alex should take your friends and go have some fun. Damon and I need to go to the study and discuss some serious business. Before you go, make sure to offer your pal some refreshments. Frank's jaw dropped. What could be so serious that his father and Damon had to go to the study to speak privately? He was finally starting to believe that it had been his father who invited Damon, and not his sister in an attempt to have a secret affair. As Damon followed the mayor into the study, Jason and Annabelle turned to Frank. Who is that guy anyway? Annabelle asked. Your father seems to have a great deal of respect for him. Frank shrugged his shoulders. Your guess is as good as mine. I didn't even know that they were closely acquainted. Chloe didn't say anything. She was probably the only one who could guess what was going on. Damon and Mayor Francis sat down in the study. The mayor offered Damon a cup of coffee, and Damon gratefully accepted it. Damon, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. The meeting was unavoidable. Someone made a pretty big mistake with the construction of a new housing development in the 6th District. And as the mayor, I ultimately end up being responsible. 
It was just another little fire to put out, but it seems like there have been more little fires than usual lately. I haven't been able to get a good night's sleep in months. The mayor paused to take a sip of his coffee. Damon didn't know what kind of problems Mayor Francis had encountered recently, but clearly the mayor trusted him enough to confide in him about the regulatory committee's conversation. Damon shook his head. Please don't worry about the wait, Mayor Francis. I had a nice time reading in the study. You have a lovely home and a great personal library. The mayor chuckled. I'm glad to hear that, Damon. I know that you're friends with my children, but you don't have to call me Mayor Francis every time you speak to me. We're colleagues, after all. Doesn't need to be so formal. Call me Bob. Although I'm a few years older than you, your current achievements are enough to make you my peer. Damon smiled, but he still felt that it would be slightly awkward to call the mayor by his first name, especially if he did so in front of Frank and Emily. Mayor Francis was a smart person. He knew what Damon was worried about and couldn't help but laugh. You can call me Bob in private. In front of my son and daughter, you still have to protect my authoritative image. I understand that it might be uncomfortable to address me so casually. Mayor Francis put down the coffee cup, took out a pack of cigarettes, and threw it to Damon. Now let's kick back and relax. Have a smoke with me. Damon took a cigarette from the pack, lit it with the box of matches on the table, and started to smoke with the mayor. An ashtray lay between them. They began to make amicable small talk. Mayor Francis, I mean, Bob. I noticed that beautiful wooden cigar box on the table. If you like cigars, I can find you some top quality Cuban cigars if you're interested. The mayor chuckled. <laughs> That's a nice offer, but don't worry. I'm already stocked up on cigars. Damon, in all seriousness, I want to thank you. Not only did you save my brother, but you also did a fantastic job in smoothing out diplomatic relations with some of the countries with whom we've previously had issues. People keep giving me the credit and it's granted me a lot of political leverage. But it was really all thanks to you and your work behind the scenes. The mayor stubbed out his cigarette in the ashtray and leaned closer to Damon. I have a word of advice for you. I think you should read more books about international finance and the art of war. With the speed of your company's growth, I think it would be beneficial for you to understand how all of these things are connected. Damon considered this. Though Everbright hadn't ended well, once it was absorbed by Astromar, both companies had risen in the global rankings. Astromar was swiftly becoming an industry giant. As long as there were no huge strategic mistakes, it would be hard to shake their position in the industry. However, if something big rattled the global economy or shook political tensions between nations, Astromar could potentially suffer heavy losses. Damon nodded. It's true that the more the business expands, the more impact the economy has to influence our dealings. The mayor lit up another cigarette. Yes, it'll be a bigger problem in the future, especially if you decide to list Astromar publicly. And Damon, I have to ask if the rumors are true. Are you planning to list Astromar on the market? Actually, yes, I am planning to do that. Damon said quietly. He took a sip of coffee. Mayor Francis exhaled a long, thin stream of smoke. Although I am the mayor, I work in the finance department of a huge government firm. I remember when another company went public and became the IPO with the most funding in the history of the world. I wouldn't be surprised if your company topped that record. That company had caused a global sensation and had been in the limelight for weeks. The mayor recalled drafting reports on what they had done correctly and later on what they had done incorrectly after the company crashed and burned. No one stays on top forever. However, the mayor had a great deal of faith in the young man sitting before him. Damon was an entrepreneurial prodigy and an extremely bright person. It had been a long time since Mayor Francis had met a genius who hadn't even graduated from university. Fortunately, this exceptional young man was very good friends with his son and daughter, which pleased the mayor to no end. Any parent would hope that their children would rub shoulders with intelligent, capable people. Mayor Francis clasped his hands together. Have you decided where to go on the market? No, we're still thinking about it. Damon replied. If my guess is right, Astromar will have their pick of where to go. You'll have to file the necessary paperwork, but I think it'll be easiest to start publicly trading with NASDAQ and the New York Public Stock Exchange. Though perhaps London could also be a good choice. No stock market was willing to let a company as large as the Astromar network wiggle out of its grasp. With the current development speed of Astromar network, becoming one of the top 10 companies in the world with the highest market value was just around the corner. We've been contacted by several consultants, 
We're also discussing it internally. It's a big decision to make, said Damon. I'm afraid you already know what's going on, right? Mayor Francis asked. Although it was a discussion, Damon had absolutely control over the shares. And as the founder, all the decisions were ultimately still in Damon's hands. Damon shook his head and smiled bitterly. We're just in deliberations right now, Mayor. I mean, Bob. Nothing is confirmed or set in stone. Mayor Francis nodded again and said, To be quite frank, Damon, I think you shouldn't rush into a decision just because of external pressure. Practice due diligence. Many outstanding companies are eager to be listed and financed, and a great number of them are heading overseas if they feel like the offerings here in the United States aren't measuring up. He poured himself some more coffee and handed Damon another cigarette before he continued. The company that I mentioned earlier was an oil company. They decided to take their business out of the United States, which dealt a devastating blow to the stock market. I just don't want to see your team at Astromar getting in over their heads. In a lot of ways, the stock market is a game, but it's also a gamble. You saw how Everbright shares plummeted, and I know you've watched how careful your father has been. You want to be Jeff Bezos from Amazon, not Dwight Scottsdale from True Oil. Who? asked Damon. Exactly, the mayor replied sagely. Damon realized that the mayor was right. When Everbright folded, its share price was almost 50% lower than its competitor, Thundercloud Games. He didn't want the same misfortune to befall Astramar. Seeing Damon's brow furrow, Mayor Francis said again, Look, due to my background, I have a lot of important connections in both politics and finance. I'm tight with a lot of Wall Street bankers and brokers. I think I can help you get on the right track and develop Astramar's IPO so that failure will not be an option. Failure is never an option, but it could happen to anyone, Damon muttered. He took a drag of a cigarette. Okay, Bob, if you're willing to help, then I'm ready to accept your offer. Mayor Francis and Damon were in the study at the mayor's house, discussing the potential of listing Astromar on the stock market. The mayor took a sip of coffee. Damon, to be honest, I have a great deal of admiration for you. You did the best you could with Everbright under the circumstances, and I believe that you have a good head on your shoulders and a bright future with Astromar. Two world-renowned companies under your belt before you've even hit your mid-twenties? You must be proud of yourself. He set his coffee cup down on the table. If Frank and Emily are ever half as accomplished as you are, I'll die with no regrets. The mayor gave Damon a pointed look. If Astromar went public, then Mayor Francis would be rubbing shoulders with a man who could one day surpass Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos in terms of net worth. Damon would become his generation's idol and would inspire millions of young people. It was more than the mayor could ever hope to achieve in his career. After they chatted for a long time, Emily called the two of them downstairs for dinner. Although Damon hadn't yet decided where the Astromar network would be listed, it wasn't important. Mayor Francis just needed to solidify his relationship with Damon and ensure that their networks overlapped. Mayor Francis believed that Damon would consider it carefully. When Damon and Mayor Francis sat down, everyone stopped talking. All eyes were on Damon. Frank placed his fork beside his plate and frowned. It was fine if Mayor Francis wanted to talk to Damon about something, but what could be so important that they locked themselves in the study for three hours? When the two men sat down, their energy and excitement was palpable. Frank was a little bit jealous. His father never wanted to sit and talk with him for that long. Mayor Francis could tell that they were receiving strange looks, but he felt the need to speak up. Frank, Emily, you have a lot to learn from Damon. He's accomplished a great deal in his young life. I think you could benefit from following his lead. Frank and Emily both scowled. They didn't like that their father was comparing them to one of their peers, as if he wasn't proud of his children. While it was true that Damon had achieved success early in life, Emily and Frank had their achievements to bring to the table, and they felt like no matter what, they would be overshadowed by Damon in the eyes of their father. No matter how proud of themselves they were, their ultimate goal was to make their father proud of them. Who did Damon think he was, strolling into their house and making them jealous? Damon's expression was a little awkward. He wished that the mayor wouldn't put him on the spot like that and pit him against people whom he'd been trying to be friends with. He sighed. Maybe he was worrying too much. He knew that Frank, Alex, and the others all liked him. Even Chloe had warmed up to him. But did they like him because of who he was as a person, or because they knew that he was powerful? Damon second-guessed himself. They might have been only pretending to be his friends. The mayor sensed everyone's discomfort. 
Once they were finished eating, he suggested that Frank, Emily, and the others take Damon out on the town to have some fun. The group of young people walked across the street to the park. Frank clapped Damon on the back and said in a mocking tone, You should look up to Damon. Huh, <laughs> you bastard. What did you do to my father? What, did you drug him to make him so gaga over you? Damon was embarrassed by Frank's question and shrugged modestly. I guess that he appreciated that I helped him out before and now he just wants to return the favor. Frank threw back his head and laughed. Come on, you think I don't know my father? He's pretty transparent. He doesn't pay attention to us if we accomplish anything, but the second you waltz and he falls all over himself to sing your praises. Whatever, how about this? One of these days, we'll go online and play games all night. If you're so powerful, I'll use your avatar as a shield to protect me. Speaking of which, have you decided to do anything after you graduate? Alex piped up. Are you majoring in finance or business? I'm sure that you have a lot of options. Now that they were in their fourth year, this was a topic they had to face and take seriously. I haven't thought about it, Damon admitted. <laughs> well, I think that it would be so boring to be in the financial industry, Alex said with a laugh. Professional basketball would be way more exciting. I think I'm going to have a pretty hard time, said Frank. I used to want to be an artist, but my father wants me to follow in his footsteps and become a politician just like him. Ugh. Probably wants me to be just as miserable as he is. Frank and Alex sighed in unison. Both of their fathers had high expectations of them that it would be difficult to meet. Their fathers hoped that after they graduate, they would immediately take the LSAT exam and go to law school, then glide smoothly into politics. Alex turned to Emily. What about you, Em? What do you plan to do after graduation? Before Emily could say anything, Frank guffawed. She's just going to get married and have children, then stay at home all day to take care of them. Frank had been bullied by Emily many times. He never resisted a chance to strike back whenever he could. Emily crossed her arms over her chest and sneered at her brother. Yeah, right. You're going to be the one stuck in an unhappy marriage for the rest of your life. I haven't had enough of a single life yet. Anyway, you'd probably have to trick someone into marrying you. Shut up, Frank cried, clenching his hands into fists. Hey, Damon, you're the only one here who Emily might listen to. Why don't you do the honors and marry her yourself? Damon and Emily exchanged a glance. Emily rolled her eyes, but secretly, she didn't hate what Frank had just said. Damon was uncomfortable. He wished that he'd never gotten himself into this position. Truthfully, he had a lot of respect for Emily but he didn't like how Frank and Alex were trying to pawn her off on him. Emily had made it clear that she didn't want to have romantic feelings toward him, and besides, he was taken. Just as he was thinking about it, he suddenly felt an itch on his palm. He looked down and was surprised to find that Emily had reached for Damon's hand and was quietly tracing circles on his palm with her index finger. Since it was so dark outside, no one else could see what she was doing, but Damon was baffled. What did she mean? Was she teasing him? Damon looked up at Emily. It just so happened that Emily was also looking at him with a provocative expression. Damon's heart couldn't help but beat faster when he saw this. He thought of all the ambiguous feelings he had toward Emily. He was desperate to figure out what she meant, but he knew that he couldn't ask her in front of the others. Okay, so now that we're out, what should we do tonight? Alex asked as they strolled through the park. I don't know, it's so boring around here, Frank complained. Then he snapped his fingers. I know. Why don't we go online? Let's play that global hegemony game. Isn't there a gaming cafe around here somewhere? The others were excited by that prospect. Ever since the release of Global Hegemony under Everbright's banner, it had quickly become popular in the entire esports circle. They had loved to play the game before Everbright had folded. Now that Everbright had been absorbed by Astamar, the game was up and running again, and users had started to reactivate their accounts. Alex looked at Damon. Are you going to play? Damon nodded, although he didn't play the game often. As the developer, Damon could change the settings. Furthermore, he was the only one who knew some of the hidden bugs in the game, which made his character invincible. He knew the game like the back of his hand. It would be obvious that he had an unfair advantage. Seeing that Damon had agreed to play, Alex's face revealed a happy smile. Awesome. In their group, the only really strong players were Alex and Emily. The others just liked to play for fun. However, if they were going up against Damon, then they would all put their best foot forward to team up and try to defeat him. Alex happened to know of a gaming cafe called Tech Republic, 
it was the gathering place for the most famous and competitive players in the city. Some of Global Hegemony's top players had gathered at the cafe to form a guild, and the tension in the air was thick. The group got on the bus to head to Tech Republic, chatting enthusiastically. In the distance, they saw the neon sign of the gaming cafe glowing majestically in the dark night. Though everyone had computers at home, Global Hegemony ate up a lot of bandwidth, so many people still flocked to Tech Republic to use their servers. It was getting late, but the cafe wasn't going to close anytime soon. They were doing fantastic business. It looked like the young people in town had all had the same idea that evening. Tech Republic was well stocked with leather sofas, phone chargers, and row upon row of computers. The cafe also boasted a pool table, air hockey, arcade games, and a snack bar. Damon and the others entered the cafe amid a sea of people. It looked like there was a competition happening. Two teams were going head to head as onlookers shouted and cheered. At that moment, the situation inside was very intense. The two teams displayed their astonishing talent in the game. The players beside them were fascinated. Professional analysts looked on, recording the data and furiously scribbling with the stylus on their iPads. Seeing such a lively scene, Damon couldn't help but smile. He was proud when he saw that the game he designed was this popular. Damon scanned the room until his gaze landed on a familiar face. His jaw dropped. No way, he muttered under his breath. It was Victoria Cardiff. It was hard to imagine that a proud woman like Vicky would actually fall in love with a game like Global Hegemony. And judging from the speed at which she played, she must be a veteran fan as well. Damon squinted at the stats on the leaderboard and was shocked to see that Vicky was the team captain. When playing in team mode, Global Hegemony could accommodate up to five players on each team. Vicky and a young man beside her seemed to be the core of their team, with another three people supporting them from the side to defeat their opponents. This version of Global Hegemony allowed players to level up in a battle like never before. Vicky's opposing team was playing to perfection with astonishing speed. No matter how strong Vicky and her second-in-command were, the enemy continued to take them down. After going through a relatively easy battle, they quickly killed the three covering wingmen on Vicky's periphery. Vicky tried her hardest, but she was powerless to reverse the situation. In the face of the enemy's destructive advantage, in the end, Vicky's team had no choice but to collapse and surrender. At Tech Republic, Damon watched as Vicky's team failed the Global Hegemony Gaming Competition. Vicky was unhappy. She'd been sharpening her gaming skills for ages, and Global Hegemony was her favorite game. Vicky was confident in her abilities. Otherwise, she wouldn't dare to make a fool of herself around the top players in the country. Of course, the enemy was also powerful, and a captain is only as good as her team. Three of her teammates were practically dead weight. They had been too easily tricked and trapped by the opposing team. Vicky didn't stand a chance without solid backup. When they lost, it wasn't entirely unexpected, but Vicky was still extremely disappointed. She sighed and walked over to the members of the opposing team to shake their hands and lose with dignity. She strolled over to the team captain and held out a small poster that bore the Global Hegemony logo. Hey, good game, Vicky said with a smile. Can you sign this for me? I have to say, after the way you played today, I think I'm a fan for life. The captain was a handsome young man by the name of Anthony Davis. This was Vicky's first encounter with him, but he was rather famous in the esports circle. He readily agreed to sign the poster for Vicky, giving her a flirtatious glance as he did so. That's quite a compliment coming from a player as powerful as you are, he complimented Vicky. I've been playing here for a long time and usually I pulverize my opponents within minutes. You're different. I lost 80% of my power when I went up against you. You should be incredibly proud of yourself. Anthony signed his name with a flourish and handed Vicky the poster. Initially, Vicky had been a little depressed after losing, but she was flattered by Anthony's praise. She blushed. Thanks so much for saying that. It means a lot coming from you. After all, your dream team is always in the top three on the leaderboards. I'll continue to work hard to improve my skill. Hmm. <laughs> Look at you, signing autographs like your Brad Pitt. Do you think you're so great? The sudden voice appeared at an inappropriate time, and it was quite loud. Everyone looked toward the source to see who had the guts to scold Anthony. In the end, everyone's eyes fell upon Frank. Originally, 
Frank admired Anthony and the rest of the dream team, but he didn't like how cocky they were acting and figured that someone should put them in their place. Anthony narrowed his eyes. Who was this random guy who called him out in front of his adoring fans? He raised his eyebrows and smiled coldly. What's wrong? You don't accept that I'm the best player in the room? Why don't we compare notes and I can teach you a little lesson? Frank had a few tricks up his sleeve. His performance in Global Struggle was considered above average, but there was still a huge gap between him and a professional player like Anthony. Was Anthony challenging him to a competition? He bit his lip. If he went up against Anthony and lost, he would lose face in front of his friends and embarrass himself. Emily saw that her brother was in a dilemma, so she stepped forward. You know what? If you want to play against our team, then let's play. We're not afraid of you. Frank shot his sister a grateful look. Emily and Alex were both skilled at the game. If they brought their all, then their team might have a chance at losing with dignity by a much smaller margin. Yeah, Alex piped up. We have no problem facing the dream team. We're ready. Emily looked at Damon. Damon, are you in? The reason Emily agreed so readily just now was because their last trump card was Damon. Even though Emily had never seen Damon play Global Hegemony, she still had a kind of blind confidence in him. Damon was backed into a corner, so there was nothing left to do but nod his head in response. The rest of the team breathed out a sigh of relief. Vicky's jaw dropped as she looked behind Emily to see Damon standing there. What the hell was he doing there, and why couldn't she stop running into him? You want to fight Anthony Davis? Vicky sneered. I doubt you weaklings can take him on. I mean, look at yourselves in the mirror. There's no way you're worthy of even standing in the same room as Anthony, much less casually challenging him as an opponent. Damon took a few steps forward. Those are pretty bold words to come out of the mouth of an amateur, he said in a low voice. Excuse me? Vicky exclaimed. Say that again, and speak up this time. I don't think you have the guts. How many ordinary people could be on the same level as Vicky? She'd grown up gaming, encouraged by her father since she was a little girl. How dare Damon calls her an amateur. Are you threatening us? Frank interjected. Get lost. We were challenging Anthony, not you. Frank clenched his hands into fists. He was always eager to pick a fight. Vicky, second in command, her teammate Chase, stepped forward ready to fight back. Vicky grabbed his arm. Chase, don't lower yourself to their level. Let's just allow their skills to speak for themselves. Neither Vicky nor Chase knew that Damon was the game developer, but Vicky knew about Damon's family background. The Brokerton group had a lot of important connections in the area. If Chase attacked Damon, then it could cause issues for Vicky down the line. For the sake of her reputation, for the sake of today's plan, she might as well watch from the sidelines and see how the professional players from Deem Team clobbered these idiots. She was looking forward to witnessing Damon humiliate himself. Although Chase was a little indignant and wanted to teach Damon and Frank a lesson, he didn't do anything after Vicky stopped him. Come find me later, he growled. Oh my god, I'm so scared. Help, help. Frank dramatically clutched his chest and staggered backward. Chase's face flushed scarlet with anger. Damon chuckled at Frank's performance. Vicky whirled around to face him. Damon, don't be so arrogant. You have no room to brag. Vicky crossed her arms over her chest, waiting to see if Damon would make a joke. She had just experienced the unfathomable strength of Anthony and the Dream Team. She was positive that an inexperienced player like Damon would be beaten to a bloody pulp. Everyone was shocked when Vicky spoke Damon's name aloud. So the two of them knew each other. It sounded to the others like Vicky already had some sort of personal grudge against Damon. There was no time for them to bicker with each other. The crowd was still waiting with bated breath to see if Anthony and the Dream Team were going to challenge Damon and his friends. It had been a long time since anyone dared to be so arrogant in front of Anthony's team. The other players who frequented Tech Republic would never be brave enough to provoke them like that. Let's do this, Anthony grumbled. Both sides sat down and the battle began. Generally speaking, at the beginning of the game, everyone would immerse themselves in developing their characters. Only when they reached a certain level and felt that they had an advantage would they join forces and team up to harass the enemy and open up the big screen of the battle. However, Anthony didn't take the normal path. From the beginning, he sent soldiers to harass Damon's team. There was an advantage to this. It could disrupt the morale of the enemy. If they lit a fire here and there, it would be difficult for the enemy to calm down and develop a decent strategy. This was a huge psychological blow to the enemy in the early stages. It flustered them and made them weaker. 
giving Anthony's team a leg up from the start. However, Damon's character was tough. Even if Anthony's team harassed him, Damon could send his enemies to fight back. Not only that, but Damon also secretly sent some soldiers to set up an ambush on the road that the enemy soldiers passed by. No one knew how Damon had done it. Emily, Alex, and the others took the time to look at Damon's technique. They saw Damon's fingers moving quickly and calmly. Watching Damon's swift movements boosted team morale. The series of schemes and plots successfully made Anthony and the others suspicious. They were so scared that the dream team decided to retreat and reorganize. Meanwhile, Damon didn't back down. He leveled up his civilization and developed his character faster than anyone had ever seen. He leaped over obstacles and gathered enough coins to buy equipment for his whole team. Then he split up his troops to march toward the enemy's lair. The dream team was getting nervous. They had expected this to be a breeze, but they were already getting destroyed just a few minutes into the game. The dream team no longer cared about the development of the troops and started to gather their forces to deal with the enemy's attack. One of the onlookers cried out, How the hell did they manage to gather such a large army in such a short period? I've never seen anyone whip the butts of the dream team like this. Is this Damon guy some kind of secret professional? The crowd was going wild. All of the other players at Tech Republic abandoned their games and gathered around to watch Damon and Anthony go up against each other. Facing this overwhelming army, Anthony and the others were flustered. They gathered all their forces and tried to fight against Damon's troops, but they were still stuck at a lower level. When Damon's team already had a powerful cavalry full moon steel blade, the dream team was still waving the poor man's bronze dagger. The dream team decided to divide and conquer. Anthony's remaining troops ran towards a small road, but Damon's troops were waiting for them. There was nothing else Anthony's troops could do but sacrifice themselves. Anthony winced as he watched his troops fall. He hid his avatar behind a large boulder, but he soon discovered that another group of Damon's men had already arrived. It turned out that Damon had already predicted the direction Anthony would flee and had set up an ambush a long time ago. After that, he surrounded the last group of Anthony's men. Anthony's face turned green. He had no choice but to split up his troops and try to preserve his last bit of strength. Unfortunately for Anthony, Damon's cavalry had already killed the troops that Anthony was covering. In the end, they sped up and intercepted Anthony's escape route. Then, Anthony found that he was surrounded by enemy troops from all directions. No matter how he tried to break out of the circle, it was no use. In one fell swoop, Damon had beaten the most powerful player on the leaderboard. When Anthony's dream team had finally been obliterated, the screen faded to black. The dream team was forced by the computer program to raise the white flag of surrender. Anthony gasped and slammed his fist down on the table. He'd spent countless hours practicing as well as playing in competitions, and he had never once lost global hegemony. He had been so confident in his abilities that he hadn't even considered the possibility of defeat. Now he'd been beaten by Damon in under 10 minutes. He'd been played like a fiddle. How did this happen? Anthony looked around nervously. Everyone was staring at him, even the weak players against whom he'd competed in the past. He had never been so humiliated. He and the rest of the dream team felt like they had been slapped. Vicky, who was standing behind Damon, had an ugly expression on her face. In her eyes, Damon was the scum of the earth. She despised him and had been looking forward to watching Anthony trample him. But the opposite had happened. Damon had defeated Anthony so smoothly and had beaten all of the records at Tech Republic. Vicky couldn't believe her eyes. Even though Vicky had a huge prejudice against Damon, she had to admit she'd never seen someone play the game so perfectly. Her mind raced. It had to be a fluke. Yes, that was it. It was some weird accident or bug in the game that had given Damon an unfair advantage. Anthony had gotten cocky and careless. It wasn't about skill. It was about arrogance. Vicky comforted herself with the thought that Anthony could win the next round. Vicky whispered something in Anthony's ear. Anthony bobbed his head up and down in agreement. Again, best two out of three, Anthony exclaimed. He was ashamed and somewhat exasperated, but ready to prove himself once and for all. All right, we'll keep you company till the end. Just don't cry when you lose later, Frank taunted him. Initially, Frank was worried that they wouldn't win, but who knew that Damon was so powerful? 
With the help of Frank, Emily, and Alex, their team was sure to ace the game once again. Both sides took their seats and the second round began. The surrounding spectators were also in high spirits as they watched the battle. The first round had exceeded everyone's expectations, and they were all excited to see how it would play out in round two. Most of them secretly hoped that Damon would be able to crush the Dream Team again. Many of the players who frequented Tech Republic had been clobbered by the Dream Team for years, and they had been wishing for someone to swoop in and put Anthony in his place. The two teams assumed their positions, but this battle ended up being even shorter than the first, and infinitely more tragic. Damon took the time to toy with his opponents, displaying the technique he had used when he first met Emily, Alex, and the others. He set traps, ensnared enemy troops, and obliterated the Dream Team in eight minutes flat. Damon's team relaxed. Realizing that they were on their way to a certain victory, Emily and Alex used their intelligence to boost their levels early on and cooperate with Damon. With Emily quickly rising to the rank of Damon's second-in-command, she helped Damon sweep away the obstacles in front of him at just the right time and thought quickly on her feet, copying Damon's strategies to deliver an impressive battle sequence. Damon was a developer. He knew that there were some small techniques in global hegemony that outsiders could not detect. Though his enemies had only leveled up to the Iron Age, Damon's team was so far ahead that they had the ability to attack from a great distance. He raised his avatar's hand and tossed his silver blade. It spun through the air and landed in the heart of one of Anthony's teammates. The Dream Team tried to fight back, but their efforts were all in vain. In the scuffle, they got confused about which avatars belonged to which team. Damon had tricked them so well that they started attacking their teammates. Once again, it was a crushing defeat. No one could call that a fluke or an accident. The members of the Dream Team were furious, but Damon's team was calm and composed, proud to be on the winning team. Anthony's face was ashen. Part of him wanted to propose the possibility of the best three games out of five, but he didn't know if he could bear to be humiliated three more times. He was starting to understand that even if they played a hundred rounds, the Dream Team would likely still end up the losers. He didn't want to drag it out anymore. He had to finally admit defeat and name Damon's team as the rightful victors. Anthony nodded curtly at Damon, then gathered up his team. They shuffled dejectedly out of the building. As soon as the door closed behind them, the crowd burst into applause. The other players had long, long despised the Dream Team's arrogance. And they felt like it took all of the fun out of the game if the Dream Team won every single time. Now, Damon and his friends appeared and blew the Dream Team out of the water. Everyone cheered as Anthony's name slipped out of the top three places on the leaderboard. Vicky, who was standing beside them, was also dumbstruck, although she refused to admit it. Damon had set up so many traps and performed the 36 stratagems to perfection. It was certainly a mark of his intelligence, and it alarmed Vicky to no end. She crossed her arms. <laughs> it's just a game. What's so great about it? She scoffed, but in her heart, she thought that she would never play global hegemony again. She loved the game, but this was too much. At that moment, she suddenly realized that no matter how hard she tried, she could not reach Damon's skill level, and she didn't want to lose to someone she hated. Her teammate, Chase, also had a livid expression, but he'd lost his courage to challenge Damon to a one-on-one -on -one battle. Chase curled his lips and said, Forget it, Vicky. Let's go play a game of pool. He took Vicky's arm in his. Damon raised his eyebrows. Could Vicky and Chase be having an affair? Though the situation was tense between Vicky and Damon, he didn't like to see another man getting so cozy with her. Despite himself, he had to admit that he was just a little bit jealous. Vicky noticed Damon's fierce gaze. She turned around and was stunned for a moment before quickly turning her head back. She was surprised to find that she actually felt a little guilty. Without thinking, she yanked her arm away from Chase. Wait a minute, she thought to herself. What am I afraid of? Nothing is going on between me and Damon. I should feel free to link arms with Chase in front of him. She wanted to grab Chase's arm again, but she lost her courage. She couldn't stand the way that Damon threw her off and made her doubt herself. After chasing away the members of the Dream Team, Damon, Emily, and the others started gathering up their belongings. The people watching the battle all looked at them with admiration. Even the staff of Tech Republic clapped and cheered. 
The manager quickly ran over to express his goodwill and invited Damon to stay at the Tech Republic for a while longer. He offered Damon a range of benefits, including free games and drinks for life. The manager knew that it was their best interest to keep such skilled players around. It would attract other players and boost the profile of Tech Republic tenfold. The manager daydreamed about what Damon's presence could mean for the business. He pictured official competitions, sponsorships, raffles, and prizes. Maybe even a social media campaign featuring Damon as the star and focal point. Damon was uncomfortable with the praise being heaped upon him, so he politely declined the offers, much to the manager's chagrin. He turned and waved at the crowd, then walked out the door, his friends and teammates trailing closely behind. When they stepped outside, they were relieved to finally have some peace and quiet. Damon leaned against the side of the building, puffing on a cigarette. He normally didn't like to throw his skills in people's faces, but he felt like Anthony and the Dream Team had been asking for it. Frank looked at Damon and said, Damon, now I suspect that you have no weaknesses. You acted like you were so inexperienced, but it looks like you played us all. Alex also looked at Damon with stars shining in his eyes. I thought that Emily would be our saving grace, but we actually had a shark among us this whole time. You've shaken my worldview. Man, you're ruthless. Frank shook his head. I just can't believe that you're already so good at global hegemony. It hasn't even been out for that long. I think you're better at playing global hegemony than I am at playing basketball, and that's really saying something. God, Damon, you should really consider going pro. You totally whooped Anthony's butt. They walked over to the billiard hall. The only topic of conversation was Damon's shocking gaming skills, and they chatted amongst themselves as they pushed open the door and entered the building. Suddenly, they fell silent. Vicky and Chase were standing at a pool table. Vicky was chalking her cue as Chase mumbled something unintelligible. A small group of friends surrounded them. Damon scowled. No matter where he went, Vicky was there. It was like she was stalking him. Vicky looked up and met his eyes. Everyone hushed. When Chase saw Damon, Emily, and the others enter the billiard hall, he sneered and looked at Damon with disdain. Why do I have to bump into this bunch of trash wherever I go? Chase whined. Another man who stood beside them pointed at Damon. Hey, it's those idiots. What are you guys looking at? Come over here. Do you have the guts to play us in a few rounds of pool? Vicky crossed her arms in front of her chest, wanting to see if Damon would take them up on the challenge. She was quite confident in her billiard skills, and she hoped that she'd get the opportunity to knock Damon down a few pegs. Vicky faced Damon with a cold smile and said, how about it, Mr. Big Shot? Want to play? Damon lit a cigarette and looked Vicky up and down. Frank and the others cheered loudly. Let's do it, Frank roared, gearing up for another interesting battle. How about this, Frank stepped forward. Let's do best three out of five games. I can guarantee you that you'll all be begging for your mommies and daddies when we're done with you. Frank had seen Damon play pool before, and he knew what a shark Damon could be. Back in New York... He had won money under the surname Brokerton. It was precisely because he knew Damon was ruthless that Frank set up the trap. What the hell are you talking about? Vicky spat, rolling her eyes. You're all a bunch of posers. It would be undignified if I played against you. She felt that if she agreed to play, she would somehow be stooping to their level. But if she didn't agree, wasn't that a failure in and of itself? After all, that would be admitting that she didn't think she was a good enough player. Vicky furrowed her brow, then a smile slowly spread across her face. She still had a secret weapon, her teammate Chase. He had been playing pool ever since he was a little boy, and if his parents hadn't forced him to study engineering at Harvard, then he might have become the next world champion in billiards. Vicky gave Chase a look. Chase understood what Vicky was telling him with her eyes. He put his hands up. Okay, fine. We'll play against you as long as you understand that it'll be you guys calling for your mommies and daddies, not us. Once Chase had agreed, Vicky smirked. Damon, when the time comes, I want to see how you lose face in front of everyone. Vicky had a plan. She wanted to film Damon's humiliation and post it all over social media. The agreement had been reached, so there was no need to talk any more nonsense. Since they were playing the best three out of five, they would begin with the strongest players from both teams. There was no suspense at all. Damon versus Chase. Chase lit his cigarette and set up the table, then let Damon break. Damon aimed at the corner pocket, but the ball stopped just short of going in. 
Chase got the ball in on his first try. Once again, it was Damon's turn, and he failed to get the ball into the pocket. Chase grinned. This was too easy. Chase swiftly landed two more striped balls in the side pocket. You suck at the pool, Chase taunted him. Damon smiled, then lined his cue up with one of the solid balls. Bam! Damon landed three balls in the corner pocket in quick succession. Chase's jaw dropped as he watched Damon line up his shots and sink the balls. Finally, when there were no more solids left, Damon tapped the cue ball. It hit the eight ball and sank it into the pocket on the other side of the table. Round one was finished. Chase looked at the clean table and thought he was blind or hallucinating. Chase had played pool his whole life, but he'd never seen an amateur play like that. Was Damon some kind of pool shark? Had he just been bluffing in an attempt to get Chase to let his guard down? The second round began. This time, Damon didn't go easy on Chase. After all, everyone's dignity was on his hands. Hence, he focused his attention and won the game in less than five minutes. They had played two rounds, and Damon won them both. If he won the third, then he would be the champion. Chase's hand trembled as he chalked his cue, but he tried to remain optimistic. After all, he had won awards and had almost gone pro. Surely he could take on a recreational player like Damon. Maybe it had just been luck. Or so Chase thought, trying to comfort himself. No matter how much Chase tried to gas himself up, the reality was just too cruel. In the third round, Damon didn't even give Chase a chance. Pow! Damon won again. Chase stood next to the table, completely dumbfounded. He lost again. He had never competed against a pool player as powerful as Damon. Vicky's face was also deathly pale. She had put her trust in Chase's abilities, and she was enraged that he'd been beaten so quickly by Damon. Damon put down his cue and smiled. So, what were you saying about begging for your mommy and daddy? He asked, cocking his head to the side. Frank and Alex roared with laughter. Suddenly, Chase broke his cue in half and shouted, Come on, guys, we're leaving. Frank jumped forward and blocked their way. He grinned and said, You want to leave? Are you really that shameless? I want to see you beg. Chase's face turned ashen. He stared at Frank and said, Do you know who I am? How dare you speak to me like that? I'll tell my father all about you and he'll destroy you and your little friends. Frank smirked at him. Why should I care who you are when we have the god of games on our side? It's hilarious that you're trying to threaten us. Do you have any idea who Damon is? Let's go. Get on your knees and beg for your mother. Vicky, who was beside him, also felt dizzy and scared. She hadn't told Chase who Damon was. The atmosphere at the pool hall was thick with tension. Once again, Chase tried to leave but Frank wouldn't allow him to run away so easily. Frank and his friends weren't scared of a guy like Chase. What a joke. He was trying to take the coward's way out. When Chase saw that his threat wasn't effective, he was at a loss. After all, the reason why he agreed to play the game was because Chase thought that he had a 100% chance of winning. But he hadn't foreseen a devil like Damon coming in and knocking him off his feet. If he knelt and cried for his mother, no one would ever forget it. His reputation would be ruined beyond repair. He hesitated. Then again, if he didn't kneel, he thought there was a solid chance that Frank would beat him up within an inch of his life. Chase had no idea what to do. Vicky stepped forward until she was standing directly in front of Damon. Are you sure you want to do this? You have to think about the consequences, Damon. If you continue like you are, our relationship will never be the same. Vicky was hinting that if Damon let them go, perhaps Vicky would be merciful and reevaluate their relationship. Of course, it was just a consideration. If Damon didn't let them walk free, then there would be no hope at all to heal their broken relationship. She would treat him like an enemy for the rest of their days. She prayed that Damon's silence meant that he was weighing the pros and cons of what she was suggesting. Damon narrowed his eyes. Who did Vicky think she was? After everything that had happened between them, including the way she'd single-handedly destroyed Everbright, the last thing that Damon wanted to do was to acquiesce to her requests. He wanted to trample Vicky's dignity under his feet. Today was the best opportunity that he'd come across yet. Cut the crap, Damon growled. Everyone on the losing team needs to fulfill their end of the bargain, and that means getting down on your hands and knees to beg for your parents. If you don't, you'll regret it. I can guarantee you that. Frank walked over to one of their opponents and grabbed him by the ear. Ow! shouted Chase's teammate. Oh, shut up, Frank said with disgust. 
You need to learn a little bit of respect. He twisted the guy's ear with all his might, then shoved him backwards. Chase's teammate clutched his ear and howled. Chase, Vicky, and the others were frightened by Frank's ferociousness. They were used to graceful, dignified games, and they had never witnessed the raw animal power of someone like Frank. Out of all of them, Chase was the toughest, but he could already tell that he was no match for Frank in terms of physical strength. His lip quivered. Frank cracked his knuckles. What's it going to be? Are you going to do as we say or shrink back like a bunch of pansies? Don't, don't hurt me. I'll, I'll do it. Chase cried out. He fell to his knees and collapsed his hands in prayer. Please, mommy, daddy, come save me. I was wrong. I want my mommy. Chase knew that he was embarrassing himself, but he'd rather do that than get beaten up by Frank. Seeing Chase kneeling, his friends hesitated for a moment before finally kneeling beside him, including Vicky. Vicky's eyes were filled with tears. She had never suffered such humiliation before. Of course, Damon could see the hatred in Vicky's eyes, but he didn't care. He wanted to make her feel as small and insignificant as she'd made him feel. He wanted her to have nightmares about where she might run into him again. At long last, he was able to get his revenge. When those people kotowed, Frank and Alex's anger disappeared. Slowly, Chase and his friends got to their feet. Vicky stood up and stumbled as she walked. They shuffled out of the pool hall, their heads hanging low. After those flies were shooed away, Frank and the others decided to play a couple of casual rounds. The staff, who'd watched the whole scene play out, brought them free drinks and congratulated them. One of them even asked for Damon's autograph. There weren't many people playing at the billiard hall that day, so the fight between Damon and Chase had attracted everyone's attention. Damon had played better than anyone who'd ever stepped foot in the building. Not only did he beat Chase until he was scared out of his wits, but he also brought into the horizons of the billiard enthusiasts who'd witnessed the battle. Most of the staff had worked there for many years, and they'd rubbed shoulders with the most professional players in the world, the best of the best. However, none of them compared to Damon. They wanted to personally shake his hand and compliment him on his prowess. Damon politely shook hands with the staff of the billiard hall, then motioned to his friends to leave. They all had enough excitement for one evening, and if the people down the street at the gaming cafe heard that they were still around, they'd never get out. Damon slung his arm around Frank and Alex's shoulders. Then the group of friends wandered out into the night. Damon and his friends left the pool hall unsure of what they should do next. They decided to sit in the park across the street from Tech Republic and hang out for a while. Damon, what's your relationship with that woman? Emily suddenly asked. She'd kept quiet around Vicky at the pool hall, but she was extremely curious. Emily held her breath. Could Damon and Vicky be having an affair? Emily watched Damon's expression closely, but he wasn't easy to read. But the question had been stuck in Emily's mind for hours, and she figured she might as well ask. Damon shrugged, trying to keep his tone light. We used to be friends, but we had a falling out, that's all. Oh, Emily exhaled, looking relieved. Although she felt that the relationship between Damon and Vicky was not as simple as it seemed, since Damon was keeping mum... Emily didn't think it was her place to probe any deeper. Furthermore, from the resentment flashing in Vicky's eyes towards Damon back in the pool hall, Emily didn't suspect that they had a romantic relationship. Emily then started to talk about how powerful Damon was when playing both global hegemony and pool. Although she already knew that Damon was a freak, when she saw him again, it was still somewhat thrilling. He continued to impress her. Frank was also excited. He wanted Damon to teach him how to be a pool shark. If he could reach Damon's level, he wouldn't be surprised if women started throwing themselves at him. Everyone was chatting happily as they recounted the events of the evening. At that moment, the sound of footsteps could be heard from the road. Then, they saw dozens of people walking over. The group squinted into the darkness and saw that Chase and Vicky were leading the pack. Vicky and her friends were from wealthy and powerful families. These people had always been concerned about their safety, so when they left the house, they would bring several bodyguards with them. Their bodyguards had been waiting for them outside the whole time. Vicky, Chase, and the others had suffered a huge loss. They were having trouble dealing with their anger. Their bodyguards couldn't help them while they were inside Tech Republic or the pool hall, but outside, it was fair game. There were no street lights or lamps across the street near the park. It was the perfect opportunity for them to strike back and get their revenge. 
Damon and the others knew that the situation was looking increasingly dire. Should we call for someone? Alex whispered. Damon smiled faintly. Don't worry about it, you guys. Everything is going to be just fine. Frank and Alex were a little nervous. However, they remembered the last time they'd witnessed Damon beat up a group of hooligans, and they felt slightly relieved that they were in the presence of someone who had their backs. However, Jason and Annabelle, who were sitting there quietly, didn't know that Damon could fight, so they were feeling tense. Emily wasn't concerned, and Chloe, who knew exactly what Damon was capable of, was trying to reassure Jason and Annabelle that their fears were unwarranted. Annabelle immediately widened her eyes and her face was full of curiosity. Are you sure we're going to be fine? Chloe nodded and squeezed Annabelle's arm. We're in good hands, I promise, she replied. Annabelle and Jason looked at Damon with endless admiration, but they still had doubts in their hearts. How could one young man be an expert at gaming, billiards, and fighting? He'd have to be some kind of superhero. Emily saw the look in her brother's eyes. She knew that he was ready to pounce. She leaned over and murmured, Bro, don't cause trouble. I think we should still call someone. Otherwise, we could be in danger. It's just too risky. Emily furtively took out her cell phone, intending to call the cops. Though she trusted Damon's abilities, she still hoped that he would not make a move unless it was necessary. What if they got hurt? Chase and his group were here to take revenge after suffering such humiliation. Emily was convinced that they were out for blood. Damon was confident that he could fight, but he recognized that Vicky and Chase had hired army caliber bodyguards. He didn't want to put his friends in jeopardy. He considered his options and decided that it was better to be careful than to recklessly abuse his strength. Frank agreed with Damon. Just as he was about to retreat, Chase waved his hand and shouted, It's them! Take them down! Immediately, a dozen bodyguards rushed over and surrounded Damon and the others, wrapping them up tightly and holding knives to their throats. After seeing that Damon and the others could not escape, Chase nonchalantly strolled over. He took out a cigarette from his pocket and smoked it. Then he slowly said, I see that you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. What are you going to do to us? Emily stammered. Isn't it obvious? Chase laughed. We warned you earlier in the pool hall that if you dared to attack us, we would return it a thousand times more. All of you, kneel. Frank crossed his arms over his chest and said with a smile, Damn it, you're the first person who's dared to talk to me like that in this town. Do you even know who my father is? Are you going to kneel down or not? One of the bodyguards cried, furious at Frank's arrogance. He reached out to put Frank in a chokehold, but Frank was more nimble than he looked. Frank swiftly threw a punch and sent the bodyguard flying into a tree. Beat them up! Beat all these bastards to death! Chase screamed. He was extremely flustered and exasperated. He wanted Damon and the others to die for humiliating them like that. A group of bodyguards rushed towards them. Frank, who was at the front, was hit in the nose. Instantly, Frank's nose started bleeding and he fell to the ground. Frank didn't make a sound. His army training had prepared him for this, and worse. He leaped to his feet and fought back. The bodyguard was stunned when he saw that Frank was still able to get up after being knocked down. The guard attacked even more fiercely, wanting to knock Frank down and make him unable to get up again. Alex tried to rush forward to save him, but before he got a chance to do so, he was thrown to the ground. Stars danced in his eyes. Seeing that his friends were losing the fight, Damon summoned up all of his strength and attacked. He kicked the bodyguard who had beaten up Alex in the stomach with lightning speed. The bodyguard flew back, clutching his stomach and crying out in pain. When Chase saw Frank, Alex and the others bleeding and rolling around on the ground, Chase felt a tinge of satisfaction. However, when he surveyed the scene and saw that Damon was still standing upright and unharmed, Chase was incandescent with rage. Kill him! Chase yelled. After seeing the bodyguards rushing towards Damon, Vicky grinned. She hoped that Damon would finally get what was coming to him, but at the same time, she started to worry. After all, Damon had connections with the Brokerton group. They'd all be in trouble if they killed Damon. She cried out, but her screams were drowned out by the fury and shouts around her. She could only watch helplessly as more than a dozen bodyguards rushed toward Damon. Damon remained calm and composed. He didn't panic. When he saw the guards running in his direction, a cruel smile appeared on his face. He knew exactly how to handle this situation. Once they got close enough, Damon jumped in the air and performed a propeller kick. 
In only the span of a dozen seconds, he managed to take out six bodyguards. The remaining four bodyguards hung back. They thought that 12 against 1 would be an easy fight, but who knew that Damon was so powerful? Chase's face paled. For the first time, he felt that Damon was a little scary. Vicky also widened her eyes and had a look of disbelief on her face. She'd never thought very highly of Damon. After all, he'd grown up impoverished and hadn't had access to good educational resources as a child. Vicky had judged him for not knowing how to ride a horse, not owning a yacht or a luxury car or a fancy watch. She thought that he would always fall behind the times and never have a good grasp of what was trending, despite his time at Meyerson University. However, the fact that this guy could create Everbray surprised Vicky, and she'd been astonished by his gaming skills. Not to mention how he crushed Chase when they played pool. Vicky bit her lip. He certainly didn't seem like an average guy. He had street smarts and a quick wit. Maybe it was time to hold Damon in higher esteem and take him seriously. She'd always admired strength and intelligence, and it appeared that Damon had that in spades. He'd also saved her life. She couldn't forget that. Vicky had sworn that he would always be her enemy, and she figured that Damon felt the same way about her. Was it too late to back down now? While the bodyguards were still in shock, Damon strode over to Chase and grabbed him by the collar. You think you're tough, getting 12 other men to fight your battles for you? Damon said with a sinister smirk. Chase was so scared that his eyes almost popped out of their sockets. What are you going to do to me? He whispered. Instead of responding to the question, Damon grabbed his neck and slapped him with an earth-shattering force. A welt the size of a ping-pong ball erupted near Chase's eye. He whimpered for a moment, reeling from the slap, then snapped out of it and finally got angry. Hey! Chase shouted at the bodyguards. Are you going to wait until he beats me half to death? What are you all good for? Come help me! Don't act like a bunch of cowards! The bodyguards who hadn't already been knocked down by Damon stood back, sheepish expressions on their faces. Just as the remaining bodyguards began to rush over to protect Chase, they suddenly heard the sound of sirens. The police had finally arrived. The police officers approached the park, shining their flashlights into the darkness. What do you kids think you're doing? One of the officers shouted. Damon dropped Chase to the ground and brushed off his clothes. Chase scrambled over to the cops, waving his arms. Oh, thank God you're here. These hooligans are trying to kill us. Arrest them and put them in jail immediately, he demanded. The police officer was taken aback by Chase's assertions. He shined his flashlight into the park and raised his eyebrows when he saw Frank, Alex, and the others. He recognized most of the people in that group. How was he going to enforce the law when these kids had such powerful parents? Chase was babbling incoherently. The officer put up his hand. Slow down, young man. Tell me what's going on and explain yourself coherently. Since Chase had been beaten black and blue and looked like he was at a disadvantage, the police officer gave Chase the chance to speak first. Chase took a deep breath and said, Officer, my name is Chase Von Lieden. You might recognize my last name. My father is Duncan Von Lieden, one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in New Jersey. We're in town to visit, but I never expected that our safety would be threatened while we were just innocently walking through a park. He clucked his tongue. It's a shame to see that this is how your city treats tourists. Those people over there hit me and threatened to kill me. He pointed at Damon, then pointed at his black eye. They did this to me. You have to help us, please, officer. Damon tried to hold back a chuckle. Chase wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. He was spouting nonsense to the cops. He was just flailing around, trying to make connections. Why had he even mentioned his father? The police surely wouldn't care about a wealthy man in New Jersey. The police officer in charge frowned slightly. No matter who was right or wrong, he found Chase's attitude despicable. He hated when people tried to use their family backgrounds to evade the law. Damon and the others hadn't heard of Chase's father before. Annabelle, on the other hand, seemed to have realized something. She leaned over and whispered, The Von Lieden family of New Jersey has a huge amount of assets and I've heard rumors that Duncan Von Lieden is going to run for office. No wonder Chase was so arrogant. He came from a family of tycoons and politicians. Damon wasn't concerned. 
he could already tell that the Brokertons wielded more power than the Von Liedens. Tell me, what's going on? Another police officer asked Frank. Frank looked like he had been beaten up badly. Before he could say anything, Chase waved his hands and gestured. Hello? Are you blind? They beat me up. Why are you wasting your time talking to them? I already gave you all of the evidence that you need to make an arrest. The police officer narrowed his eyes at Chase. Don't worry, kid, he grumbled. Our police force will enforce the law impartially. Now please step to the side and allow us to do our jobs. We'd like to interview as many people as possible. He turned his eyes to Frank and asked, What's going on? Frank sighed. Officer, it's like this. We defeated them in a video game at Tech Republic. Then we beat them in a few rounds of pool at the billiard hall. Now they have a grudge against us and they asked their bodyguards to beat us up. Is that so? The police officer looked at the bodyguards lying on the ground and his eyes flashed with surprise. Chase angrily interjected. Don't listen to those jerks. They're the ones who hired the bodyguards to attack me and my friends. Go on, ask the bodyguards yourself. Vicky massaged her temples. Chase was embarrassing her. Though he'd aced his exams and ended up going to Princeton, now she wondered if it was all because of nepotism rather than real intelligence. The bodyguards, trembling, knew that they would be in trouble if they dared to go against Chase, so they hurriedly nodded and pushed the blame onto Frank. Vicky really couldn't stand it anymore. She took the initiative to step forward and say, Officer, Mr. Von Lieden is lying to you. These people are our bodyguards. This group of people indeed defeated us at pool and video games, but they've been rubbing it in our faces ever since. They chased us to the park and started pummeling us before our bodyguards came to try to save us. Thank goodness that you arrived so quickly. It sounded like Vicky's words were more believable, but the police officer couldn't help but ask, Then why did they chase after you and not let you go? Vicky looked at Damon with disdain and said in a low voice, It's him. He kept pestering me before and wanted me to date him. I turned him down, so he's been out to get me ever since. The police officer looked at Damon and raised his eyebrows. The officer believed that Damon would be upset to be rejected by a woman as beautiful as Vicky. Damon's friends also looked over at him. Could that be true? Damon was dumbfounded. He never thought that Vicky would tell everyone that she rejected him. What was she thinking? Damon crossed his arms. How the hell could you possibly misinterpret what happened between us? He asked. You think that I would ever actually be interested in you enough to pursue you? Ha! <laughs> Vicky's cheeks flushed a dark shade of ruby. How dare he speak to her like that in front of all these people? Emily was quick to chime in. I believe Damon. Anyway, he has a girlfriend. What would he want with you? I wouldn't be surprised if he was the one who rejected you, not the other way around. All of the shoutings at the park attracted the attention of the people who were still inside the gaming cafe and the pool hall across the street. They wondered if they should go out and help. The staff and players slowly trickled into the streets to watch the scene unfold. But now, both sides were arguing over each other. When the spectators realized that Vicky and Chase were spinning a web of lies, they ran over to speak to the cops themselves. The manager of the pool hall said, Officer, this woman is lying. She was the one who tried to seduce Damon Walker, and he rejected her. So she's been trying to get her revenge on him ever since. One of the staff members from Tech Republic whipped out her phone. Yes, officer, that's the truth. I recorded a video earlier. This woman is the one who picked a fight with Damon. So it was only natural that he would counter the attack. Look at her rushing over to the park with her friends and bodyguards. It was easy to understand from the video that Chase was waving his arms and calling his bodyguards to beat Damon up. The officer watched the video with interest as Damon's friends were beaten to the ground, and Damon finally fought back. It was obvious who was right and who was wrong, and no one could argue with the video evidence. When the video ended, the officer texted it to himself, then scowled at Chase. This video made everything clear, Mr. Von Lieden. I'm going to have to ask you to come with us to the police station. Chase's jaw dropped. That proves nothing. The video was fake. They probably just used AI at Tech Republic based on images from the security cameras. He pouted. Vicky lowered her head, ashamed that others would know that she and Chase were associated with one another. Her opinion of him was souring rapidly. Who would be willing to be a witness? The police officer asked the crowd. He was annoyed. The evidence was conclusive, and Chase wanted to deny it. There were many shameless people in the world, but not many were as shameless as Chase. A sea of hands went up in the air as the players and staff who'd gathered around volunteered to be witnesses. These people admired Damon, 
and they knew that he wasn't at fault. They were all willing to stand up for him. When he saw that so many people were willing to go down to the police station and testify against him, Chase's facial expression became extremely ugly. He knew that even if he wasn't arrested, he would still be tried in the court of public opinion. The police officer stretched out his hand. Please accompany us to the Public Security Bureau now. If you don't cooperate with our investigation, I'm afraid that we'll have to arrest you on the spot. Ex excuse me? Chase sputtered. I demand to speak to my lawyer. Do you know who I am? My father will be hearing about this. The bodyguards surrounded Chase protectively, and the police officers tried not to look nervous. They were only local cops, after all, and they didn't know whether or not the bodyguards were armed. I will ask you one more time, the deputy said, his voice wavering. Scratch that. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Get in the car. The other officers behind him moved forward, handcuffs outstretched. The onlooker started chanting, Get in the car. Get in the car. All right, all right, Chase whined. He'd been backed into a corner and had no choice but to obediently get into the police car and go down to the station to be interrogated. At the police station, the cops released the findings of their investigations. It was Chase who gathered the crowd to start a fight, and in the end, he was beaten up by Damon. However, Chase was still at fault. Damon had acted in self-defense. It was only a matter of public security, and neither side would suffer any major consequences. After suffering such a huge loss at the police station today, Chase felt that he did not get the revenge that he deserved. He received criticism and disrespect, and the resentment brewed inside of him like a thunderstorm. When he was finally released from custody, he snarled at the police officer who took him in. You humiliated me. I'll be back to take care of you once and for all, he growled. The officer waved his hand dismissively. He received empty threats every day in the line of duty, and he had no reason to believe that Chase would follow through. Much to the officer's surprise, within an hour, Chase returned, this time with all 12 bodyguards as a backup. One of the guards disabled the security cameras while the rest of the guards beat the cop black and blue. If any other police officers tried to interfere, they were swiftly knocked out. One of the police officers pressed a panic button that summoned all officers on duty within a five mile radius. They all rushed to the scene. Chase and the bodyguards were outnumbered and quickly subdued with pepper spray and batons. Your father can't save you now, the police officer who'd taken him into custody said feebly, pressing an ice pack to his skull. You have assaulted the police, and there are dozens of witnesses. Chase had been thrown to the ground. His hands were cuffed behind his back, and he sniveled and groaned. Damon, Frank, and the others stood outside of the station, laughing uproariously at how the tables had turned. How could Chase be so stupid? He came from a wealthy family, but perhaps he just never had the discipline and had only gotten far in academics because of his father's money and status. Damon shook his head. He had no respect for people like Chase, who thought that they were superior to everyone else. If they thought that they were above the law just because they had money, then they had another thing coming. After all, they weren't on Chase's home turf in New Jersey anymore. They were about to get off scot-free for attacking Damon and his friends at the park, but they were begging to be tried and sentenced for assaulting police officers. One thing was certain, what awaited Chase would not end well. Finally, justice would be served. Winter was arriving, and Damon's second to last semester of senior year was winding down. Snow covered the town, casting a beautiful white glow on the old buildings scattered across Meyerson's campus. Theo and Xander returned from their internships and settled back into dorm life. Damon was glad to see them. He hated to admit it, but he tended to get lonely in the dorms from time to time. Besides, there was something else that Damon had to emotionally ready himself for. Veronica was also coming back to prepare for the graduate student exam. This was what Veronica told Damon when they were chatting on Astromar's messaging platform. Damon still couldn't believe it, but it was true. He knew that she always wanted to go to grad school, but he had no idea that she'd set her sights on Meyerson. Although Meyerson was internationally ranked, it scored similarly to the University of Berlin. Why would Veronica come back from her study abroad placement just to study at Meyerson? When Veronica went to study in Germany, Damon assumed that she'd be there for a long time, possibly forever. They had kept in touch on social media, 
but Damon had all but given up hope of seeing her again. Perhaps if he was lucky in the future, he'd get a chance to see her when she went back to visit her family. Then, they could have a meal together and chat and reminisce about the times when they were students. However, Damon figured that if she ever returned, she would keep a low profile and not get in touch with too many old classmates. He secretly wished that he could be the exception, unless Veronica was coming back with a boyfriend or a husband in tow. If that were the case, Damon didn't know if he could bear it. He never would have thought that Veronica would choose to leave Germany and apply for graduate school at Meyerson. When Veronica told Damon the news, he was quite excited. He asked her when she would be back. He didn't even remember how long it had been since he last saw her. Although he would occasionally stalk her on social media, scrolling through her Instagram or reading her posts on Astromar, it wasn't the same as seeing her in real life. Damon hoped to see her as soon as possible. Was Veronica still like Damon remembered her? He was shocked when Veronica informed him that she was flying in the following afternoon. The reason why it was so urgent was that Veronica hoped to meet with the graduate school guidance counselor at Meyerson before she sat for her exams and completed her application for admission. She was hoping to build her portfolio, get some career guidance, and write a stellar essay so that she would have a better chance of getting accepted to the program. To be honest, Damon thought that it would be very easy for Veronica to get into Meyerson University. She was a bookworm and was one of the most intelligent people that Damon knew. But after all, she had been away for a long time. It was difficult to complete the application from overseas, and no matter how smart she was, her application had to be top-notch, and her exam results had to be above the 90th percentile. Upon receiving the news, Damon was in an extremely good mood. He had half a mind to say that he wanted to go to the airport and pick Veronica up, but he resisted the urge. Damon already had Avery, so he shouldn't miss Veronica anymore. If he allowed himself to explore his feelings for Veronica, it would only hurt Avery, and anyway, Veronica might not return the sentiment. Then possibly, he'd be left with nothing. That night, Quinn called Damon and told him that Astromar would hold a meeting with some potential investors. If Astromar was going to be listed on the market, it had to attract the right kinds of investors and prove to them that Astromar had what it took. Quinn wanted to let Damon know that he had invited representatives from Season Capital to the meeting. Damon sat in front of his computer, experiencing a roller coaster of emotions. First, he found out that Veronica was returning, and now this? He had an incredibly busy few days ahead of him. The next day, it was still snowing. Outside the window, it was a vast expanse of whiteness. At noon, Damon, Theo, and Xander went out for lunch to catch up. Theo and Xander asked Damon about Everbright. Damon said that Everbright had become the property of Astromar. Theo and Xander raised their eyebrows, unsure if they should probe any further. They wanted to know how and why Everbright had fallen from its peak. However, this was Damon's information to share on his terms, and they knew that it might be a painful conversation for Damon. His friends exchanged glances, not wanting to pour salt on the wound. Theo and Xander watched Damon from across the table. Though Everbright had fallen from grace, it seemed like Damon was doing pretty well for himself. His complexion was bright, and he was in good spirits. His friends were startled by Damon's exuberance. If their companies had failed so spectacularly, they wouldn't be able to get out of bed, much less have a cheerful lunch with their friends. However, they were quite relieved to see that Damon was moving on so quickly. They ordered mimosas and toasted to the end of the semester, glad to be together again. After lunch, Damon received a call from Nancy Brokerton. Nancy hadn't seen Damon for a while. She hoped that Damon would come and visit her and Robert when he had some spare time. She also had an ulterior motive. Nancy wanted Damon to network with the Brokerton group. Damon didn't reject her outright, but he gently told her that he'd let her know if he could visit, though it wasn't currently a good time. He hung up the phone and remembered that Avery's concert was going to be held soon. Fifi, who was going to play in the band, would also be there. He penciled it into his calendar, then took a glance at his watch. He arched an eyebrow. It was already half past one in the afternoon. His heart fluttered. Veronica's flight was set to arrive at two o'clock. Once more, he considered showing up at the airport to greet her, but he decided against it. After all, she hadn't asked him to pick her up, and he didn't want to make her uncomfortable. And of course, there was also Avery to think about. 
Theo and Xander went to the indoor football stadium to practice. Damon returned to his dorm out of boredom. He tried to let an appropriate amount of time pass before calling Veronica. Should he wait to call her until the next day to give her a chance to settle in? Or should he call her that evening? He debated whether or not to ask her to dinner. He sat down on the couch and scrolled through his phone. He planned to rest and recharge for a while before deciding if he should call Veronica. However, the decision was made for him sooner than he'd anticipated. At 2.45 p.m., his phone lit up. Veronica's name flashed on the caller ID. Hey, what are you up to? Veronica said by way of greeting. Oh, not much, just resting in the dorm, Damon replied. Veronica was silent for a while, then softly said, I didn't disturb your afternoon nap, did I? I want to ask you for a favor. No, you didn't. I was just about to get up. What's up? What do you need? Damon rose from the couch and began to pace around the room. Well, I'm at the school entrance right now, and I have quite a lot of luggage. Do you think you might be able to come down and give me a hand? Veronica murmured. Damon's jaw dropped. Say no more, he exclaimed. I'll be right there. Damon trudged through the snow, his boots making deep imprints on the sea of white. Icicles hung from the trees. The atmosphere was romantic, and Damon saw a handful of young couples embracing by the frozen pond. A beautiful figure wearing a white down jacket stood quietly at the entrance of the school, surrounded by boxes and suitcases. Her gorgeous hair peeked out from under a crochet beanie, and her long legs were clad in a pair of thick blue jeans. Men stared at her as they walked by, wondering who the angel in white was that matched the snow. When she turned her head and saw Damon, the corners of her mouth curled up into a faint smile. Hey, who's that? A young male student whispered to his friend. That's Veronica Matthew, his friend whispered back. She used to go here. Everyone had a crush on her. She's a brilliant piano player and an excellent student. But I heard that she left to study in Germany. It broke everyone's hearts. I didn't expect to see her grace the doorway of Meyerson again. Some people passing by tried to furtively snap pictures of Veronica to text their friends. Though she'd been gone for a long time, it was clear that her popularity at Meyerson had never waned. Veronica pretended not to notice them, choosing to quietly wait for Damon to come to help her with her luggage. When Damon walked from the road to the school gate, he saw no fewer than five groups of boys trying to help Veronica with her luggage. To Veronica's credit, she was politely rejecting them. The disappointment radiating off the boys was palpable, but they scattered. Damon sighed and threw his shoulders back, mustering up the courage to approach Veronica for the first time in years. Thinking about it, it made sense that Veronica was still so well-liked on campus. Damon remembered that during the freshman dance, Veronica had arrived with Levi on her arm and caused quite a commotion. They had been such a powerful couple. In the blink of an eye, three years had passed. Memories flowed through Damon's head like a fish in a stream. He recalled when he helped her with her luggage before, as she was packing to move to Berlin. His heart ached. Where had the time gone? As he thought about it, he walked over to Veronica. When he was about to reach her, Veronica noticed. She waved a broad grin on her face, making all of the boys hanging around her jealous. The guys moved to a safe distance, then started gossiping. Who is that guy? asked a freshman. He doesn't look like much. I mean, look at his clothes. No way is she waiting for him. A senior laughed, then nodded sagely. You're just a freshman, so it makes sense that you don't know who he is. But I gotta tell you, that dude's a legend. Not only is he an entrepreneur and a prodigy, but he's also an incredible basketball player. He's like a king on campus. Suddenly, the faces of those who looked down on Damon changed. The video of the basketball legend had become campus lore at Meyerson University. Even Theo and Xander, who were planning on going pro, couldn't live up to Damon's skills. The freshmen were impressed, but some of the sophomores still weren't convinced. I don't know, he still looks kind of lame, griped one of the sophomores. The senior looked at him out of the corner of his eye. Did you ever hear about the incident where those troublemakers came to the school and threatened to kill people? Well, it was that guy, Damon Walker, who saved us all. He took the hooligans out one by one. If you saw how fierce he was back then, you would worship him to the point of prostrating yourself in front of him. That incident had occurred during his sophomore year, but people were still talking about it on social media. 
Over time, the story got more outlandish, but those who remembered Damon revered him above anyone else. The senior put his hand on the shoulder of one of the freshmen. Of course, if all of you think that this is not enough, then I can tell all of you that not only can he fight, but he's also extremely smart. He aced his SATs in high school, and while he was still in college, he developed multiple companies worth millions. His net worth is out of this world. I'm sure that you all use his products. I'm telling you guys, he is not someone you want to mess with. At this point, the freshmen and sophomores beside him opened their mouths wide and were unable to speak. Compared to him, they were nothing but ants. Sorry to keep you waiting. Damon jogged up to Veronica and stood in front of her, panting with excitement. Now that he saw her up close, he realized that she was even more radiant than she had been before. No wonder so many people fell in love with her at first sight. Veronica shook her head and said softly, No, don't worry about it. I wasn't waiting long. She looked him in the eye. Damon felt like her eye contact was piercing his soul. Veronica reached down to squeeze his hand. It's good to see you, she murmured. Damon's heart thumped. This was even better than he could have imagined. Damon swiftly picked up Veronica's luggage. Veronica took out an umbrella from her bag and opened it for Damon to protect him from the snow. So where are you staying? Damon asked. He realized with a start that he didn't know where she lived. She'd been at the University of Berlin for so long that he couldn't imagine that she'd be going back to her old dorm. However, Veronica refuted this assumption. I called the school and pulled some strings. They were able to open up the room I had before I left, so that's where we're headed. Damon was quite surprised. It also further proved that Veronica was valued by the school. There was no question that she'd be admitted to the graduate program. They'd probably even offer her a scholarship. The two of them walked towards the dormitory. It was late afternoon, and people were streaming out of their classrooms. Damon and Veronica awkwardly moved through the crowd with her luggage, stumbling over the students who had stopped to stare at the handsome pair. Damon sighed. He knew that by the end of the day, their names would be trending on Meyerson's Astromar group. Veronica had been gone for a long time, but there were still many rumors about her floating around Meyerson University. Although Damon kept a low profile, he was a basketball legend, a proven fighter, and a CEO worth millions. When people saw Veronica and Damon walking together, they couldn't help but gossip. The clock chimed three and the university broadcast system rang out from the speakers. Damon's heart swelled. He remembered when he and Veronica used to host Meyerson's afternoon radio program and they had been the most successful host group in the history of Meyerson University. At their peak, there were thousands of students tuning in, and every day, their inboxes were full of fan mail. Even people who had already graduated had listened to their program. Due to their success, many of their traditions had been passed down since their reign. Damon sighed as memories flooded his brain. The distance between them seemed so close, yet at the same time, so far. As they walked, Damon finally broke the silence. Haven't you gotten used to staying in Berlin all these years? Do you think you'll miss it? Veronica gazed into the distance. Well, I quite like the rhythm of Berlin. A lot of things about that city suit my personality, and I made some wonderful friends. However, right now I'm standing on this great precipice that will determine the course of my future, so I had to think about what would best help me accomplish my goals. Meyerson has the right program, and it's familiar. I've been away for a long time. I'm looking forward to coming back. Damon paused for a moment and gave Veronica a strange look. So does that mean that you're moving back here for good? He asked. Veronica bit her lip and nodded. Nothing is set in stone, but it's looking that way, yeah, she replied. Damon couldn't help but grin. I think that's great, he said with a little too much enthusiasm. Part of me thought that after you went abroad, I'd never see you again. Veronica brushed a lock of hair behind her ear. Were you sad about me leaving? That's not it, Damon quickly said. If a woman like you were to leave permanently, it would be a great loss to our country. Luckily, you're finally back, so there's nothing to worry about. It's not like I was heartbroken that you left. Veronica smiled faintly. Then why didn't you pick me up at the airport earlier? I thought you would. She made eye contact with them. They stood in the middle of the sidewalk, luggage in hand. As snow fell in quiet flurries around their heads, 
collecting in their eyelashes and blanketing the ground. Damon tried to keep the look of surprise off his face. He had debated for hours whether or not he should go pick up Veronica at the airport, but had ultimately decided against it. He was worried that the gesture could make her uncomfortable or send the wrong signal. Now, Damon was silently kicking himself for deciding not to show up and meet Veronica as soon as she stepped off the plane. He found himself unable to answer the question, but Veronica changed the subject. So, she said conspiratorially, can you tell me the love story between you and Avery? When I was in Berlin, I heard that the two of you had gotten together. I was quite curious. Veronica wondered how serious Damon's relationship with Avery was. During the summer party after junior year, Damon confessed to Avery and was rejected. Veronica once thought that Damon and Avery would never be together, but as time passed, Avery changed her mind and gave Damon a chance. As Damon and Veronica walked with the luggage, he slowly told her the details from his first kiss with Avery up to the present day. Veronica quietly listened without interjecting, and before they knew it, they had arrived at Veronica's dorm. Damon set Veronica's luggage down in her room. The other roommates weren't there. Most of them were still doing their senior year internships. All of them went for their internships in their senior year. Veronica tossed Damon a towel. Here, you're soaking wet from the snow, she said. Veronica's actions looked so natural. Damon was touched. He accepted the towel and shot her a graceful look. Damon, why don't you wait for me? I'm going to take a shower, but since you helped me out today, I'll treat you to a meal. How does that sound? She smiled at him. Damon's heart raced when Veronica mentioned taking a shower. He tried to keep his expression neutral, though he immediately began to fantasize about the water running in rivulets down her perfect neck, pooling in the well on her chest. He shook his head to snap out of it. Veronica was still looking at him expectantly. Well, what do you think? She asked. Um, I, I think that sounds good. Damon stammered. He wondered if Veronica was testing him. Okay, great. I won't be long. Veronica replied as she unbuttoned her coat. She draped it over a chair, grabbed her towel, and walked into the bathroom. A few minutes later, Damon heard the shower turn on. He opened the window and lit a cigarette in an attempt to distract himself. The room was small, and Veronica had left the bathroom door ajar. Damon smoked his cigarette, then lit another one from the still-burning end of the first. He knew that if he let his eyes wander, he'd likely see something that Veronica wouldn't feel comfortable with him seeing, so he kept his gaze resolutely forward. He focused on the snowy trees outside and the students rushing around campus below the window, trying to flood his mind with thoughts of Avery. As much as he tried, his thoughts kept returning to Veronica. Ever since the first day he'd laid eyes on her nine years prior, he hadn't stopped thinking about her. He stubbed out his cigarette in an empty Coke can and sprayed some air freshener around the room. He had to admit that the girls' dormitory was much cleaner than the boys' dormitory. Even though he'd just been smoking, the room still carried the scent of Veronica's perfume, mixed with the smell of candles and cleaning products. Her bed was neat. Various awards and certificates that Veronica had won were arranged with utmost care on the bookshelves and nightstand. Damon stood up and walked over to the bookshelf to get a better look. He noticed thick volumes of scientific reports with Veronica's name listed on the cover with the other authors. This surprised Damon, but it made sense. In recent years at the University of Berlin, Veronica had published many heavyweight theses in internationally renowned magazines and journals. She had been cited countless times, even though she was an undergraduate student. Veronica had become a rising star in research and academia. Damon had also heard that Veronica had received invitations from top investment firms. He did not doubt that her future would be full of financial success. He admired so many things about how Veronica interacted with the world. And now that he'd seen her again, he was kicking himself for not pursuing a relationship with her sooner. Now it was too late. Damon had Avery, and Veronica had graduate school to look forward to. Suddenly, the bathroom door opened, and Veronica emerged in a thick cloud of rose-scented steam. Her wet hair was draped over her shoulders, and water droplets still clung to her long eyelashes. Damon couldn't tear his eyes away. Seeing Damon staring at her like that, Veronica's face turned scarlet, and she softly said his name, trying to remind him to keep his gaze appropriate, 
and to not lose his composure. Only then did Damon realize that the way he was staring could be interrupted as rude. He quickly coughed to cover up his embarrassment, then turned his gaze elsewhere. The, uh, the dorm is clean. Way tidier than the boys' dorm, he stuttered. Oh, my roommates are all quite tidy and they love to be clean, Veronica chuckled. I'm sure that it's a shock to you. I've been to the boys' dorm a handful of times and I don't know how you all live in that pigsty. I mean, how do you even get any studying done? Damon laughed along with her. She was speaking the truth. I'm just going to throw on some clothes and do my makeup, then we can go out and eat, okay? Makeup? Damon couldn't help himself. You're so naturally beautiful, Veronica. You don't need makeup. Veronica giggled. <laughs> Thanks for the input, Damon, but women wear makeup for several reasons, and I happen to like the way I look with it. Don't worry, I won't get all dressed up. Just give me five minutes. When Veronica offered to treat Damon to a meal, he figured that he'd counteroffer and take her to a high-end restaurant off campus. However... After being away for so long, Veronica had really missed the dining hall, and she insisted that they have dinner there. Damon reluctantly agreed. The food was cheap, but it tasted good, and there were plenty of options. They walked into the dining hall and found a table in a quiet corner behind some tall, potted ferns. As they ate, Damon asked Veronica about her time at the University of Berlin. He was curious about the awards and journal citations. It turned out that Veronica was still the top international student in Berlin. Not only that, but her insights had led to breakthroughs in the financial industry, and some authors were even collecting her ideas and organizing them into advice books. The advanced copies were already sought after by tycoons all over the world. Damon swelled with pride as he listened to Veronica's stories about her success. If she was already this accomplished, he couldn't imagine where she'd be in 10 years. Damon took a moment to appreciate the trajectory of his, Veronica's, and Avery's careers. All three of them had been destined for great things, but no one thought that they would achieve their glory before they'd even graduated from university. Damon set down his fork and wiped his mouth with a napkin. Veronica, I have to ask, if the sky's the limit, then why did you return to the country? Just because you like Meyerson? He had asked Veronica once before, and she said that she'd missed life at Meyerson but could it be compared to the opportunities presented to her in Berlin? Veronica took a bite of her chicken, then smiled sweetly. It's not just that. Actually. Actually what? Damon asked. Veronica took a sip of water. Well, the truth is, I have some unfinished business here at Meyerson. There's something that I've wanted to pursue, but I've been agonizing for months about whether to dive in and do it. Damon's eyes widened. What's so important that made you abandon your life in Berlin and come back here? It was hard for Damon to imagine that someone as worldly as Veronica would still have things to attend to stateside, much less at Meyerson. Veronica nodded and said faintly, Yes, it's something very important. In Berlin, I have been thinking day and night about whether or not I will regret coming back to the United States to pursue this matter, because frankly, I'm not yet sure if I'll be able to obtain what I'm looking for. Veronica and Damon sat together in the dining hall. Veronica was explaining to Damon that she left Berlin because she still had some unfinished business at Meyerson University. Damon couldn't think of anything important enough to make Veronica return to the United States. Veronica continued to speak. So, anyway, after careful consideration, I realized that I might not succeed in getting what I want. But if I don't try, I will regret it for the rest of my life. Veronica hadn't wanted to wake up every day in Berlin, wondering if she'd made the right decision, so she chose to come back. Damon cocked his head to the side, confused. Why wouldn't Veronica just tell him why she came back? He didn't want to pressure her if she didn't feel like sharing, but he was extremely curious. After a moment, he decided to change the subject. He figured that when Veronica was ready, she'd tell him what she'd come back to pursue. But for now they could just enjoy their meal and catch up. When they were almost finished, Veronica received a phone call. One of her classmates heard that Veronica had returned and wanted to meet up with her. A few minutes later, a pretty woman strolled into the dining hall. When she saw Veronica, her face lit up. Oh my God, the woman shrieked. I can't believe you're back. 
We've missed you so much. Everyone at the radio station has been talking about you. They told me to hurry over and find you as soon as possible. Damon instantly recognized the woman's voice. She was one of the hosts of KMYR, Myerson's radio station. Although Veronica had left for more than a year, no one at KMYR had forgotten about her. She changed the broadcast tradition of the radio station and single-handedly boosted the ratings tenfold. We want to have a little ceremony to welcome you back. I wonder if you'd feel up to that, said the woman, whose name was Delilah Rhodes. Veronica smiled and put her hand on the woman's shoulder. Delilah, that's so sweet of you, but there's no need to go through all that trouble. I'll come down to the station to say hi when I have the chance. Delilah pouted. But if you don't go, then everyone's going to say that I didn't try hard enough to convince you. Veronica sighed. What can I do, Delilah? Do you need my help with something? Unexpectedly, Veronica guessed correctly and Delilah appeared to be a little embarrassed. Well, since you're back, I thought we might be able to create a few special programs for you. And maybe you could come back and be a guest host, Delilah stammered. Veronica and Damon's programs had once been a huge success. However, following Veronica and Damon's departure, although the radio station continued the tradition of the two hosts, it was still difficult for their talents to reach the level of perfection that Damon and Veronica had achieved. The ratings had plummeted. Now that Veronica had finally returned to the country, the students at the radio station hoped that Veronica could help KMYR get back to its former glory. Of course, they knew that Veronica wanted to get into a graduate program, and that would take up a lot of her time but they still prayed that she'd drop in when she had a spare moment and help them boost their ratings. Veronica exchanged a look with Damon, then turned to Delilah and said, Look, I really appreciate the offer, but I need some time to think about it. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, okay? Veronica's ratings had been high, but the true peak was undoubtedly when she joined forces with Damon. Countless listeners wrote emails expressing their endless adoration for the two of them. At that time, many people thought that Damon and Veronica must be a couple in real life because they had so much chemistry in the air. It could only be done by two people who were truly connected. Of course, Veronica and Damon later refuted the rumors that they weren't dating. They told everyone that they were just good friends. Damon had been dating Fifi at the time, and it would have caused a scandal if they'd allowed the rumors to proliferate. However, after knowing the truth, the fans all wrote letters hoping that Damon and Veronica would get together. The two of them were a match of talent and beauty. Moreover, they were childhood sweethearts. They were a match made in heaven. Veronica and Damon had done their best to squash the rumors, but sometimes Damon liked that people made the assumption. Though he was dating Fifi, he still had feelings for Veronica. He just thought that she wasn't interested in him romantically. Now that he thought about it, Damon didn't regret it. There were many things that he might have missed out on, but the past was the past. Since Veronica hadn't agreed immediately, Delilah appeared to be a little disappointed. However, Veronica didn't explicitly reject the proposition, which gave Delilah a glimmer of hope. Delilah decided to press her luck. Veronica... I think that this could be good for the station. Some of the freshmen and sophomores would love to learn some tips and tricks from you. Everyone's there now. Won't you come with me? I'm afraid we don't have time now, Veronica tactfully refused. Delilah bit her lip, but could only helplessly say, All right, then. I'll come find you tomorrow. She waved goodbye to Veronica and left. Veronica and Damon took their trays to the counter and then walked out of the dining hall together. The snow had stopped, but the ground was still silvery white. Damon was a little reluctant to part ways with Veronica just like that, so he said, Why don't we go take a walk around the lake? Veronica nodded and looked at Damon with her soft eyes. She suddenly smiled. Damon, do you remember our days hosting that show? Of course, he remembered. Without a doubt, the days he spent with Veronica at the radio station were some of the best of his life especially when they got a chance to sing a duet together. Then Delilah invited us just now. Do you want to go? Veronica decided to throw out the question, 
Before jumping the gun and giving Delilah a response, Veronica wanted to gauge Damon's interest in hosting some of the special programs. If Damon was willing, Veronica would go back. Looking at Veronica's expectant eyes, Damon's heart beat faster. He missed that beautiful time. If he could host another show with Veronica, he'd keep that memory close to his heart for the rest of his life. Okay, Damon nodded. When they learned that Veronica and Damon had agreed to do a few special programs for the radio station, the students were ecstatic. This could save KYMR from being shut down by the university because of its low ratings, and it would do everything in its power to stay on the air. On the day of the special broadcast, Delilah prepared some cue cards. Although Damon and Veronica were once the stars of the broadcasting station, many years had passed. Delilah wanted to make sure that everything would go smoothly. They needed to familiarize themselves with each other before they went back on the air, so they rehearsed. Delilah was pleased to see that the chemistry between Veronica and Damon was still present. After class, students flooded the courtyards on campus and the radio station began its afternoon broadcast. Hello everyone, I'm Veronica. I've been away for a long time, but now I'm back. Today my partner Damon will be co-hosting this program with me. We have some great things prepared for you all today, and I hope that you'll enjoy what we have to offer. Veronica's voice was ethereal and intoxicating. Countless boys were already fascinated by her dulcet tones. Some upperclassmen stopped in their tracks and perked their ears up. Had their favorite radio host finally returned to campus? Now, let's enter the Q&A session first. Many readers have sent letters to the station. One person wrote a letter describing his feelings. He said that he had recently broken up with his girlfriend. His girlfriend ignored him, and he didn't know what to do. Here I'm going to say to this male classmate, when you break up with someone, it's important to give them some space. After enough time has passed, and if the feelings are still there, then you can take the initiative to see if she's interested in getting back together. Remember to show respect and care to the woman in your lives. I know that Myerson men have what it takes to treat women the way they deserve to be treated. To our listener who wrote, I wish you the best of luck. Veronica chimed a bell, then went on to the next letter. The next student wrote to us with a song request. He wants to dedicate this song to his roommate. Everyone, please enjoy. As the sweet voice faded, the melodious music started playing. Listeners were still captivated by Veronica's voice. The song played, but everyone started talking over the music, entranced by Veronica's presence once more on the broadcast. They gossiped about why Veronica had come back if she would revitalize the radio station, and if Damon would eventually be joining her to co-host like the good old days. Many of the juniors and seniors remembered those days. It was routine for everyone to sit in the dining hall, watch the sunset from the window, and cease their conversations as soon as Veronica's voice boomed out over the airwaves. However, ever since Veronica left, routines and traditions had changed. People talked over the radio when it blasted from the speakers in the dining hall, and no one even knew the name of the current host, though Delilah tried her best. Now their beloved Veronica had returned. The familiar rhythm made many of the third-year and fourth-year students stop in their tracks to listen. Tears gathered in the eyes of some of the former fans. Damon and Veronica prepared to do a duet. This was the first time Damon had performed this piece with Veronica. But even though time had passed, Damon was certain that they'd sound incredible together. Veronica sat at the piano, and Damon tuned his guitar. When they began playing, Damon was startled to find that he could practically feel Veronica's soul again. He wondered if she felt the same way. With the passage of time and emotional fluctuations, Veronica's piano skills had improved tremendously over the years. Damon was just as good at playing the guitar as he ever was, but the chemistry between them was undeniable. At the end of the song, Damon set down his guitar and looked at Veronica. She lifted her hands from the piano keys and returned his gaze. They couldn't help but beam at one another from across the cramped broadcast room. The afterglow of the setting sun through the window cast Veronica in an angelic light that made Damon's heart flutter. Veronica looked more beautiful than he'd ever seen her look. At that moment, he realized the true depths of his feelings for her that he'd been trying to ignore for so long. 
maybe everyone else was right. They were a match made in heaven.